are tied up one and one. We have a series on our hands, G Clap. Yes, we do. I love a series like this. Like, GG had a great comeback in game number two. I think they have a chance. They actually have a great chance of coming back now. Look, I mean, if Miracle was at the finals of World Championship in China for Gold Series, mm -hmm. and then they lose to Mighty, but then they GG beats, but then GG beats Mighty. What is, does it mean that like all the teams are really ev even in skill and and, and is that it becoming a triangle again? I mean, you might actually have that. It later could on. happen, but um, it's exciting to see that like the teams that you know in Korea are considered the most dominant. Um, people teams are catching up. They're 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 getting there now. Obviously, the roster change you mentioned is important to note. It's not the same miracle that we saw uh, in China, but still, I mean, we're at this point where uh, teams in leagues are dropping games that they may, maybe would not have done um, in the uh, previous format that we had, of course, in uh, Super League. Yeah, before we had that triangle to sort of say to explain on that, like before Tempest was really strong against Black, Black was super strong against L5 before the other teams and TNL and TNL was really strong against Tempest. So teams were and the style of the teams were countering each other a lot. We might actually see that again in this league. Let's see what happens then. Looks like map number three is going to be on Dragonshire. Dragonshire, emphasis on the drag. Uh, we may actually see Dahaka here again. <laughs> nice. And uh, this is GD's map pick. So this is something that they might even grab in first rotation with how well it went for them last game. I think it would not be out of the question. And I wonder if Mighty is going to stick with this rag, uh, you know, Barry. into the very end because it seems it seems quite strong, but it feels like it's unnecessarily prioritized. Like it's it's they're putting it really high in the draft. Varian is important and it is in the meta, especially the Korean meta right now, and into the HTC Korea. We have seen a lot of Varian, but. Is it worth it to pick him in the second or first slot, right? Like, just like that. They're opening false set again. Let's see if Might actually takes false set this time. I think you absolutely have to. Um, oh man, they just really don't want it. <laughs> Gonna have to leave it again. It's just so powerful here. And, uh... Well, if it doesn't fit their style and they can work around it, they did, game one. But game two did not turn out to be like that. But still, Ragnaros is very strong. But Sands did get caught because Rag, Rag of course, does not have the most. He doesn't have any escapes. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, this leaves the potential Falstad Malfurion pickup for good game. Um, it's really the strongest they've got. And that's what it's going to be. And we're going to have Jaehyun on Malfurion again. He has been very crisp on the, especially on the first game. All right, for Mighty now, I have a feeling we're gonna see Varian, even though I don't feel like we have to. This is the first time Zeratul has been available in this series as well. Uh, it's been banned by Mighty quite a bit. They may take Varian and Zeratul because Varian's one of the counters to Zeratul and uh, they could build a composition around that. I think Jokun can, can just switch up. ETC is available and he has been doing so great within within the last few days with ETC. He can just go ahead and just switch the channel and take that ETC instead because he was the only one in the front line. I feel like he was he was being a little bit too pressured to go into that taunt. If it was taunting like a Vala DPS, himself would get into the danger zone and he was a little bit afraid and he ended up taunting like ETC from the other team or the Haka it did not work out too great. And then there goes the ETC. They also show that priority that SDE has been loving the Tychus, seeing it a lot uh, in this tournament. Mighty's highly, most highly prioritized range damage, even over Falstad in many cases, including this one as they take Rag and allow GG to take that. Um, the ban here for GG could simply just be on Karazim. Uh, it would not shock me to see that, and that would allow them to go into the Dahaka pick if they want that as well. So, I like the Karazim ban here. Otherwise, there's no really strong ban right now for good game. I think Karazim ban will, will start to come out as they go towards, especially against like Mary Day on MVP Black or even Hyde on Tempest. Those players are making so many changes during the team fight, and they actually go ahead and ban Rengar because I don't think 
Nasang has been playing too much of a Karazim. That's compared true. to Nasang has been playing so well today, especially with Regar, so. Yep. Seems That's a just smart to be band. a target towards Nasang's mm -hmm. uh, play here. We've seen and again, and especially in game number one, he looked really good. Game two is like not bad, but uh, game number one was really impressive. Mighty uh, the ban here could honestly Dahaka could draw a ban here. It's not uh, there we go. I was gonna say it's not out of the question that they just simply saw how well Good played it, and it's just possibly Dahaka's best map too with how it operates because he could squat as well on the shrine. So there's so much he could do here, and I like that ban. And basically, giving out two global is, of course, it's not a good idea against. Well, they, and Mighty has ETC now. There's a potential stage dive at 10. And GG already took Malfurion, so Breadwing is out of the question. I feel like we need more global heroes now, since we only have four or five-ish, I guess. Yeah, they're just so powerful. Um, Lucio is going to be like basically global. Oh man! I can't Drop wait until down. that. I can't wait until that Zarya spot gets replaced by Lucio next month. <laughs> Lucio looks super fun. I'm, to be honest. I'm pretty sure he's going to be my like only hero I ever play. I'm only going to quick match Q into in Lucio the entire time. <laughs> and get four supports on your team. My Q is going to be bumping. G clef. <laughs> All right, here Sounds we go. Right, and Hooligan on that Muradin looks really nice on that. And Sergeant Hammer a little bit surprising. We've seen a lot of Sergeant Hammer with, paired with Ballstead on this map because of the, the pressure and the tri lane that she can give. Uh, you can get a structural advantage, and you kind of always win the macro from the beginning. Um, if you can get that bot structure, uh, and sometimes mid, but usually bot, while well, Falstead pushes top, it's very powerful. Mighty, at this point, they have, uh, you know, a question to answer is, do we want Li Ming here? We've been seeing a lot of the Tychus Li Ming um, from this team, and I think that's what they're going to be looking for here once again. And then the question becomes, are they going to take Karzi? Are they going to try to do something a little bit unusual? Uh, we saw... Morales yesterday. I don't think it's going to be in this draft. They could potentially take Brightwing uh, with a more roaming oriented hero uh, to try to get ganks because they have ETC. They could just kind of be a ganking cop. Well, I think this is going to be Karzing Lee Ming. Uh, ooh, Ariel Gul'dan. That is not consistent with how Mighty has been playing in this tournament so far. They're going to try this out for the first time. I I think they may have actually actually said that ETC is not the most tanky hero in the front line. Of course, who, of course, Joker is really good at on that ETC, but once he is also cooked in, there's the last pick, Artanis, coming out from GG. A few surprising picks at the end, but Ario does save your team with that Aegis super well. He can, he can Aegis the Taikas or Gul'dan into the game. So we'll see what happens in game number three. That we will. The winner of this team will take that match point advantage, G Clef, as we go into Dragonshire. Mighty versus GG here in HGC Korea. It's going to be a good series. It's going to near its end after this game. But let's go into Dragonshire to see who is going into match point. Welcome to Dragon Shire. Joker on ETC, Sans on Ragnaros, Magi on Tychus, Nasong on Oriole, and SDE on Gul'dan. That is Team Mighty on the blue side. And in red, Team GG, BDG on Thalset, Jaehyun on Malfurion, Good on Antanas, Hooligan on Murden, Wujay on Sergeant Hammer this time. So of all games played, including the qualifiers for HGC Korea. Well, I thought we are going to have a little bit of skirmish here. Hooligan is D.E.D. dead. Or is he? Nearly. Probably will if... Uh, D.E.D.? Yeah, D.E.D. <laughs> dead, man. Not, not D.E.A.D. He's D.E.D. That's why he survived. Alright, that's the English I have to pick up. But Joker still, really wanted Joker it. really wants to be aggressive here, going around. Um... Anyway, as I was saying before, uh, they tried to get that kill and almost did. And ETC is the best early game hero for ganks and kills, uh, especially at level one. Artanis has a abysmal win rate. He's five and 16 currently. 
That means he's been played in a lot of games as SD nearly goes down here. And Hooligan is going to take some damage walking away, but 5 and 16. That means he's been played in 21 games and has a horrible, horrible, horrible win rate. And I just feel like he shouldn't be used in most of these cases, and I don't think he's actually very strong right now. He can look strong if you get the amazing phase prism, but we don't see very many of those in this region. And, uh, not a big fan of the pick, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, that can be said. And as ETC can just roam so easily, so quickly. I, the GG actually started to roam first instead. It did not work so perfectly as their health were a little too low from the beginning of the fight. But it looks like GG's catching up to that macro and ETC still just roaming around the map. I think Mighty did get that control because GG could not get the kill. Similar to Chen, uh, Artanis is very good at shrine squatting because he could basically 1v1 almost any hero because of his shields and buy time. Chen just sits there and drinks brew, so it's a very similar kind of situation. So in terms of the solo lane, he's very strong to hold on to the shrines. He actually will relinquish control here temporarily, though, to Sands. Um, this may be good around. Oh, he actually walked pretty far here. BDG wants this kill. Hooligan's going to come in for the body block. Sands with no escape here. Joker comes out. in and saves the day, but actually is blocked by good pretty well. Sands does, looks like he is going to be safe. What a save by Joker, literally just saving all of his teammates. This is, what, this is what happens if you let Joker on ETC. So Joker is like... Types of chase like not Keddy, and everyone's like Injong. <laughs> Injong. Uh, my, I probably shouldn't make joke, language jokes on stream, but anyway. <laughs> and Nasan does get caught, gets rooted. Looks like there's gonna be enough damage. Then that is the first kill, first blood going to GG. Must have been on cooldown for the heal there. As and he Ariel, had so much hope. <laughs> Ariel is used to be one of the top tier, close to tier one hero. And the reason why Ariel kept on going down, and we even with Vala, we don't see Ariel that much. Sometimes banned, sometimes actually used, but like, like not like 100% prioritized because Ariel does not have escape and there is no cleanse. That's yeah. one of the biggest parts. She has like a soft escape, but it's just not consistent. Um, and that's first her detainment strike is what I'm referring to. She knocks people away. Um, but yeah, getting caught there. Definitely had heal on cooldown, I suppose, because uh, didn't use it there on herself to survive. She had a lot of hope, though, so it's a bit strange. Like, I almost wonder if she just thought she was going to get out and, or just press a button too early, too late. It was a little bit weird there, uh, the interaction we saw. But this is a channel attempt here for good game. Hooligan going to tank some damage. Sans pushing the lane. We will get the top, so it will be denied. And SDE is going to do a ton of damage to Uj there, so will be killed. BDG coming up, they're gonna try to get the gank on Sans. There's the stun, doesn't matter, misses the prism. Don't see very many prisms hit, see a lot of misses. I think Sans is actually being very safe today. He could have died a few times. Well, Joker did the game and saved the day of Sans, but it looks like GG's gonna commit a lot harder on this rooted, and Sans in danger finally, good prism to catch him. Joker has a lot of HP, so not gonna go down too far, but finally Sans does go down at the end. Yeah, and uh, look, I mean, this has been some really aggressive play against uh, Sans. Sans and Modern Life, two players that have been playing almost nothing but rag in this tournament, and uh, they've both been, you know, pretty consistently ganked. Oh man, Nasong is a dead Oriel here. Magi as well, doesn't even have enough mana to dash. He's gonna go down. And GG has taken complete control of this game. And I worry now for Mighty, as now there's a siege tank push on these towers. This is the bot lane push I was talking about. You get a small lead in this lane and just start to do a ton of damage. I love how GG is actually rotating so well as Joker is also doing. Hooligan, I've been I've been highlighting on Joker a lot, but Hooligan also rotating with his team. They've been make, making the exact same changes that Good does miss on the prism. They actually control the waves so well there. Notice that even Hooligan was tanking the minions to make sure bot lane was pushed, and they get the Dragonite as a result. They had already the kills before. Um, but they basically just took extra measures to make sure they get this dragon. They need to use it well. Mid already has no cannon tower, so that's going to be the target here as the kick on the Magi, the knock down the ceiling fountain, and then rotate away. So just going to try to out-rotate Mighty at this point in time as they clear this wave. 
Moving to the bot, which is already heavily damaged uh, in terms of its wall, as we mentioned before, because VJ was hitting on it. And this wall will give GG level 10. Every time you say GG, it feels like the game is already over, but... Still. In this game, it, it, may, it may very well be if this continues. <laughs> well, it's not over yet, and BDG on that Dragon Knight is gonna go. And they just hit level 10, this is their chance. They can... I actually thought they were gonna go a little bit more aggressive, and but Artanis is way too pushed on top. and They're not gonna go too deep here, they're just gonna take their own camp, this crate. If that top lane was actually pushed for GG, then I think they had a good chance of invading because they have their heroics and Mighty does not. Yeah. Not gonna happen in this case though. They're just gonna play it a little bit safer. They already got a lot of value out of this Dragon Knight, so. Not gonna happen. Not gonna get anything forced here. Nice detainment strike there by Nasong, but his healing will not be enough. They just barely get 10 in time. You get Aegis. SDE tries to heal himself up. He actually will survive here. Incredible. Joker coming in as well, forcing Hooligan back. Sans rotates down. Could actually Sulfuric Smash. Looks like he already did. So not gonna be able to get the stun here to catch anybody, but a close call. The problem with this five man for Mighty is that they're losing EXP. They're gonna lose a top wave very likely here. Tanis is getting free mid soak, and he's gonna be able to come up top and uh, clear the rest of that. So, a little bit unfortunate here uh, for Mighty. They turned that fight around, but they didn't get any kills, and they had five. Missing EXP is so unfortunate. Sans actually looks like he's having some trouble deciding whether he's gonna go to the top or come down to fight. Decides to go to the top, so they don't miss too much of that wave. He's gonna keep that lane pushed. But this means that he's actually very vulnerable to ganking at this point in time. Yeah, but they know a lot of GGs are, are staying at the bottom, so Sans is gonna Looks like he decides to come down now that their fort is actually getting punished for that. Because he could have come down a long time ago and Molten Core is available, I'm pretty sure. And Joker does get caught from coming side. Gus is used just to engage, disengage. Sans actually also may be caught, may be, may be caught from this. It's great smash to disengage BDG. Sans should not have come in here. Uh, definitely should have just waited for the next wave to spawn. He pushed that lane super hard, which didn't do him any favors. Hooligan is just gonna back off and just straight heal him back up. Good, doesn't actually toss down a prism there. Actually dies, I'm not entirely sure what the idea with that one was. Maybe something's wrong in his keyboard. I think he pressed the E a little late. And Hooligan comes from the side, great ages to save Magi at the moment. And stage dive right in, but Tychus is gone. They have barely any damage. Gul'dan is the only one. Joker gonna try to get the kill here, but again, the missing damage, as you mentioned, is a big problem here. SDE is full of mana, so he's just gonna try to carry this fight alone. But unfortunately, Gul'dan's not the type of hero to that. But we're leaving, probably would have been a whole different fight, but uh, in this case, the Gul'dan, not so much. Sans is just gonna have to do his walk of shame back up here after that uh, rotation down to take this. He's gonna have a wave of minions to take as well. They will be able to channel. Uh, Falstad will need to fly if they're gonna just prevent this. And in fact, they do not. So, it's gonna be a free Dragonite, surprisingly so, for Mighty. I also think GG's- He had flight too! Yeah, I also think GG's not using the flight perfectly. He could have stayed on the top lane instead of, instead of Artanis. I know the matchup is pretty tough against uh, Ragnaros, but still, having that flight just creates uh, pressure for entire Mighty, and they have to check, is the, is the flight available, or where is Pulse at? They have to consistently talk on that, but they're not, I don't think they're using it too perfectly, and Joker, is gonna be out of DK very soon, and he does. Okay, well, they accomplished almost nothing with this Dragon Knight. They got a wall, um, whereas GG was able to get basically uh, two because of the pressure they had and damage that fort at the bottom very significantly. A uh, little bit of uh, damage done to the fort during this as well, so they got that. I mean, it was very light, <laughs> but uh, you can see the bottom fort a little bit hurt. Well, there's some cracks in it. But Mighty did catch up in level a lot, so they they have equal talent right now. So, basic and none of the forts are down actually. So this game is looks like it's gonna go for a longer time than it actually usually does. It's already 10 minutes, and all the forts keeps just safely not safely. It's, it looks like almost the first one is about to go down. I'm like, you better say it faster, you <laughs> club. Like, yeah. You're like, all the forts are alive. I'm like, oh, you said it too slow. The port died. <laughs> um. But yeah, it's it's a close game. But uh, GG had a strong lead at the beginning. That lack of flight or any sort of denial on the Dragon Knight was a bit, uh, it wasn't good. And uh, now they're know, having like, set on top when he, now ETC, that ETC has stage dive. I don't think, they should have used that before they had stage dive. That could have been their chance to actually pressure them before 10. 
because now it's just even and the first false stat is actually slower on that joining the team fight if it actually breaks out on the bottom. They're actually going to look for a kill. Joker smells the danger, but it is it's stunned and booted. No way to escape. Yeah, that danger was stinky, man. It was a bad smell <laughs> uh, with how that worked out, but didn't in Joker's case. I feel like Joker is not playing the series of his life today. Uh, his very in play was mixed. I already get mixed reviews, and um, he has been caught a few times already in this game. Nasong caught alone here, unfortunately. Hooligan wants to get the stun onto SDE here. Sans is long dead. They're just going to be content with that. They're not going to actually overcommit to try to get more picks, but this could potentially be a Dragonite if BDG has flight. Uh, I'm not entirely sure if he does, to be honest, but if he did, this could have been a Dragon Knight for GG. And Hooligan is going to go up and take this alone, so probably had flight on cooldown. It's a four-man rotation up, though, to get to get Hooligan off of the Shrine, so... I don't think they just realized that they are channeling the Dragon Knight, and BDG does get Dragon Knight, but it's going to find Hooligan in a dangerous situation. He is cleansed. But he yep. still has some HP, so he does get out safely. But Dragonite is already attacking this board. What are they going to do? Mighty has to force. They're forced to rotate down, and they're losing a lot of time because of this. Yeah. Um, they do take uh, the fast lane, past the Merc cap to get in here as SDE does get. Oh, Prism Prism. swaps! SDE age saves the day, but still. Let's see. All right, well, Sans does keep this board alive. And it blows up Sergeant Hammer as well. <laughs> Oopsie daisy there, but well, the uh, smash was pretty good on that Sergeant Hammer. And Ragnaros, is, this is why Ragnaros is still so strong. I mean, strong. he's just so strong. And we see Mighty prioritize him over everything, including globals. Yeah, first pick, first pick, first pick for the entire three games. And today. Sans has a such a large hero pool that you know this is not just because he likes the hero. It's because they think the hero is, is first pick material. On GG's side, they don't have any tool like that to protect this fort, so it will go down. And Sans was soaking top during all of this, so that pick on the hammer got them a, a, a fort, essentially, without Dragon Knight. They did more just now without the Dragon Knight than GG was able to do uh, with theirs. So Sans here needs to be careful about overextending. Sergeant Hammer is coming back. BDG does gust here. I'm going to see a Horrify onto good, but it's not enough to get the kill. Unfortunately, he went bot and not up. If he had gone top, I might have gotten a grab there on him. It's really hard to actually hit that because the range is not so long, but exactly. And here, hold that thought. A fight goes on, and Maki is caught a little bit, but Aegis saves the day again. Great smash onto Jayon and BDG. They're forced out of the fight. Good, he's gone. Hooligan, they're basically just tanking without no damage from the back line. Mighty's, what a great smash yeah, right that there. That smash was massive. They got so smashed right there. Um, Barely, barely Malfurion gets his Q off. He had such a short uh, amount of time, or that he was on cooldown. He had like such a short time to live. Um, he barely got that in time. So at least he survived. He nearly died as well. I feel like GG with any other tank, any other tank, any other tank <laughs> besides Artanis yes, would be in a much, a much better position than they are now. And uh, they, they had such a great lead, and they were really controlling the game. They had globals. They let that first Dragonite go in mid, and things have kind of been falling apart, I feel, since then, especially in terms of their team fighting. And, and of course, as I mentioned, if they had false set on top from the beginning, I'm pretty sure they had another way of doing it. So that's why they didn't put false set. It is very common to have false set in solo lane. So also can fly over and Ragnaros can't. They had Artanis on that top lane, just so, just so that he can control that top shrine and Sans will find himself in danger zone again. He wastes we Sulfuric see this as well. A lot. Oh boy. Well, BDG gets the gust off here with Sans being gone, even with the Dragonite active. This is not going to be a good Dragonite, I'd say, very likely here. Um, Hooligan's going to come back in to try to get the grab on the Nasong. Nasong needs to be very careful. Uh, the Dragon Knight is kind of tanking enough here, though, to where even though this is a 5v4 situation, it's not going to be um, too risky. Because getting on top of Nasong would be very difficult. SDE could just kick anyone away who actually uh, comes in. You see a very early Aegis here onto Magi. I think it's early Aegis because Magi is there. Other than SDE on Dragon Knight is the only damage at the moment, so... 
4v4 here, and GG really did a great job stalling time. I think Nasang well, bringing on that Aegis at the exact time is saving his team. Not entirely sure how UJ died, to be honest. Actually, thought he was alive, <laughs> but he wasn't doing any damage. I'm like, no, I guess he's dead. He must have died off screen, <laughs> but uh, that that was not a 5v4. In fact, it was a 4v4, and they lost that extra ranged poke that Hammer has with Napalm, and of course the auto-attack build she chose here, so um, did not uh, defend that as well as I thought they would, but they keep their keep alive. Uh, and Mighty gets 20 off of this, so this game has turned around completely. Mighty's now massively ahead. They have this huge talent tier advantage. They have Storm talents. Um, really, most importantly, is ETCs, and because with uh, his ability to bolt or uh, you know Storm died. Shield, he could actually just end the game. I think Joker, even though he's not playing his best at the moment, but coming in stage diving at the right place at the right time, whenever the team is needed. He's making some great changes and it is forcing the zone that they have to evade. So GG is out of this, it just dispositions the entire team of GG. And whenever he, whenever good uses Pulse, that's the time when Tyga's blinded and that's the time for them to go in. But stage dive makes that all just canceled in a way. And yeah. I think he's doing a great job. Okay, Sans actually took the upgraded uh, Molten Core. He's gonna kill this uh, keep and he's gonna take over it immediately, as you can see here. This could actually be game if they get anybody else, as Sans is so powerful right now as he's upgraded this uh, trait. Look at how much damage it does, even to the wall over there. Um, and and GG's just stalling time because it does have a time limit on it as his health is going down. And Sans actually might be in trouble, but GG's not 20 yet, so they're, they're not going to commit to this. GG really reacted well to that. That was a really good reaction. That could have been disastrous if anybody died. There's a good prism, but see if Joker can escape. He does go ahead and click Bolt here to try to get out. He uses it too, and it He's might have been a waste. He's not booted, I think. Uh, that boot could have been, uh, oops, and then Horrify comes in. Artanis is in danger, very low. He does, almost goes down, but Gus barely saves him and dashes oh, away from what? that Sofair Smash. And on the left side, Magi is in danger. Good, barely safe, barely safe, but the entire GG just spread apart. That great job by great job by both teams. What a play! Good is just so sick. Okay, uh, and that was and, pretty. And sick. you might think I might I don't mean ill, but I mean no. In fact, he is quite ill. He is the illest man. That was uh, <laughs> illest. He I, that was pretty cool. I don't like uh, you know I don't like the Artana's pick, but when you make moves like that, I just look and go okay. I'm not talking about the grab onto Joker. I'm talking about his dodge there. Do you see that moment too where he walked back to the gate like I'm ready to go back in. I lived, and then he, <laughs> then he decided to hearth instead. But uh, that was pretty funny. The keep being down here is a big problem for GG though. They have 20 now. This game is still by all means winnable for GG, and oh man, Mighty is really extending over here with Epic Mount available to fall, said he could just fly in and gust here, and they're actually coming up right now. Good gonna use a delayed prism here. There's a root onto Magi. We'll get away though. Nasong having full energy there, or hope I should say, use the technical term. Well, <laughs> well still, I think Good has been doing some great swaps in the game. It, it is not the easiest thing at this level of play to hit that swap. I think he has close to 50% of swap this game, so it's not the worst thing, but Sans goes into Molten Core, but Hooligan actually cancels it. Very nice job, and Hooligan is safe. I think that might have... I don't think I don't think that Molten Core had been, could have been like that dangerous, to be honest, because the entire GG team was running away at the time, but still, great cancel there. Yeah, still nice. Uh very impressive. The top lane is being pushed right now, which is going to become an issue if they don't deal with that. Because if they have two keeps down, they're going to have a problem. That's not the end game keep, so it's not the craziest, but it's definitely a lot of pressure that will be added. Um, Mighty is actually just going to stick together here and look for picks right now. Oh no, GG, don't go to that, uh, don't go to that, it's that way. Okay, I was going to say, like, the other teams here, you can actually maybe get a pick on uh, Joker. Well, who's going to actually down. use the storm and jumped right there? And that kind of just blew up. Great placement of laser drill right there. Having also Joker is already onto the back line. Let's see what happens. Hooligan's taking some damage. And it is 5v4 right now. GG's just forced back into their base. This could be, this could actually be a game ending decision. 
Absolutely. I feel like, uh, I, I think that the move that we saw there, the rotation from GG was just kind of, they should have been rotating up to grab um, Joker because he didn't have Bolt because he used it earlier and he also used his uh, stage types at the time it was still on cooldown. They could have tried to get a pick on him and then win a 5v4. Then instead they tried to fight while he was gone because it was a 5v4 because he wasn't there, but they couldn't get a pick. Artanis died and that's basically game. Stage dive off, cooldown now and Joker comes in here. Good reactions. I feel like GD has great defense, actually, even with a keep down. But it may just be too much with the Dragonite here. Sand is going to right-click on the core. Huge silence here on all of Mighty as well. Or well, not Sand's, silence, fear. Well, 21 minute Dragonite, he can just burst down that core without a doubt. I think there's a stalling time and trying to take some time. Just, just having... I don't think there's any chance here. Dragonite still 28%. 21% left in the core and Nasan still alive SDE left but there goes the core game three going to mighty this game was anything but clean though this is not the game you look back and you go like oh we killed it we outplayed them they definitely had a nice comeback but um both teams making errors here and there for sure it was a it was a scrappy game it was those games you watch and you go well i think both teams are really feeling the pressure here uncharacteristic uh uncharacteristic mistakes on both sides I'm really just not a fan of the Artanis pick. We saw a few cool uh, prisms there, but I feel like any other uh, main meta tank would have had a higher impact. Um, you know, I just feel like there were a lot of better options they could have uh, used there in the draft. But we're seeing teams pick up Artanis in that fifth slot a lot. And his win rate goes down now. He's now 5-22. and 22. I'll write that down. Um. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it, it is basically the last pick, and we say, what do we do? And there's a few last options, not top tier, not got tier, because they're all banned already or taken. So you just have to, within those few choices, maybe if you feel comfortable or today you can make, maybe you think you can some, make some amazing swaps, like taking Gul'dan from the back line or like the Vala, then you can pick it, but still... It didn't happen too much, and Nasang on that Crystal Age is just saving those damage all the time. I think that was one of the biggest plays. Well done by Nasang. I, I feel like as people get better at Heroes, we're going to see Heroes of the Storm um, as, a, as a game, as a competitive title. We're going to see things change as we have seen already. For example, it used to be that Uther used Divine Storm and thought it was broken. Now everyone laughs if you take it. Same with Sage, uh, with... with um, what uh, yeah, Mosh Pit, like Mosh Pit was considered been so broken, it's the strongest thing. And then eventually if everyone gets so good that you can never get a good Mosh Pit. You're like, oh, this is worthless. I want the global. And I think our task from those heroes was like, oh, it's so strong. He's got the phase prism. But if suddenly you can't really use that, then he's just kind of a, a tank that is overall solid. But like there are better options that are more meta. Same with auto attack false stat. I mean, it got changed and buffed a little bit. But like this is a thing where, yeah, mage false stat is really good because everyone doesn't dodge the Q and it does big burst damage. But eventually, if everyone's better at avoiding that, then you want to go auto-attack. I mean, there's obviously, like, Mage Falls is still very meta, and there is really good most of the time, actually. But, like, we're seeing auto-attack get in a little bit as people are getting better, and um, I think Artanis is one of those things that's going to eventually go away. Like, remember when people picked Artanis and he had a 5-22 and 22 win rate in HGC Korea? Yeah, this is also the last day, and also, like, two months ago, like, Diablo, Artanis, Thrall, Earthquake was almost broken, and just, like, we didn't... I. In Hero League, of course, we did not see a single false that those three and Ragnaros were just on the top of the list, banned or picked the first picked on Hero League. And now we have this patch. And then next week, we have Valera coming with that new balance patch also. Valera is old news, man. I, we I, I saw that Lucio trailer. I don't care about her anymore. <laughs> <laughs> we actually may also see Zagara in, the, in some of the games, too. Definitely a possibility. Um, I'm most excited about the potential return of Sonya. Mm -hmm. That's also big. Um, we are going to go into Infernal Shrines. This will actually be the map pick of Mighty. So GG took first ban again. And uh, we'll see how this one goes. They could close it out right now as we go into this draft. And I'm hoping we might see some more Kerrigan. It was pretty decent yesterday. So far, the first pick has been winning all the time. Mighty picked first, first pick, first game. They won. GG picks the first game, first pick, second game, day one. Yeah, I wouldn't draw too much into that right now, but it, I do feel like first pick is stronger. It uh, is, there, yeah. There's direct uh, 
correlation as, as to some of the hero picks that come in with that. But I think that's only when the two teams are about the same strength and maybe one of the teams are this little bit better, but if you compare to teams like MB Flat or L5, which, and it's not about, it's, it is also from the first pick, but their hero pool is just so wide and so big that just controlling of the drafting, it's amazing because they can just pick and play so many different styles of play. Well, let's see what good game is going to take with that first pick now. Valset's set's still very strong here, so it's definitely an option. Um, this one's a little bit less clear cut. Zarya is not really something you want to first pick here, even though she is normally the throwaway ban at the beginning because he's so strong in general and powers a lot of heroes. We are going to take it though. Um, this, what's? I, I don't want to judge this pick too early. Let's wait and see what they want to pair it with first. Zarya basically can go in with any team comp, I feel like. That's why it is so heavily focused. And Kerrigan, of course, has to be Z Look, not Zarya. <laughs> it has to be banned because Infernal Shrines. Remember, there was a time where Tastar was one of the strongest heroes because of his ability to pair with all melee assassins when the melee assassins were getting uh, stronger and stronger back towards the middle of summer. And Tastar and Zarya are two heroes that really just empower so many different heroes that that's why she's powerful, not in her own. It's not like, oh, they picked Zarya, the game's over, it's like, well, they have Zarya, so now all these other heroes become a lot stronger. Um, that's why Tastar is banned here as well. Uh, we're going to see, again, the prioritization of Ragnaros here uh, for Sans by Mighty, and they're going to bring Vala in as well. It's somewhat of a deny pick as well, so that GG can't use that with Zarya. It looks like Valkyrian and Tychus, they're picking a lot of their comfort picks, of course, Jayon, really liking that Valkyrian today. We and don't uh, see BDG play Tychus all that often, but I think they're taking it away from SD. I think GG has done a lot of research for these drafts, and they're, they're, doing, they're making decisions that I, I, I find to be quite intelligent, given the information we have. Yeah, that's right. They're also stealing is very important during the draft, and also takes away. Johanna, if they're not going to take it... This, it's, a, it's a good idea to ban it. This screams, I'm going to pick Varian to me. Uh, there's, because there's, a, there's, there's a almost chance. no reason to ban Zagara, I mean, sorry, Johanna here. Otherwise, yes, she can clear the shrine very quickly. She has strong wave clear. But it's not as impactful as that. Um, Maybe just take out Gul'dan also here because Gul'dan is so, such a powerful wave clear. Yeah. They may remove Li Ming. That's something that I would consider here, too, because of the way SDE has been playing and how they really like to have one AD with the Li Ming paired together. The last game was an exception where we saw the Aurel. We don't really normally see that. It was the first time we've seen anything like that in this tournament. So um, that was rare and strange. They're probably considering the Li Ming. They're obviously considering the Varian as well. I don't think they're going to ban it because it feels too obvious. Or also ETC because yeah, it Joker was just literally saving their... But <laughs> PG <laughs> 13 stream. Uh, so it's going to be an Ariel ban, uh, which we hadn't really talked about, but obviously pairs really well with Vala. Um, I think this just allows Joker to ch take his pick of the litter. He can either go into the ETC, which is so well versed on, very strong on, or he could take the Varian because there's no Johanna to deny him. Um, you know that, and that's going to be the the duel there. I think with Zarya being able to have extra shields and a target that gets taunted, I'm leaning towards the ETC, personally. I think it's the more powerful choice here. Yep, well, of course, Joker, Joker, like, super powerful on on ETC every single time. Although he has not been playing his best today, I think it is possible to come back in his best shape and form. But having Tychus on the other side is, is quite scary as an ETC, because like if you're talking about Muradin, he can stall a few more seconds. I think ETC has a higher chance of blowing up within the couple seconds. So, but he still does go ahead and yeah. take ETC with false stats. So base they have a global and a potential global at ten. They might actually also go for Mosh Pit if if GG does not go. Okay, no Mosh Pit here. Diablo finally and Zeratul. GG is going all out here. I love the Zeratul into the Zarya. They know Mighty doesn't have Varian anymore because they're not going to pick that as their fifth pick. Wouldn't make sense. They need a support. Mm -hmm. Really intelligent drafting here. GG is just, they have got smart drafting today. I, I that's one of the things that I, I really want to look at. They're, um, the only weird things they've done in draft 
were the Dahaka pick, which worked out really well. It wasn't even that strange, but it was like a little bit less normal for GG standards. That's not normally what they do. And then the Artanis. But everything else I feel like has been like textbook, solid, intelligent drafting. Um, and why do you feel we'll just grab the Rhaegar here? I mean, that is one of the best choice left so far, because Malfurion, of course, is already taken by Jayhan. I think Morales is just simply too risky with both Diablo and Zeratul. I think they're actually thinking about Morales because they have to actually save Vala. They have to keep... Yes, they have to keep ETC, False Dead, Ragnaros, and Vala alive from Taika's Zeratul, Zarya, and it is, it is Ragnar at the end, though. Nasong playing some really good Rhaegar tonight, so there's no it's not a shocker. Um I think the the problem with Morales is just that she's too vulnerable. I like the idea, uh, as well as what you're saying, against a different type of composition, um, without the Zeratul and Diablo, with maybe only one of each. It seems a little bit more uh enticing. But uh I like the drafts for both teams. Let's get into this game. Mighty could close it out 3-0 here. GG looks to force a fifth and final game. We're gonna go into the map right now. It's Infernal Shrines. This is HGC Korea with Wolf and G-Clef. See you in game. I always say see you in game, but you guys don't really see me. You see me afterwards, right before the crossover breaks. Joe Grunny DC stands on Rag, Ma Magi on Falstad, Nasong on Rhaegar, and ST on Bala. Oh, man. And GG, BDG on Taika's Jaehyun on Malfurion, good on Zeratu, Julio on Diablo, and UJ on Zarya. Well, I mean. As as it stands right now, the draft, in terms of what you've come to expect and what this meta is right now, is much better for Mighty. Um, I think GG, especially with the uh, Zeratul after the Zarya, that kind of combination, feels a little bit forced. Like, if Mighty just plays standard, they get an edge. GG is going to have to force picks with their Diablo. They're going to have to make this Diablo worth it. Um, entirely sure if that heal was worth it, speaking of which, on a full health uh, Diablo nearly there. Alright, let's see if they can get any picks. We're gonna start with this attempt. Definitely, absolutely not working out for GG. Well, Hooligan getting smashed from the beginning. That's a lot of damage coming out from Bala since the start of the game. Well, that's the one of the things about Diablo. You can go in, make the play, but put yourself in the danger. Like, huge danger, actually, like, unless you have the cover from your entire team. You, like, need, you need to find a badly positioned hero, or you need to punish a mistake with Diablo. If you just try to force the issue, as we saw Hooligan do there, you die. And BDG is going to find himself dead as well. Hooligan going in here, really interesting choice. Will he get the kill on Magi? I don't think so. Uh, that was really risky, and he's going to die for it. Twice in a row, like that. This is this is worrisome. You know, you get the Diablo pick, but it looks like perhaps Hooligan is not as well versed on Diablo as, as he should be for a pick like this. And, and good was good to out false that, and he was dragging the death, death chicken on top of him the entire time. But this is Zeratul, you got to be careful. That's the count, basically the counter pick, so to say, against a false that. Exactly. He forces false that to back. But the EXP gained is just, I mean, it was just incorrect. And it looks like the Root will come in, and San just turns around and tries to do at least some damage before he goes down. He does so actually do quite a significant amount of damage. He actually does, takes out half of the bow. But still, he couldn't really get anything. And Mighty, from that team fight a minute ago, they just had to lead. Like, this shrine, they can't, GG can't really fight contest at all. They had a they had a uh, a pick uh, on Sans, but then they didn't try to capitalize on Shrine Control. They just wanted to give it up from the beginning. It looks like and takes a, a, an EXP lead or at least attempt to catch up EXP, and they do uh, do so. Um, in fact, they're going to stay really split here right now, leaving Zeratul in the top lane. It's going to be a free wall for Mighty as a result, but they're just trying to keep the EXP as even as possible. They knew that this Shrine was going to be a difficult one. And uh, this is not a bad choice by any means. 
they could have tried to uh, control the shrine, but with really low death timers and uh, Sans respawning very quickly, I think it would have ended poorly for them. So, again, I feel like in terms of intelligent plays, like the smarts are definitely with GG here. Like they're making intelligent decisions. They're uh, choosing objectives wisely. Their drafting has been very intelligent as well. But um, in terms of mechanics, I feel like that's what's what's causing Mighty to win this. I think Mighty is winning the series almost purely on mechanics alone. I think GG really needs to have... Their draft and their teamwork team comp is basically for the Shrine fights, I feel like. They have to wait for that moment and contest. They can't just fight over the edge and just split spread apart. Of course, their two can get picks from the side, but that's another story other than team fight. Sure. All right, the bot for it here already damaged earlier from that Punisher is now under fire by Impalers, and they're gonna go down here for the gank on Wuje. Will absolutely be successful. They should easily get the fort from this as well. And good game. I'm surprised they're even going to continue to commit here. Joker, though, does get actually caught there. The cleanse used earlier on onto Sans, I believe. So using that cleanse earlier meant that he was not able to be cleansed, and they make this a one for one, and also the fort does not go down. So uh, I spoke too soon on that one, but Good targeting there onto Joker. I think Clunch. they were actually trying to take it down because they had Ragnaros, of course, but GG just had the faster rotations that they were actually a little surprised that they came out that fast. And they did take Zarya from that. Yeah. Cleanse uh, there just having to be used so early was the problem. We're going to see actually a faster camp here for Mighty, which is going to unfortunately not really work out too well with the Shrine here because GG could just clear it as they contest the Shrine. We'll see if they actually do contest it this time, because last time they just basically pressed the forfeit button. Um, <laughs> but this time they're actually going to contest it. They're even going to send Zarya up. So Uje is coming up. This means a lot of extra soak for Mighty. And because that bottom fort is out of ammunition, they're actually going to kill it. So they're going to get closer and closer to 10 here. And I'm worried about this being the choice, uh, this being the shrine that GG wants to contest. Now, Shrine Fight, you have to really, your entire team really has to, there goes the four. You, you have to really make the choice if you want to take those minions or start to fight. You have to focus if you want to start the fight. Or some, some of the teams, they end up just taking the minions. Miscommunication in the middle. And Hooligan starts to go in, grabs onto Sans, but it is cleansed. But still, no way of making out from that. Just great body blocks coming out. But very low on Hooligan, and there goes Diablo. All right. This is, by the way, a 4v3 fight currently because Magi hasn't even come in. He's going to get them 10, and he can fly up now. This will be a one shrine for Mighty. Uh, Sans got picked. That's really unfortunate. But, I mean, you, you really have to give credit to how much damage he was able to do and uh, that Mighty was basically able to win a fight down a member. And they were only up one level. They did not have heroics for that fight. They have them now. And wow, we're actually going to see Mosh Pit, interestingly here. It's not the, you know, this is not the map where it's a huge global map, where global is super important. It's important on every map, obviously, but this is not the global map. Yeah, I think they realized false that flying is, was enough for that global presence. And false that has been soaking so well and uh, took on the counteract from GG's side to really mark on that false that Zero 2 was nowhere close to it all the Sometimes, but not all the time. So I guess Mighty just went out and chose the Mosh Pit. I we saw the positioning of L5 yesterday against the Mosh, Mosh Pit. They were basically all over the map. It's not, they knew the Mosh Pit was going to come in, power slide from somewhere, so just all spread apart. Let's see how GG, how well they can react to it. Good got some extra soak. They have 10 now. It's going to be Apocalypse instead of Lightning Breath, so they'll be able to maybe link some stuns together here. Uh, yeah, really, they actually don't have very many stuns at all. Maybe get a root into an Apocalypse, that sort of combo, or out of the Void Prison. There's definitely some potential there. Uh, the Expulsion Zone going to help out with that a lot. They're down two levels, though. And the Reign of Vengeance. <laughs> cute there, SD. That was pretty cute. They're actually going to try to make this their fight. This is a risky invade by GG. I love that gust. And now Hooligan and Good are locked in. Good tries to use his Void Prison to escape. He nearly dies to the Impalers. Oh, dodges, Sans attacks both of them. Very beautiful moves there by Good, but this is a one uh, exchange for GG. Look at that sick combo of just he heroic Void Prison, Apocalypse, and Twilight Dream right on top of three of Mighty. That was big, and Mighty really tried Ancestral Healing at the right time, but Joko getting caught from the beginning, I think that 
had changed a lot because he lost so much health in the beginning of the fight. And Magi really tried his, tried his best from the side, but that was basically it. The Zero Tool was also marking him at the same time. Good is so greedy in this game with how everything he's been doing. He's a EXP machine. He wants more than that more than anything. He's been soaking non-stop. Not even Hearthing went low here because he just wants to get that extra wave before coming back. He can actually go into this uh, camp as well to clear it. And uh, with the heals he's been given, he will never need to Hearth now. They do sort of, you know, like kind of get closer in EXP from that last exchange, that team fight. Um, but there's no objective to take from it, so kind of everybody but Mighty respawns, and they still weren't able to get 13, so Mighty's still significantly ahead here. I like the cho choice of going all the way down, because even though they had, they only had a little info where the entire Team GG were before they actually took the camp, they went a little bit aggressive because they had the talent lead, and here comes the Gust, they basically spread apart, three Hooligan, at, but take tanking some damage, BDG put down that laser drill, looks like if they oh, the great Smash to be shot Ragnaros. All right, we're gonna see Rain of Vengeance coming down here. Jaehyun was isolated for so, so long. Good again, kind of carrying this fight with his Void Prism. Ancestral does finally go off, but the APOC combo is strong. As good, it does as much damage as he can. This is a one fight for GG again. Uh, and the Apocalypse combo there was really uh, nice and all, but it's amazing that they were able to save Jaehyun in, in general, and that was really Good uh, and Hooligan. They were able to, Hooligan was able to peel for him, and then Good came and got that amazing boy prison. The Jayon is just fine. And uh, very well done. GG is bringing the, the team fights in for sure now that they have their heroics, and they're even now on talent tiers, and they're looking to take this shrine. Both teams does not have too much to heroics, but Joker does have Mosh. Big Mosh goes in, but canceled immediately right there. Joker goes down, and is now GG on to the chase. Mighty just has to go back home without two of their members gone from the fight. Good is killing it right now. He actually can get on to Magi. Magi with a huge rotational decision here to actually go through there. Good's not going to use his Vorpal because it's just a little bit too far away, but nearly got a kill there. And it's interesting to see how well Good's been playing today. I don't feel like he's really shined. Uh, that's not a word. He hasn't really shown um, as a player yet, uh, as a star. <laughs> until today like he absolutely is a strong mechanical player we've seen it in this series is dahaka play down on the zeratul the zeratul is really the most impactful uh hero that we're seeing right now the boy prison's been on point he's been able to pressure uh false set in the back lines over and over and over again once he got void prison i mean he is really turning this game around and even cleanse was already used and let's see this combo does work and twilight dream also lands on regar is gone by that time sans also in trouble on all the way at the end gg's landing all those cc's and magi actually landed in a quite dangerous zone but he uh, manages to escape from that yeah, wow gg just i think hooligan is that hooligan is actually initiating at the right moment and mighty just being a little bit not too cautious about what they can actually do on, on top of the things they actually, they fell for the exact same trap like two times already. Oh man, Joker actually commits really hard here. Good actually used Vorpal and uh, gets nearly baited into a kill there, but immediately Jaehyun heals him and he does escape just barely. But this is a really powerful position for GG. They have this pressure for they're not gonna get it, uh, but they back off here. They're very, very close to 16 and with no global heroes, they're still out, uh, you know, ahead in EXP because they've been winning team fights. Good is just constantly soaking this top lane. Because there's no fort in the top lane and because he's been leaving it there, there's always kind of free EXP waiting for him up there. So he rotates over and gets it because it's on their side of the map. It's safe to do so. As a result, as soon as Mighty sees that Zeratul is in the top lane, they invade this camp. So good decision here by Mighty. Okay, we have 5v4 here. We're moving together as 5. We just need to get 16. So let's not take any unnecessary risks. The waves are pushed, it's hard for us to soak, so let's just take the entire map full of camps. And uh, Hooligan all alone here, actually. This is a very aggressive position. See how dangerous Hooligan actually positions himself. He's way too aggressive, but that's the thing. Zarya has that shield available for him, and whenever he has to make that escape, they can make that happen just like this. And Multicore just used, actually pretty effective against GG right now, taking a lot of health. Okay, good has to Void Prison here, but we're going to see the APOC combo once more. There's a big stun. Basically, Rhaegar doesn't exist. See you later, Nasong. 
Two kills, three kills already. SDE, see if he goes for the Vorpal, he does. SDE still gets away. Um, I don't want to give Hooligan credit for that one. They have to give credit to Good yet again. Uh, I, I feel like basically Hooligan is like, all right, I'm going to get these kills. I'm going to go in, and everyone's like, uh, everyone's like, oh, wait, 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 wait. And Good's like, oh, I got this. It's fine. It's Hooligan, you're no, no big deal, man. We got this. I, I'll just void him. Just <laughs> press APOC. We're fine. This is the power of Zarya into any team comp. Like going in deep, even even if you're even if you're for frontline warrior, overextends a little bit. You can just basically shield him and also use that expulsion drone just to make safe the exit for your front line, just like what happened. And great they just have so much CC and it's been hitting mighty all the time. Maybe I don't want to point on Joker too much, but Mosh Pit is barely any use in this kind of team fights right now. Yeah, I would have to agree with that. As we see, Falstead just dies immediately. Moggy out positioned here, and I'm not even sure why Mighty is contesting this. Like, I have, there is literally no zero reason for them to be here right now, and they're going to get wiped as a result. Four will die, and that is going to make this Punisher all the more powerful. I, somebody, I mean, somebody, give me one reason why they should have gotten there. There's I think, was zero. I think, I think they thought this could have been their last, actual last chance before they hit 20, because they knew the Punisher was gonna come out anyhow, and that they have the equal talent. So they tried it, did not work. First boss that blew up by the, by the even the observer when the observer got there, he was already blowing up, and ETC really not able to using use that mosh into any kind of form. GG had superior positioning. Uh, and Moggy died because Look they... Look at that CC, it's amazing. Like, ETC can't even do anything. Uh, Moggy died because they went in there, rushed. Uh, you know, they were like, let's go, we gotta hurry, 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 they're about to finish it. They went in, rushed, um, and as a result was picked immediately, and the fight was over from that point on with all the CC you just described. They didn't even have to use Void APOC. Didn't uh, really use a whole lot of heroics at all there. And now they're actually on the core. There's the Draken here. This very well may just be game. They're going to commit to it. I don't think Mighty has what it takes to stop this. Sand is going to try, though. Do put up a silence here. Core is down now to 30%. Will they get it? Good is on top. I think this is going to be game over here. We're going to a fifth game, G Club. That's it. GG, quite and, literally. And it looks like that Diablo is very happy to take that win with all that fire. It looks like a real Diablo now. And look at those combos. It's amazing. Well played by GG. A very good game as they're, they are the GG. Hooligan definitely making a lot of mistakes in the early game, though. And also, you know, a few of those moments, like, it was definitely a bit too far forward. Good was the real hero of that game. All of his Void Prism was really good. He was always isolating Falstad, making sure that he wasn't unable to get into the fight. And uh, good, two games in a row in this series, both uh, the Dahaka game and this one, he looks on fire. And I don't know uh, what Mighty's going to do now. They have, of course, the ability to take first pick back away. Um, in terms of maps, We've already seen Cursed, Towers of Doom, Dragonshire, and Infernal. Um, in terms of maps, I think we're probably going to Sky Temple here. That's a very likely choice, but there are still other options, of course. And ETC, I, maybe if they wanted to go a little bit more macro using just out, not fighting too much, if they they can lose a member or maybe up to two using from that Void Prison, Apocalypse, and Twilight Dream combo. But if they out macro, just catch up to level and then maybe try to fight later somehow, I think that could have been a better chance com compared to taking the Mosh. Actually, also trying to fight when there are just so many CCs to cut off the Mosh. They were never going to steal the Punisher ever in that situation. It was like, I think when they decided to go in, it was probably like somewhere between 28 and 32 monsters already dead. They went in anyways uh, into a superior position. Magi went first, so... Of course, he died first with all the CC you were you know, talking about there. And if they lost that Punisher, maybe they lose a keep, worst case scenario. They get wiped, they lose the game. And so that decision there was a poor one, especially in terms of results. You made the argument that I think is the only real argument you can make is post or sorry, pre-20. They wanted to take that fight pre-20, yeah, but that's talent. not the way to do it. Yeah, that's not the way to do it, but it was their last chance taken. And Jaehyun really staying on that back line and UJ on that Zarya just shielding at the right time. I know you might think it's just what's so hard about just shielding your front liner whenever he goes in, but it actually the timing of the shield and the amount of energy you have to keep to do 
the damage. We did not actually see how much exact damage Zarya put in that game, but Zarya actually does a lot of damage and pretty fast wave clear too. So Zarya is very important as you can see was banned so many times during HTC Korea. Expulsion zone really powerful too. Uh, yeah. Not to not to forget about that and Apoc Void Prison. Um, Hooligan very aggressive there in that game. I, I feel like, yeah, it's it, he did play well, and it's our first time seeing Diablo in the tournament, but I think without good playing that well, um, maybe people look back at the game and say, Hooligan played poorly. I think he played a, a fairly decent game, but he definitely had a lot of mistakes, especially there in the early game. Um, we are going to get our map now. I'm going to check it right now. Oh, as oh, yeah. I predicted, it's going to be Sky Temple. Oh, yeah, Wolf on fire. Um, but we don't know who picked that. I'm gonna, we're going to find out <laughs> in just a second. But still. Seems like the Korean commentators have a lot to say about that game. <laughs> well, I guess so. Fourth map. Uh, they have it on set four, but <laughs> it is actually set five pick. That's right. for, I got confused for a second, but still. Sky Temple, it is going to be the global heroes are going to be the important ones here. I think both teams has to com they're not completely using their global potentials. If they actually do, I think they can macro out a lot easier than they sh what's happening so far. But let's see which team is actually able to get a better draft into Sky Temple. This was of course GG's pick because Mighty would take first pick over the map any day of the week. Um, we'll see what uh, they prioritize here. I think the foul stat is the obvious point choice of GG might even ban it. Um, so powerful. There goes zero tool. Good's like, you, you know, when you get a target bounty, you like to see a smile, like, yeah, respected, respected. Okay, there's the Tassadar ban, which means Mighty picks up Falstad here. Uh, deny that from the team that picked this map. Would be very wise. They have not done this a single time, mind you. They've picked Ragnaros every time, and they may just do that again here. I think Falstad is absolutely the best choice. But Mighty seems to think otherwise. They're the team that's prioritizing Rag over Falstad, especially Rag on these large maps. Rag is also strong on this map. Of course, we saw a lot. And one of the note, Tempest had some Sylvanas playing in Sky Temple, and it seems to work. Maybe it was because of he is Duck Duck. But still, Mighty also has that chance available, so just to keep that in mind. But they have insta-locking Ragnaros all four games, but they are thinking pretty hard about this one. They really are. I think this, they're finally given some consideration to playing out that Falsty. And I mean, we've talked about everything else. It looks like there's, what we have to do is wait. Um, personally, I'm with the Falsty. They're with the Rag. Yeah, okay. this, this gives GG a chance to just take that Falsty away if they actually choose to. But also, Zarya is also available here and pretty good giving shields to sustain on that temple, which is really important because. Temple actually is pretty strong if you don't have anything. If you're not like a Sonya, let's say you're a support, you shouldn't be there by, by, the, by the way. Yeah, the Guardians are quite difficult to deal with for sure. Um, they're definitely giving some thought to the Zarya. I think it's more likely that we just simply see the Malfurion and Falstad though. There's nothing to pair with uh, Zarya in terms of what GG has been running. Um, they could run Dahaka now. That could be what good plays here, but with Zarya or with Zeratul banned, it's much less appealing to put Zarya up at the top of the list here. Whereas on the previous set, Zeratul wasn't banned. They had a plan. They wanted to use Zeratul to beginning. They hit it. And it is going to be Zarya with Vala. So I'm starting to feel familiar here, but they're going to leave Falstad to Mighty. Well, this opens up a lot of opportunities for Mighty. They can just go ahead and pick Tychus again before it is banned or I'm not sure what Joker this will decide to play. He has been playing some some variants, some ETC does not seem to work for him tonight. Both of the top, both both heroes. Maybe he can pick something else because there are lots of other choices available. Like still Johanna against the Ballas is still pretty good. Yeah. Um, Moggy like in the match against MVP Miracle, Moggy was the Falstad master, right? He showed great decision-making with the hero. Uh, safety as well, very rarely picked, and dominated that series off Falstad alone. They've switched their priority big time against good game here, away from the Falstad, but they do finally take it. Shocking that this pick uh, rotation would take so long to make. 
And uh, I, I, I think this is personally, like, on, in terms of just universally where we are right now in the Korean meta, these are the, the obvious picks. But Mighty is really changing what they were thinking for on Friday to Sunday. Uh, they're not playing the same way. They're not playing the same way for sure. And taking away Mount Furion from... There's a Taiga Span. And as we mentioned, taking away Mount Furion from Jaehyun, I think that really forces him out of his comfort zone a lot. Well, he did play, I believe, Regar today once or twice. Yeah, he did. But those Ancestrals were a few times, a little, just, just by a tiny bit, too late compared to Na Sang's Ancestral. And then taking away ETC seems to be a very good choice. Seems wise, yeah. And having Zarya, of course, shielding ETC can work. Not as strong as Diablo, but still, ETC can do a lot of damage also. They might take Li Ming here uh, to deny that from SDE and then give the consideration to... Uh, the Mosh also? Yeah, yeah. Also, the other thing that we're looking at here is what is good going to be playing here? Because he may just simply play the Zarya. But I was going to say, Dahaka feels really appealing right now. Like. Dahaka, he's played it so well, so aggressively. This time they have ETC on their side. Dahaka's, Dahaka's extra global, plus the fact they have ETC at level 10 plus to be able to be global, feels really strong. So I think they're just going to, uh, you know, take the Rhaegar later, as you mentioned, and pick up the Dahaka here. Now, Mighty, well, I think they leaving now. Leaving and possibly even one more variant if actually because they have Vala but we saw that before Joker was couldn't really get into all the way to the back deep line because he might find himself in the danger zone but if they have a Vala with Zarya on that shield and and ETC just supporting Vala from the danger maybe it's time for that taunt who knows I don't think Jaehyun is comfortable playing on that cares him yet to I'd, see. I'd rather see Johanna Li Ming here. It's going to be Murad and Gul'dan, so they're going to take the Gul'dan again, which uh, didn't work well for them last time. And yeah, I like this choice. I like this choice of Joker going around his picks tonight. It, it did not work so well. There's a reason, but still another reason to not use them and just go around, just pick some fresh picks. I think that's a good choice too. Duana is really strong wave clear, doesn't matter that much on this map. Um, so, really just picking her only for the blind feels weak. Uh, but they would know that there's really no ability damage on the side of GG, purely auto. That's why I was leading towards the uh, Johanna Vic, the blind is going to get a lot of value. But they're sticking with Muradin. He has mobility. This map is much more a Muradin map than a Johanna map in that way. Uh, taking GD's draft aside. Guys, this is the fifth and final game of our first series. Winner takes all on Sky Temple. Mighty versus GG. It's been a fiery series, but it all comes to an end right now on this final map. Mighty in blue. Joker on Murden. Sands on Ragnaros. Magi on Falstad. Nasong on Malfurion. And SDE on Gul'dan. And their opponent, GG in red. BDG on Vala. Oh. Jaehyun in Regar. Good on Dehaka. And Hooligan ETC and Wu Jae on Zarya. Here we go. Let's see, good was pretty good on the Haka before, so I would expect him to come from the other side, maybe grab onto Gudan or even Malfiri and then blow up the team fight. That is also a possibility. They also just stay GG actually decides to go a little aggressive and they're taking a lot of damage from the beginning. Shielded a little bit this is later also. This is wise because there's no strong CC hero here to punish them for this. Yes, they took a lot of damage, but they can all just tap a well. Um, and they're basically trading cooldowns for, on the well for the structures. If they're up against ETC, if Joker is on ETC, 100% they don't do that because it's too risky. They're bullying Sands in lane here, baiting rotations up. They're going to back off. And ETC is just free in mid. I like how GG is playing this, to be honest. 
Well, I, I also do in a way, but as we saw from MVP Black's game, they were prioritizing the bottom lane for that big picture they were drawing because of the second, second temple phase. They were pushing the wall with the Savannahs, and basically they won that second temple phase pretty easily. They Well, it turns out they didn't have, even have to go to the well, but still, that was like planned, very smart, smart play, then that was a strategy. It looks like they're not following too much of that, but that was really, that was great then. There's definitely a lesson to be learned here. Um, Black gets the more potent uh, and relevant objective, but in this case, they bully Ragnaros, who does no escapes. So there's like trade-offs on both sides. And I, I think it's really good that you bring this up because in a perfect world, if you could choose which one, you would definitely want the bot. But in this case against Rag, that's where they knew they had the safer push. So. I like this a lot. The positioning, of course, of uh, Hooligan as well to make sure no rotations could stop them was why this worked out so well. And looks like Nathang is caught and blown up from the beginning. Hooligan, great power slide in, and Joker will just storm toss away. But all this, during all this time, Ragnaros has been firing all those shots by himself on the up on top. So it's an equal trade, but also, well, losing by Furin is does hurt, but I think it's an equal trade about as the same. I would I would agree. If they get the final shots here and don't miss any waves in bot, like if Daga goes down there after this kill and they don't miss any minions, I think this is about even. It's unfortunate that SDE actually dies. Uh, basically a, a death that was in vain. Um, that's unfortunate, it's frustrating, but otherwise I think Mighty's still in a pretty good place here. They got a little bit of extra soak. Sans got those those minions up there. They sent the Haka top instead of to get the soak on bot. And uh, we're at an almost dead even game at the same time. I was thinking, I was thinking, Leeming would be the last choice of Mighty instead of Gul'dan, but I guess they wanted that wave clear a little bit more, and especially the having that horrified team teamfight just turn around, around lots of things. And all it also has to do with players what they which hero they like, which hero they can play better and feel, feel comfortable while they're actually pressured in this in this big stage. One of the reasons why Gul'dan is better than Li Ming, potentially uh, part of the reasoning they might have taken it, is because Li Ming's damage is in such obvious chunks and bursts that it makes Zarya's shields a lot more powerful because you can just simply time it to absorb all of the damage. Whereas Gul'dan's damage over time when the shield expires will just hit your HP directly. So that's something that sustained damage versus burst is better against Zarya's shielding. So that's one of the reasons why they take Gul'dan here, absolutely. And we'll see if it works out for them. The wave clear is important. They know this is Sky Temple. They're going to go for a fell build instead of the Echoed Corruption because that's just a stronger um, pick because the game is unlikely to go uh, to that long stage. Although this is one of the closest games of Sky Temple I've ever cast. Um, for now. Yeah, for now. It's definitely not snowballing one way or the other, which is quite rare for this map. And uh, these two teams are just so evenly matched. And also having Falstead on one team and the Hulk on the other team. Both teams are gonna just soak up. They're not gonna lose. They can lose some EXP, but they're have. They're, they both teams have w at least one hero to soak up in the other lane. They can join the team fight later. Hooligan really runs. <laughs> Looks like the Sands is just trying to be safe, just running away. UJ tries to be a little aggressive, having that ETC. Actually, Mighty didn't lose too much because usually having that ETC, you have that global. Not global presence, but having that roaming ability at the beginning of the game, it's just so strong. It's very, very strong. He's the strongest uh, early game tank in the game. His late game is probably one of the strongest as well, once, especially once he hits 20. Um, this is controlled by GG currently, though, because of Hooligan's position. Get again. Cleanse goes off to save SDE, but he gets hooked, and he will not be saved at the end of the day. And Mighty should not... Uh, collapse on this. They're down a member now. That's okay because I think Falstead, Falstead has already pushed the fort and all to the second wall. I think this is actually a good trade for Mighty. Yeah. I don't, they don't have to contest. They can just stall some time from them going back. Precisely. Like, yeah, Dehaka just went back. Just You can't just leave Magi to do all that damage. See how much damage he did by himself. Precisely. If, if they had decided to fight there, I think it would have been a very poor choice. Um, but it, because they did not, um, I'm gonna have a pause here. You guys probably saw the lag spike there. Um, because they did not, they get the keep wall, and basically Falstead did about as much as the yeah. uh, temple, and they're gonna get 10 first as a result. 
So we see a lot of these great macro plays basically having a higher level and then taking that advantage into a team fight, just forcing the other team just unable to team fight or just crushing them into a team fight. We see that a lot and that is one of the most crucial things about basically about the game. That is how the game is made and just all the Korean teams are seems to be there on top of things and especially the higher teams. They're just managing like globally how they run the game, how they draft around it, so they have the they can use that maximum potential of what they can do with the team comp. It's amazing. Even these teams, and not saying that they're not strong, but they have not perfected what they can actually do. But watch, let's see what that what happens in like two weeks or so. Maybe they can go up to a level of MVP Miracle or challenge even MVP Black or L5. Yeah. Um, I. I do want to say that GG actually did get 10 first, uh, despite everything. Um, just barely, very slightly. Now uh, the heroics are here, and there's a lot of high impact heroics on both sides here. Um, we are going to see uh, adaptation from good, which is something that we've been seeing a lot in Korea. We see isolation sometimes every now and then um, in the West. But uh, I like this choice, and he has the backup of Ancestral to keep himself alive. Good's style of Dahaka is insanely aggressive. We saw it uh, previously two maps ago, and we're going to see it here again. And uh, these two teams are, I think, so passive right now for how this map normally goes. I think they're really feeling the pressure of this game five. No one's really taking any risks. Everyone's just playing insanely standard, safe. You know, if they're, they're not 100% sure they're going to get the pick, why even try? You know, very, very. Uh, Unusual for Sky Temple to be this dead even at 720. Yeah, both teams are being super cautious at yeah. the moment. They want to win. They don't want... And, they, and every 10 members of these both teams, they don't want to make any mistakes and feel that guiltiness after the game. Like, uh, we lost that game because of you. Yeah. That feels so bad at the at the end. So just being super cautious, of course, is, it's a good thing, but not too... Really, okay, Joker getting caught, but... I, I like the choice of Mordin as I said before because he has been getting caught several times today and then basically he's ATC blown up a few times before the fight. Nose Joker has the Cloud 9 mount which is clearly a reference to King Caffeine <laughs> uh, and his Mordin play from the spring season of BlizzCon 20, uh, 2015. 2017 already? No, no, not yet. That's later this year. Yeah. But um, I just want to I just want to point that out. Very very subtle <laughs> reference there, Joker. Joker also a big fan uh, of NA, here. and he's said on his stream multiple times he wishes he could play HTC And here comes Foggy oh, on man. the side, gusting UJ and BDG, awesome. Vala in trouble, this is exactly what they wanted, silence, but Ancestral goes in. Uh, looks like Vala's gonna stay alive for a little bit more, it is cooldown that's going down, Nasang also in trouble, this going, fight is going all over, but three or two already dead from Mighty, Ragnaros goes into Molten Core, is that gonna be enough? Not, I don't think that's enough, and they're basically that's not the way you should go. You can't go back. It's impossible. Rag is the only one alive, and the entire team of Mighty except for Rag is just gone for that fight. Incredible Sans was able to escape at all, to be honest. This fight, they had the Wombos of combos. Like, it had a great gust, <laughs> isolating, great a really too. good silence, and the Ancestral goes off, so Vala lives, and that's when the fight turns around. Vala can still... Especially with the build she's chosen, she's not in. She's not really a spell damage Vala. She has gone for double, but she does uh, double uh, Ws. But she has a large damage output regardless uh, of being silenced. So saving her there was the critical point, and that ancestral won them the fight. We're gonna see a temple to the bottom taken by Mighty, as uh, Hooligan is just gonna extra soak down here at the bot, and they're pushing the keep wall. So they're gonna trade uh, this temple for a little bit more lane pressure, and I like this because the bottom fort is not as significant as the top keep wall. They already lost theirs, but now they've taken away the same from Mighty. And they're even like looking to get the keep tower. It looks like Dehaka just hearted back, pressed back home for the moment, and ETC is trying to, looks like he's trying to soak up EXP at the bot lane so they don't lose too much. So even temples, a fort for a keep wall, mm -hmm. this is a win for GG. And now, you know, the top is neutral in terms of structures. So both keep walls gone. And it looks like Falstead is about to fly over. So 
Maybe he's just stalling a few more, few more seconds before he flies over. Maybe he's just got a few more seconds on cooldown. Oh, looks like he's just actually clearing up there. They want to get as much EXP as they can. They want to try to uh, catch up to 16. The problem is that GG's going to have it first, even if Falstad stays there. And they're gonna, they have a small window of time where they're not down a talent tier if they're going to fight. Magi is uh, just hiding here. I guess maybe like it looked like he flew in, but he didn't. Good sees him, of course, and he shows himself in the mini wave anyways. 16's up for GG. They see Magi. They're actually going to try to get a pick here onto Sans. His positioning again, a mistake here, gets stunned. They need to get this pick to make the ults worth it. I mean, they used Reign of Vengeance as well as Stage Dive, and they don't get the kill. And Magi flies over and uses the Gust to disengage the entire team. Great trade right there. No casualties, just Mighty. All he has to use was Gust, and compared to that, Stage Dive and Expulsion Zone was wasted. Not wasted, but used from GG's side. Sans's positioning is often so risky that it almost feels like he's baiting. Like, why would he go through the bot there? That's so risky. It's, it's and, and wholly unnecessary. It's so greedy. Well, we saw from a lot of Ragnaros players like Modern Life, if you extend, overextend just a little bit, it's not even overextend for Ragnaros to overextend, I, I guess. If you go over that line of the middle lane, then that's where you become the, go into the dangerous zone. It is so hard for a rack to just stay safe when they have so many globals that they can get you. This feels like he's baiting <laughs> with how, how he moves. Almost. And um, 16 now reached for Mighty. The fact that those heroics were wasted attempting to get Sans, or Sans, excuse me, was so good for Mighty because now we're back on an even slate. Like this game has been very, 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 very close. GG had a slight lead temporarily, but it's all been turned around now as uh, the game is dead even, essentially. But they have the same talents, and Falstead just soaking a little bit more ESP on the bottom lane before he flies over, and looks like GG's gonna start taking that top temple. Okay, Moggy's flying. Here we go. This fight may decide the game. It's gonna decide who gets 21st almost at the very least. Hooligan taking some damage here gets out, and they're not gonna fight. This is just how this map has been going. No team is going to take the risk that's unnecessary. Good will retreat here. He's got, he's got good shots. He's got good half of the temple, first half of the temple. And Magi actually ooh, was a little bit too dangerous, almost caught there. Good has been taking a lot of damage, but it is stage dive time. Here comes Hooligan into the wave, and Parslide gets canceled by that root. Yep. All right, Hooligan needs to get out now. He does. Expulsion zone perfect here. Down goes the Horrify, though. And currently, this is a really close fight. The first death, though, is going to be on Hooligan. There's the kill then onto UJ. And it looks like Mighty will win this fight. BDG doing a lot of damage behind, getting that second kill there. And uh, it needs to get out. Good's going to go down here. It's going to be four for two. That was a dirty fight. And BDG what? actually falls at the very end. Wow. I All think right. that was just last bits of last chunk of damage from cooldown. Well, with all those kills, Mighty will almost certainly get 21st with the ability to now soak three lanes. Um, they got the entire temple. This bot push is super, super aggressively moving towards that keep wall. I'm gonna get the soak here in mid and top with what they have left. Um, they won't be able to soak three lanes. I said I meant to say two, of course. The bot lane is pushing for itself. They'll get two waves uh, here extra. And. You know, it, they're not able to do too much just because they only have two members, but I still feel like this is a, a huge turning point moment in this game where it's only going to be slight, but Mighty will get that lead in EXP um, to push towards 20. And the really big spike for 20 is, of course, going to be uh, ETC. It's going to be able to bolt um, and potentially Storm Shield, but more, more likely it's going to be bolt, which can be the playmaker that wins you games. And go right into parse slide and take out Sans from that zone. Mighty really trying to bait here, not going with the boss. And Hooligan taking a significant a lot of damage and goes down. This may actually be a big, big mistake. Yeah, well, it's going to be a boss uh, at the very least. And they're going to get 20 very soon. So GG's make sure, making sure that they have the camp down before that goes on and the Haka soaking up some the XP at the top. They're trying their best at the moment while this boss is going towards Mighty. Look, I mean, ETC did absorb Sulfuric Smash and Horrify, 
but his death timer is about the same <laughs> as the uh, Sulfuric Smash. Horrify will be up soon. This is a strong uh, boss push now. That's the key here. That's going to get this wall down. We'll give them 20 for the keep push. They also have all four Siege Giants. GG may be at GG at this point with oh how strong my. this push is. And look at this. Let's see. Mighty just hit 20 and Joker does go, does go in, but... This boss has been just pushing so hard on that keep. Even Ragnaros on Molten Core form stands on that keep. Let's see. Let's see how long they can stall this time. And Wind Tunnel as well to try to push everybody <laughs> away. They want to core here really, really hard. Already a dead Falstad, though. The boss is actually getting quite low. Sand is actually going to lose uh, his uh, you know, trait here for just a moment. Good, trying to go on the chase here and get the pick onto Nasong. Uh, the most significant thing I feel about all of this is that they were so confident they were going to get the uh, core, but now Falstad has Wind Tunnel, which is going to be just basically it's almost so useless. Very inferior to Epic Mount. The top keep is up; two are down. And this is a horrible time to lose two because now it's going to be double temple for GG. And they're going to likely be the, the team to get a second keep first with how this is going. Uh, I don't think that was the time to core call and win tunnel, uh, especially. The death of Falstad early on in that fight was what caused them to lose it. And uh, this game is still winnable by either team, but GG gets a massive, massive advantage here, which is going to give them two objectives for the price of just two deaths. And looks like Mighty still had some buildings left, but it is on GG's side now. They have the momentum. They are getting both temples at the same time. They're rotating down now as they finished taking that middle temple. Mighty in trouble, I think. Yeah. I honestly think they were just, they just let that go because this is the fifth match they've been playing the game for almost three hours now. They must yeah. be tired. I'm, I'm sure they are. Uh, but as it stands, uh, I mean, this is a pretty di di disastrous situation. Like, the big keep will go down with another wave. They're going to try to force this fight now, though. They want this Siege Giant camp really badly. Wind Tunnel actually will be useful here in this case. That was effective. I was expecting an Expulsion Zone, and it even bolted the wave. Yeah, from the that. bolt, I don't know if it was 100% necessary, but I guess just for safe measure. Good is going to get picked here. And stage dive. A little too horrified. early, and Hooligan is solo get ancestral healed, but this is basically a 4v5 already. Sans just joins the team fight, but the entire team of GG just running away. Explosive Zone just to keep them out of the fight. But Joker is just way too strong, too heavy. UJ on very low, and he's gone. No, no way uh, that was a good like attempt to uh, stage dive. Like, I, I, the stage dive there, especially because he didn't have Bolt, as we just mentioned, mm -hmm. is just the wrong choice. If it's 4v5 on the defensive, you can stop a core push. You're fine. You're going to be okay. But if you lose any more than that, you lose the game. And this will be a win for Mighty. Just off of that decision to stage dive alone, the wind tunnel is going to be <laughs> useful here again. Um, but that's game. Mighty will win this series off of one choice to stage dive and re-engage that was incorrect by DG GG. Mighty wins it 3-2 in a very close series. The closest series we have had so far in this tournament. And that's the kind of day we expected at HTC Korea today with the lineups that we have. And as you can see from his face, they won, but he's not too happy, of course, that they were way too aggressive in the first leader core call. And then it was actually GG's fault that they went a little bit too aggressive when they saw that wind tunnel taken on that false step. And also, Hooligan was a little bit too rushed at the end. It was, it was, there was a lot of pressure for sure at the end. But it, at, but Mighty just taking the win. A better team wins at the end, of course. This will put Mighty at a 2-1 score. Uh, and 7-6 in maps, they will actually pass Tempest uh, temporarily and will be in third place um, for the matches today. Tempest won't be playing, so they won't have a chance to catch up until next week. But uh, Mighty played the better series uh, in the end there, but it was insanely close. And the entire five game series was decided by one decision to try to 4v5 with the, mo with the uh, stage dive there. And that decision alone lost them the game. They could have 
patiently waited. Um, they could have played like they were playing all game long, insanely yeah, carefully. And then both teams just decided to go all out, make some mistakes, but I guess they really wanted to finish that game. It was, Hooligan, it was pretty long, too. Hooligan was the weak link today, I feel. Like, him getting caught on ETC was why they almost won the game in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, deciding to mosh pit there, or I keep saying mosh pit, stage dive there was absolutely the incorrect choice. So... There you have it. Mighty takes it 3-1. And coming up next, we're going to have L5 against Raven. But still, we do have to... Well, that was a long series to be starting. But there we have, we still have... Other than... Other, I know other regions have two matches a day, but we are late on schedule. So we have three matches a day. So we still have two matches left. If, it's yeah. And if uh, the matches that we have coming up next last as long as this one. We might be here until 3 a.m. G Club. It's going to be a long Sunday night. It's going to be a lot of Heroes of Storm content. If it goes until 3, Europe is going to have to wait for us to finish. Oh, actually, that is correct. But I, I don't care. I want to see good games. I love long series, but this was one of the one of the longest series we've ever had. So make sure you stay tuned. We're going to be back with match number two very soon after the short commercial break. That's right, and it's L5. Tell your friends to get in here. Best team in the world. How well will they do against Raven? We're gonna find out after this short commercial break. See you then.
되었습니다. 악마 아즈모더는 최후의 승리를 눈앞에 두고 있었습니다. 그때 상대편 영웅들에게 뼈아픈 패배를 당하게 되죠. 하지만 아즈모더는 보기를 모르는 악마였고 결국 불꽃처럼 다시 일어납니다. 최악의 군주가 아닌 슬램 군주로! 여기 내 홈코트다. 나는 야 불꽃 악마. 왼손은 거들 뿐 농구 좋아하다 At BlizzCon 2015, we previewed a future gameplay mode we called The Arena. A quick, flexible team experience that brought a whole new style of play to Heroes of the Storm. Following BlizzCon, we took all the positive feedback we received about The Arena and set to work building a complete user experience around it. Welcome to Heroes Brawl. Heroes Brawl doubles down on the effort to create a play mode that is fast, easy to get into, and constantly evolving. Like Hearthstone's Tavern Brawl, in Heroes we will be offering unique play experiences with their own custom rule sets that will rotate on a weekly basis. There's no need to worry about what heroes you own, what rank you are, or what role you're best at playing. Everyone enters Heroes Brawl on equal footing, and you should be prepared for anything. Each week, we will offer up a new experience drawn from a diverse pool of options that will continue to expand as we step into the future. To start things off, brawls could potentially be played on single lane maps like Lost Cavern, arena maps like the two previewed last BlizzCon, 
or normal battlegrounds modified by mutators. Mutators are unique conditions that are placed on top of the traditional game experience that will change up the rules. We could limit hero options, add new difficulty, or mix an insane cocktail of both. As an example, one of our initial brawls, including mutators, is called Hammer Time. Games will take place on Towers of Doom, with hero selection limited to Sergeant Hammer only. To make it extra legit, we've turned Hammer's Z Thruster ability on at all times, except when sieged up. We can't kick off a new game mode without talking about rewards. Keep in mind that rewards will likely evolve over time, but to start off, each brawl will launch with its own unique portrait reward. Complete three games in a week to snag the portrait, along with some gold. Don't worry too much if you happen to miss a brawl one week and didn't snag the portrait. Odds are you'll see it rotate through again at some point in the future. If you already have a portrait for a particular brawl, you will still walk away with a nice chunk of gold and hopefully a few war stories to go with it. Heroes Brawl is all about trying new things in a fun, approachable game mode that you can share with your friends. For more info on questions you may have, don't forget to check out our in-depth blog over at heroesofthestorm.com. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the Nexus. Forget what you know. Heroes of the Storm defies MOBA conventions. We're not here to maintain the status quo. We're here to upend it. The game starts out familiar enough. You choose from a wide range of heroes. Warriors, supports, assassins, and specialists, all with their own unique talents and abilities. Several even push the boundaries of typical gameplay, such as Chogal, where two players control a single hero or Abathur, who manipulates the battlefield from afar, never engaging in direct combat. Once in game, things move fast. Within minutes, objectives will emerge that must be contested in order to create advantage for your team. Depending on the battleground, these points of interest can range from collecting gems that allow you to summon powerful web weavers to push your lanes, to holding beacons, which unleash massive waves of Zerg, or even collecting nukes you can deploy on enemy fortifications. These objectives continue to drive the action in heroes where team fighting and playmaking are the norm. Mounts and healing fountains will also help you stay in the fight longer and get back in the action sooner. There is no shortage of battlegrounds in heroes. Each brings with it a different set of objectives requiring diverse strategies, team compositions, and play styles. On a larger battleground with split priorities, like Towers of Doom, maybe you'll want to prioritize abilities with global reach. Need to take down an immortal to fight at your side? Get some beast single-target DPS. Want to prevent capture of the tributes on Cursed Hollow? Poke them down, then take them down. Each map will provide a unique experience. Ultimately, what sets heroes apart from the crowd is its talent system. Rather than a one-size-fits-all item shop, each hero has a custom talent tree built specifically around their abilities. Starting at level one, every few levels you will be presented with a set of talent choices that allow you to react to the battleground, your team comp, the opposing team comp, or your preferred playstyle. Levels are gained by killing minions, enemy heroes, or destroying enemy forts for experience. Each player contributes to a shared pool of team experience where individual performance leads to team-wide benefits. Team experience makes it easier to make rotations.
Welcome back to HGC Korea. We are in day three. Got two best of fives left for our opening weekend. Yep, that was the first series, all five games, full set. It was long, but it was worth it. I think it showed the level, really showed the level of play in the middle section of the teams where the Korean regions gonna be. Well, and Mighty ended up winning, but I think GG also has a very good potential of going up a level, especially when Mighty also defeated MVP Miracle. So the fighting, be the clash between the middle rank up when L5, Tempest, and MVP Black still looks very strong on top, those yeah. top three. I feel like if I could compare this to, in terms of StarCraft Pro League, mm -hmm. I feel like where, uh, where Mighty is right now is like CJ and Tis level, where it's like, this team's usually like fifth, sixth place in the league, but can occasionally have like a really good season and make like top tier playoffs and nearly make the finals or something like that. Like, I feel like that's the, where Mighty's at. Like, if you're a StarCraft fan and watch, you know, uh, you're up late watching Korean HTC, maybe you used to stay up and watch Pro League. It's like a, a comparison I'd like to make with where they're at right now. But we're moving into a completely different series here with L5 World Champions twice in a row, the first team to ever do so. I mean, they haven't dropped a map in this tournament. The only team who hasn't, uh, MV Black is 6-1. Well, their opponent, Raven, is going to come out soon. But continue talking about the L5. They look invincible, unbeatable. What are some other words that you can describe them? They're Impervious, just unstoppable. Completely insane. They we'll are. Have, yeah. They're just top, top tier. They are the best team in the world. I don't see any mistakes or some mistakes, but I don't see a big hole in their roster even. You can't really pick on one person that he is the worst one, but even he is like still got level good. The thing is also that this team um, did not change rosters. The only team in yeah. uh, Korea to not have any roster swaps. Very few teams worldwide uh, keep their rosters uh, between splits. There's usually a lot of shuffling going on. Uh, and to be honest, the teams that stay together the longest always do the best. That's why I predicted Misfits to do insanely well. They're at the top of HGC Europe right now and currently undefeated as well. They've only dropped three maps. They've played a lot more games than L5. But the opponents here for them in Raven, this is, you know, a team that may very well end up being one of our weaker teams. They did not look good in their previous series. But, uh, like, I, I think... Massively improved is H82 in the top lane, and Joju is the is a star player. We talked about it uh, when they played previously on Friday, and I feel like Joju's the guy to look out for in terms of what they can accomplish here. The yeah, Joju's cleanse were just so outstanding. Also, Deong staying in, staying in the front line as a warrior. He had some pretty good variants. Of course, they did lose, but still, I feel like Deong and also, NMX, he really tried hard with that leaming. He got some resets, but ended up losing the game against Tempest. It was pretty rough, pretty rough, but still, they had a good fight. They had a solid fight. Ended up losing it 0 and 3. And we'll see if they can take a map, be the first team to do so off of L5. I don't want to call this uh, series over before it starts, but don't want to smell to touch them, and they're going to do their best to be the first ones. Now in terms of maps, we're gonna have Cursed Hollow once more as our first map, and it's gonna be picked by Raven as L5 will choose first ban. And as you see, Braxis and Warhead Junction has been banned. We have not seen a single map played by, played with Warhead or Braxis yet. Yep. I don't think, especially the Korean players do not favor Warhead or Braxis too much. They think Braxis is way too snowbally, and Warhead is just way too big. There are so many different things you can do. So just banning out what you're not comfortable with sounds pretty good to me. Well, if you're looking for a big map, this is the next big thing. <laughs> Got uh, Warhead Junction banned. This is one of the bigger maps, and with L5 having first pick, um, they will be able to control Falstad should they prioritize that. We have seen L5 prioritize Falstad over Ragnaros in first pick rotation. Actually, Varian making it all the way to the top of the list here. So we're gonna, I think they they saw the match yesterday of De Young playing Varian. Varian if, even if they lost, he was pretty good with those taunts. So just banning out Varian, they're forcing, they're targeting De Young to be out of the comfort zone. What can, what else can you do right now? This 
feels like they want to do something different than Falstad because if you wanted to take Falstad, you would just ban Zarya here. It makes it look like they're scaring Raven right now, saying, well, you're either going to give us Tastar or Zarya. So Raven's actually considering this quite heavily now with this strange variant pick. So I'd say that the likelihood that we see an early Zarya here is quite high, and we've seen Noblesse uh, and this team when it was known as Ballistics cheese with Zarya. Uh, and use it very aggressively, especially at level one, to take an early lead. We saw it on Sky Temple as well, uh, quite a bit to get that early wall down. They're gonna ban Zeratul, so this means that if they take Zarya, Raven can take Tastar. So this is a nice reaction here. It's gonna be Vala that they're prioritizing. This feels like season three Super League. <laughs> it does indeed, and now Raven has actually, they actually have a lot more choices here as they just banned out Zero Two. They ended up just opening up everything. So giving the first choice to L5, doing whatever they want to. Let's see what they do and then choose what we do. They have, they have Tastar, Falstad. They have a lot of globals available here. So they can just take out Falstad so they're less shield on Bala. They can even take something else. Okay, Zarya, Ragnaros, still very strong. Feels like there are so there's there's so many things to ban and take away from each teams right now. They just have to actually see what they what the opponent is trying to do and then decide from that mo that moment point on. Falstad taken here first for L5. They're locking the range damage down very early. And they're gonna take Tastar, of course, with this easy peasy. Um, this is a there's a lot of good bans here actually for for Raven, so it makes it tough. Ariel is the glaring one. I was going to say they could absolutely ban ETC as well, but I'm going to take the Ariel ban. And uh, for L5 here, they may just simply ban a Tychus because then it really limits the damage pool for Raven. They could also ban a Li Ming. I think banning damage here is wise because of how many have already been removed now. We're going to ban Malfurion instead. And he is the top tier support, so there's not a shock that we see that ban. So they want to have a fight without the without the top top supports, and of course Raven having to think maybe they want to take Regar. But they actually do take Karazim. Karazim has been rising a little more in HCC Korea, especially with having that palm. We don't see as much seven sided strike. I don't think we have seen even once yet. That no, it was, not yet. It was all palm, but Karazim can get picks like we saw today. Amazing picks by Mary Day. Well, L5 here is just looking for a tank and a support. Um, the likely uh, choices here are going to be Muradin, Johanna, going to be the Muradin, and the Rhaegar one is the obvious pick here with what's left available. L5 has a really nice composition uh, with what they've chosen. And now for Raven, um, they're looking for their damage. I think Tychus is a pretty solid choice and alternatively they have Li Ming but you don't really want to build Li Ming into this composition where you have Zarya um, what's the point yeah I think L5 has way too much shield and protection to actually for Raven to take Li Ming from here I think they have to go around that choice it could be Gul'dan as well um, yeah, Taika seems all right here. Uh, they actually do go for leaving. It'll be super tough to blow, actually focus one and blow up. I completely agree with you. I think the leaving pick is is worse for the reasons we described when we were talking about the Gul'dan pick on Sky Temple in our first best of five, where you know it's about the damage over time versus the shielding that can be denied. Either way, I think L5's got the better comp. They have a really standard, straight up, two damage, tank, Tastar, support comp. We're gonna go into this first map to see who will take the lead here. Yet again, our first map is Cursed Hollow for L5 versus Raven. See you in game. In blue, L5, SC on Vala, Nitrogen on Falstad, Jungle on Taster, Noblesse on Muradin, and Swoy on Rhaegar.
And their opponent, Raven in red, Joju on Karazim, Hamlin on Zarya, NMX on Leeming, D Yong on ETC, H82 on Ragnaros. Interesting they put De Jong here on the ETC. Excited to see how this one plans out. Um, the early game Zarya shenanigans I talked about. Looks like they're going to send that to the bot lane this time. Zarya shields herself, gets energy from the turret aggro, then does a massive amount of damage. When paired with these heroes, it's tough to punish that. Nato Jin is actually going to use the flight to fly all the way down with Noble Let just to secure, but it is a little late, and Nato Jin actually gets pretty a lot of those skill shots. Noble Let's trying just trying to delay a little bit more on this bottom. And NMX actually, we saw NMX yesterday, and his skill shots were pretty on point. Look at how much damage Hamlet does with full energy. He's doing an insane amount of damage. That you can just get this full energy from the turret aggro, and you can maintain it for so long. If you're being aggressive like this, this is not enough. This is a huge win for Raven. They may get the healing fountain. Up here at the top, you can see what L5 is trying to accomplish with Tassadar. Uh, you know, he's got decent wave clear can push, but they'll never do as much as uh, Raven has just done in this bot lane. And they will get this healing bell fountain. Yeah, well, fountain, whichever one you call it. <laughs> Raven really on point. They've already scored one against L5. Looks they may actually put themselves in the danger zone as Regar and uh, Falstad just died on that. <laughs> and Swoy is also <laughs> in trouble now from that. Well, this is the scary scary thing about Kerosene. It's just so strong and Dion just flying over Loveless. He may actually Nope, he just walks away. These are some pretty big, uncharacteristic mistakes from, from L5, L5, yes. Uh, they are playing three best of fives in a row. Not in a row, but every single day from one day, day one, yeah. yes. Definitely can affect their, their mindset and uh, stamina and stuff like that, but SC will likely die here. I don't even... I. I we lost words. Like yeah, I mean, I think they are like we like before when they show the camera shots. Like Swoy was like yawning before they, he was going into the game. Maybe I, I think they're just not warmed up yet to the point. But this this does this, this does not like complete the game. But still, they're even even in EXP. But Raven did push a little bit more. And so far, compared to all six games they played before, this looks like their worst game so far. Absolutely, would completely agree with that sentiment. And you know, the top lane, they got a lot of extra EXP there because uh, Rag did go back. And Deong up here trying to push them away so they can grab this first tribute. They have Li Ming, but she's not in position to poke. So this is a bit awkward. That's probably one of the reasons why they went with Li Ming, to be honest, for her poke and tribute deny potential. Falstad does want to fly over, but the, he's getting the camp, so he's going to take a longer time. This is a 5v4 right now. Joju does get the tribute in that time. The, all they have to do is just back away. Trying to use uh, the poke they have from Vala, um, and of course the damage that, or sorry, the uh, delay that Jaw can do with Tassadar here in order to push this back. Um, but it's definitely a, a win for L5 because of the soak that Falstad got in the bot lane. Um, Nitrogen's been kind of just soaking it up. And he is doing auto attack Falstad, so every minion he gets as well will make him stronger. And you know what's really interesting, just to talk about this very briefly, we're in a meta now with basically no, like, besides Thrall uh, and occasionally Zeratul, it's not really a, a bruiser meta. So it's just interesting to me to see Jungle playing Tastar, but like, this is we saw something similar um, Yesterday, or not yesterday, Friday, I believe it was Kyocha playing Tastar again because the melee flex roll is not really a thing very often. Um, it's usually given to the Ragnaros in this case, and then the Tastar comps, you don't have room for that melee when you go double damage like this. So, just yeah. something I'm noticing in this new meta is we just don't really see melee assassins all too often. Yeah, that's true. Like, just a few months ago, Thrall was like the like the must pick from either side or even banned sometimes. And now that Ragnaros is in, I guess Rag kind of took that spot in the way because you can't... Having two melees in this meta right now, I don't think that's possible. And we basically saw one of the games in day one. I don't exactly recall which teams, but still. Yeah. Um, so it, it's just uncommon. So interesting to see like a melee assassin on Tastar. And John is like one of the highest skill 
uh, players in terms of mechanics in the world, but he's playing one of the simplest heroes just simply because of the nature of this meta. I just find that funny, but H82 is going to get caught here and uh, starts to feel like Season 3 with uh, the positioning there. Hamlin goes down as well. Poor positioning by Raven, and this five-man uh, death ball is just crashing through like a bowling ball, knocking over Raven like pins, and that was just... H82's positioning there was poor. Again, Rag has no escape. He should never be the one. If you're there with others, especially, Rag should not be the one in the front lines. Yes, he is pretty tanky, and he can do a lot of peeling in a fight, um, but he's not as tanky as ETC. He's not a Muradin, and he has no escapes. And now L5, they have been soaking up a little bit more, and taking those kills were a little bit not... I'd say it gave them a little bit of advantage catching, catching up and having that lead, and Raven really... Even though it is distributed actually is actually towards Raven, they're having a hard time. They're actually gonna decide to camp all this time. Deong is just trying to stall time, was delayed just by a tiny bit. They have to take another objective. They're actually going for the boss here. Yeah. And this is the six minute um, curse point boss that you take. We see a lot of Korean teams do this timing when they're ahead. It's consistently around six minutes. Every black started this. I mean was the first team to consistently do this, and we see this a lot. Uh, when you have a small lead like this, the split push to get three EXP lanes worth of soak is all Raven really can do. It feels weak, it feels terrible, but there's not much choice you have. Now they can rotate up and deal with the boss. They're hoping to, that it's going to be a lucky tribute spawn at top for them. But if they're unlucky, it's going to be a curse against them no matter what. There's just nothing they can do. A 5 will double boss to ensure they get the tribute no matter where it is. And it's a perfect lucky spawn. Again. Oh boy. You know what, I think actually that both tribute if I'm not mistaken, both tributes were top before, so it was going to be bought anyways no matter what, so L5 could actually have made this a calculated decision. Raven does have heroics now, and they are going to try to contest this. I like this. L5 is going to give the boss away, though. Uh, Karazim is going to take a long time to come back, and Rag, Rag is already in Molten Court to do some poking. It looks like they're doing too much damage, and now it is their time to fight, and a mosh pit chosen from... Young again instead of instead of stage type where they do not have a global. Let's see how big a mosh can can be De Young do this time. Well, this is a lot of damage De Young just took. You know, the elephant in the room is the grave golem in the room here. Hold that thought. You can see seven side strike this time used, I suppose, as an escape mechanism. Um, and it is powerful with ETC Hyde popularized this style back in the summer season of OGN, but I I think this is a huge win for L5, despite the fact they didn't get the bosses, but I was going, the elephant in the room is the grave golem in the room at the top that almost killed the keep wall entirely because Raven had to come down here and deal with this. Now Raven puts themselves on even footing in terms of the tributes, but the damage done by that boss, it was just, I mean, it'll never be repaired. And Nobilis may find himself in a danger zone, but he just, oh, he soaks up a lot of damage. That's a lot of damage, though. Luckily, he's murdered, so he'll be fine. Yep, he's fine. He didn't even have to, he just walked away. I thought EDC was with them, so I was calling out that he may be a little bit dangerous, but luckily. All right, they're gonna try to put some lane pressure with this Merc Camp to potentially force the boss again. They've got a really small window before the next Tribute spawn, though I don't think they will be able to boss now. They save this last Cannon Tower here and just rotate in the Tribute spawn. is again, good for them over here on the left side. Find it kind of funny, NMX Joju on Ballistics, and they're versing L5, and here comes Dion from the side. Let's see what kind of play you can make with that Mosh Pit. There are not too many too many CCs from L5, but still Vala has that rain of vengeance. So. Yeah. All right, Noblus just trying to heal up here. Dion is stopping his passive from proccing right now. Noblus could actually try to come through here from the backside, but he comes in alone. Seven side strike goes down, but an immediate ancestral. H82 is channeling, but Nacho Gen will stop this beautiful expulsion zone, but it's only for so long. The dodge there on Li Ming's orb as well is huge. This is the perfect timing for Diong to go into Mosh. Gust was used already, Ancestral already gone. If you can catch SCSC, and SCSC blows up, and Mosh only catching Rhaegar still does a significant amount of ch change in team fight. L5 losing that fight was one of the... I don't think they've had a game Maybe about as close, but not as this bad so far. Yeah, I definitely would agree to that. And uh, Raven is playing well. There's some things that L5 has done that you could criticize, especially in the early game. 
but in general, uh, this is on Raven's merits, not on L5's mistakes. Hamlin will get caught here. These are the mistakes we've been seeing all game long with the positioning problems on Raven. We saw already um, the catch on Rag when he was overextended. We're going to see this on Hamlin as well. There's no way out. He will die. Absolutely. No question. Forest Wall here to try to get something else. And you know what? With the no fort here, they almost do. Is but it, it feels like it's L5's curse, but it's not. Yeah, it actually <laughs> is. Is it me or just no less on Murden? I think it, I think he's actually making that more than actually a lot tougher than it actually looks like. Look, I mean, what did Raven accomplish? They got to keep wall, and they lost three lanes of EXP. They did not get any EXP. Now all their lanes are pushed, so they can't get any more. So that right now, what they don't have anything to do but to contest the boss. They're not contesting the boss. Azaria respawned too late, so L5 gets a free boss. L5 did lose some EXP in the middle lane and also keep on losing on the top lane, but still they got the boss, which is a lot more important at the moment. And as the time goes on, it'll also become, as they have same same level and about to hit six, 16 later on about the same talent. If they have the boss, they have a lot more time to go around the map and macro as, as uh, this is a bad idea. Oh boy. Getting caught some center track by He's gonna die. That only goes. Um, L5 is still gonna boss here, which is a bit outrageous. Thing is, they can always disengage, which they will. I thought they were gonna try to soak because the lanes are so much on their side right now, especially on the top to get EXP. They can leave this boss, but it forced the rotation up, so the bottom boss did a little bit more damage uh, to the fort, pushed that lane a little bit harder. And Raven is, because they rotated up already, we're here already, might as well go ahead and boss. If Falstead did not die and just flew over to the top to get the boss, I think Raven would be just way, way like out macro right now. But hold that thought, let's take a look at this team fight. Noblesse and Dion getting caught a little bit, getting too much damage in the front line. Joju get, catching Noblesse just to save him. This was a 4v5 on even talent tiers and even levels, essentially, uh, nearly there for a second. They just got 15. Um, and then Falset flew in, and now they're just going to take the boss. Wow. And Noblesse just Noble making sure that no one comes around the side, just getting having that vision. I mean, I, I just have to have my mouth wide open as to how this could happen. De Jong is now isolated. He's going to die. He tries to mosh, too. That's 120 seconds of cooldown wasted, by the way. The Molten Core here doing a lot for Raven, but they should still lose this team fight. As three now are dead, Nobles is on the boss. NMX gets a kill and a reset, but it won't matter. The boss is taken, and they only have two members to defend it. They already use Molten Core, and L5 is not done yet. They want the kill here on H82. Gust is now available. They actually might get both kills. In fact, I think they will get both kills. Tastar escapes there, and NMX needs to leave. It's just going to be the kill on H82, and the boss will push the keep wall. And for a second, I thought NMX has a chance to turn this around, but of course, having Noblesse, the Muradin, just engaging heavily onto that back line. It was pretty tough. And this will be another curse. This will be the first curse for L5. I, the, the curse before actually looked like L5 curse, so I'm saying it's, it's, it's the second one, but. They pushed all the lanes away from Raven. They got the bottom keep wall, and then they lost a few members, and that was it. Um, they will get 16 here with uh, all these minions now going to their side of the map with the L5 curse. Um, Ballstat is just going to soak the, all the minions. Soaking is super important during a curse. You need to make sure you do that. It's not just about killing structures. You need to make sure you get, still get the EXP. So he clears the wave so that the, his minions are going to stack up onto that bot fort so it's almost certain they go down. He didn't miss any EXP. Now he can come back in here as Joju is being very aggressive. Noble S now in the front. It's super important. Um, to note here that Karazim has his level 16 talent now, so he's a lot more powerful. He does have that seven side strike. If they can get a pick here, like if someone gets stuck because De Jong gets a nice power slide, it could be great, but this is looking so good for L5 at this moment in time. De Jong is dodged. This is so hard because H H82 is out of the fight. He does not have Molten Core because he just used it before he went down. So L5 knows that trying to just be super aggressive here, and then now they. Look at that, the Mosh cooldown just went back, just just came back, and then they started going back. I think they literally know like the exact time 
of the cooldown. Like, maybe they counted 120 seconds. Well, they saw him use the Mosh, and when he died, that's exactly two minutes. They can look at the game timer and say, look, there he has it now. So that's something people call out. Now, this is a good Mosh here, but the engage, the disengage, I should say, with Nitrogen with the Gust, very nicely done. Nobles is caught here in the seven side strike, and they will not be able to turn this fight around. H82 is on the chase. Doesn't want to overextend here, but they just want this kill on the Nobles. He's trying to get his trait to proc so he can get all that health back. Looks like it just barely will here just now. See how harder it is to get a kill in onto Nobles because he was shielded twice. He could have actually, NMX could have actually got a kill if there was no shield, but we were saying this from the beginning. And just one kill, that was enough, but long chase, which actually cost Raven a little more compared to L5. This was so unnecessary. No one is dealing with the Giants and the bot, which have killed the keep wall now. and will start to threaten the bot keep. The top keep is nearly dead. The middle one is damaged. Chasing trying to get no bus at first, I understand. Then they just kept following him. I just watched Joju Radiant dash in and then leave while I'm watching a Merc camp on the minimap killing the wall. The macro play here from Raven is lacking uh, good judgment skills here in terms of what they should have been doing there. Should have been clearing that faster, moving back. L5 lost someone, but well, they got a big win. Half the respawn time of Nitrogen was burned by that chase. Oh, look at that skill shot trade, both stunned at the moment. And Nobles, of course, being being a human ward in those kind of bushes, it's it's super important. And this, no. actually, the skill shots. I don't think Nobles maybe missed one stone bolt in this game. I loved his stone bolt on Dion on that chase, and then they still tried to follow. <laughs> um, <laughs> The top four goes down, Nitrogen goes and makes quick work of that. He has all the room in the world to do so with this uh, aggressive invade from Raven. And now they are going to uh, control this uh, tribute spawn location. Oh, then they're going for boss and L5 smells it. Falstead is the only one. He can literally get the tribute and fly over and contest for the let's see what happens. And they are actually not going to, looks like they're going to back off. They wanted to get a pick on Nobles when he goes for the boss check with seven-sided strike. Like, if this were a hide, maybe they'd get it. Like, I don't think it's possible with that shield, though. Yeah, he has a shield. He has a uh, call as embrace because this is not reworked Tassadar. I feel like in the old times and without the Tassadar shield, you know, hide maybe could have made that work um, with Hong Kono. But in this case, Nobles is just like, and your point is... Um, all during as well, Nitrogen pushed top, got more stacks, got a Merc camp by himself, and he's just going to come over here casually uh, to fly in and make sure they can secure the boss because he has Gust, and they have 20 now, and what is what is Raven to do? They're, they cleared mid, and they're a whole level of EXP <laughs> behind, and what do you think Arrow 5 is about to do? They're just going to go take Raven's boss too. Okay, Raven finally decides to get this boss, and L5, instead of contesting it, because they feel like they didn't have visions, so they didn't know when this was started, they maybe could have contested it, but because they don't know... They want to go for camp and yeah. push all the way in, try to get exactly. that keep, because they have 20. Maybe they're all going all the way in to get this game, actually, not just the keep. And we see this kind of, mis not mispick, but still, Moshes are not super well used today, and it's really hard to this meta. It is super hard for a good Mosh to come out and turn around the team fight. We've seen twice already this game. H82 used this Molten Core super early, tried to slow this down, but uh, the keep is now uh, completely exposed, and there's a decent amount of poke here with Bala uh, to knock this keep down as well. They've got a lot of Siege. Dion is looking for the Mosh, knows the positioning of L5, already all split, no one's standing on top of each other. And they are going to push for the core. No 20 here for Raven. And with Gust, there's just so much potential to kill this core right now. The boss does go down, so this is a bit risky. The Reign of Vengeance is good, though. Down goes Dion. there's no Palm here. They're going to use Storm Shield, they have 20. And, uh, wow, I... Game is not production over is yet, like, but production still, is like, it's over, I man. think there's way too excited L5 to use Gust, is used. But ETC is down, but there's no boss, so they have to tank this one if, if they want to go all in. Let's see if they can make it happen. Raven still at the end, trying their best to defend, but Noble S is just way too strong in the front line. Keeps getting shielded, and Astro Jin, SCSC, putting all that damage as they can. Core going down slowly by little bit by little. Black Maros is just gone. 
All right, here's the fly-in from Nacho Jin. There's the last kill. They do get actually two picks here. NMX trying to turn this one around. Oh, the Hungering Arrow did not enough damage to kill him, but there's so much damage on this core now. I think it's time, G Clef, for the GG music to happen for real. Yes, now the music should come in. There we go. And L5, as expected, taking game one, but they actually had a tough beginning of the game. Yeah. And Raven, Raven had, Raven actually had the beginning of the game in their favor. But in a long term, how they were trying to draw this picture, L5 just they picked the right colors and they had, they picked the right brush, and then they just started it a little bit later because they were napping before. But still, Raven, they really showed their potentials and what they can do. Maybe in the second map, if they choose to do so, they can have better chances of winning this time. Um, either Dion was doing a new type of interpretive dance there, or he was really frustrated <laughs> and explaining to H82 how he felt about how that game went. Um, a lot to be said about the mechanical skill of L5. There were a few really weak moments and weak decisions. Um, Zarya should not have been able to have accomplished as much as she did in the bot lane. And um, I, I completely agree with you especially after watching Nitrogen's face after that game, I think they just needed some time to warm up, and they finally did. Their decisions on bosses were on point. They won several fights 4v5 while Falstad was soaking. They won several fights 4v5 while one of their members was dead and picked. Um, and I feel like the advantages that Raven had were not used correctly. Like the curse, for example... Mm -hmm. They chased and pushed and tried to get kills. Lost members didn't get any soak. Um, that chase in the bot lane while the Siege Science were killing their bot keep wall, which is where the game actually ended at the end of all things. They just let that go. They tried to get a kill on Noblesse, which is never going to happen. It just felt a l like it just felt like you could see um, L5 basically playing a game that was harder than normal. Like they were like playing with like extra gravity, like Dragon Ball Z. And they just like prove themselves even in those circumstances. So, uh, it was like they gave themselves a handicap, and then they were like, "Oh, we could still win no matter what." <laughs> yeah, I'm not trying to be too negative about taking Mosh. Like I take Mosh personally, and I love making a big comeback into just one team fight, annihilating entire the entire opponent. It is important. It is a super cool heroic to play. But I'm just I just want to point out that in this meta which there are just so many CCs and also Globals. And having Falstead on the other team, and the other team happens to be L5. I th honestly think Stage Dive is a better choice, especially when you are actually winning the beginning game. Yeah. If you are losing it, maybe the Mosh is the way because you want to bet a little, you want to gamble in that moment. But as having a Stage Dive, you can have that macro play and at least try to have the same macro as L5. I think it did it not, it not, Mosh did not work perfectly, but still. So, I, I agree with you entirely there. The big egregious one was the Mosh that Dion did at, when he was like dead. Uh, I looked at that like, well, yeah, that's, that a two minute, that's a two minute cooldown. And as you pointed out, L5 was very aware of the timer there and punished a lot uh, during that moment. We're going into Sky Temple now as our second map. And. This is the map choice of L5 as Raven decided to take first pick, um, which is how it's pretty much always going to go. You could just assume, generally speaking, that the team that lost will take first pick and the um, the winning team will always get the map choice. So L5 wants to win a snowball -y quick game here on Sky Temple, most likely. And uh, they did not prioritize the false stat highly, but they got him anyways. It was significantly uh, useful for them. It definitely got them a lot of extra soak on Sky. Oh, excuse me, on uh, Cursed Hollow. So I imagine we'll have a similar situation here going into Sky Temple. But we also saw some of the some of the strength that NMX has on that leaving. Even though even though the shields make it so hard for NMX to actually get the kills and reset, he was the only one that felt like he knew what he was doing the entire time trying to get picks so he can get resets. Of course, his team helped him a lot. And this is this was probably the same when when we saw NMX play against Tempest trying to get some skill 
skill shots. His skill shots were landing on the right page. I feel like L5 just out macro them at the end, just making smarter choices, having false that and global hero is so important in this meta. I just want to highlight that over and over on and until the end of today, especially until we hit the new patch, this meta is gonna stay. Absolutely. Zeratul, first pick. And that ban on Zeratul we saw on the previous map now so just feels a bit more I think it made sense. If they play uh, as good of a Zeratul as Good did earlier, if H82 can make that happen, then the pick will be warranted. This allows L5 many options. They could get on the Rag Mouth uh, path, but False Set is something they've been favoring a lot higher. They did not first pick it uh, on the previous set, but they will have the potential to pick it up here on Sky Temple, where it's arguably a little bit more valuable even than it is on Cursed. So the idea here is, do we want Rag, Falstad, Malf, which one of these? Um, with Tastar and Zarya banned, you don't want Vala, and it is going to be Malf and Falstad. So that's the choice. Very, very obvious choice coming out from Malf 5, and Malfurion is just way too popular. Maybe nerf him coming? Oh, uh, maybe, maybe in the next few patches, that I, th I think that may be possible. And Uther also got 10 armor in the next patch. Maybe we'll see more of Uther, possibly. To be honest, with Uther's armor, um, I don't think it's going to change too much. I personally think Valf is like in a perfect place in terms of his numbers and his balance. And I think sustain, cleanse. I think it's it's more of the. As it, 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 if Valve is to go down, other supports might be buffed slightly, like Uther, for example. Or we could just wait until Lucio comes out, because I, that is going to change the entire scale uh, of how this game is played, as Lucio will absolutely be top tier. I think Lucio can actually change the meta yes. if he, if he come, when he comes out. But here's their variant and Ragnaros pick from Raven this time. And Diong actually gets his hands on variant this time. Let's see how. L5 basically opened that to them. So let's see. So with Varian and Rag coming in here, we talked about the combo with this earlier. Mighty was favoring this even in their first rotations multiple times in the last best of five. With Zeratul on top of it, it almost feels like it's a bit much, but we'll see how this works out. If they wanted to pick up Varian later, I think it would have been fine. Uh, this is really telegraphing what their plan is here is these very fast blow up style here with the Zerg smash after the taunt, Zeratul comes in. He's got the Void Prism. Um, in terms of bans, I think that a ban on Rhaegar Karzim is not... It, it, it's possible, but it's like... Okay, they're going to ban the Karzim. I was going to say, it feels targeted on Joju if you do that. You can play the opposite um, if you do that, which it's not worth talking about anymore because they did it. Um, but they could have decided to ban range damage as well, as what I was trying to get to. But they banned the Karzim away, which would probably force the Rhaegar. And Raven, they're into this tough choice because Noblesse actually has a wide pool of range of tanks what he can play because he played, he is the more than himself and he can also play ETC, Johanna, basically all the tanks as a team comp is needed. Yeah. And so instead of going for a tank ban, I, I think if, if, if they really want to go out, they can either get like Tychus and Diablo was not super expected. No, actually, I think the Diablo ban is really weird. I think that was a bad, bad ban. <laughs> you're, you're being too honest. Not, Nacho Jen is not, not impressed. Uh, you can see on the camera. He will be playing the foul stat in this game. Um, and leaving reason, also taking away from NMX. That's a smart choice. The reason why everything you said is so true is very similar to the Karzim thing. It's like, well, now Choju can play Rhaegar. He's a really good Rhaegar, so it feels like a weaker ban. Um, the reason why banning ETC would be very strong anyways, because even though uh, Burden is one of Noblesse's best heroes, now he has an extra global on this huge map. Um, and we're going to see Vala Ario coming. That was a, that was like a little bit sneaky, because you're not really thinking about that at the end yeah, of this the draft. Yeah, the last going to see a Tyrael pick here. Um, I think any other ban would have been better than the Diablo ban, because this Diablo, this is not a Diablo map. They don't have any combos with it right now. I thought that was a bit... The only Weird. combo they have is with Malfurion's root. That's like the only thing you can really think of. And I did not expect too much of a Tyrael 
coming out from L5, but we'll see how good they can bring it out. And we're going into the second game of today's match, L5 versus Raven. Let's see if L5 can keep the, on their winning streak or Raven will be the one to stop. Let's go into game number two. In blue, world champions L5, SC on Li Ming, Nachojin on Falstad, Jung on Ontario, Noblesse on ETC, and Swoy on Mount Furion. And their opponent in red, Raven, Joju on Ario, Hamlin on Zeratul, NMX on Bala, and Dion on Verbarian, and H82 on Ragnaros. Dion. Dion, that's a popping sound when like your eyes pop out in the cartoon in Korean sound. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, now everyone else knows. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was only a Korean thing. So just to make sure if everyone, not every, in case of not everyone knowing that sound. Look, I mean, uh, Dion could be like a car that drives by really fast. Dion, you know, <laughs> or like uh, I don't know, rubber band flying across the room. Dion, and. Already Noblesse is on to that watchtower and then noticed Hamlin is standing right in front. And Dion comes in and Noblesse's power slides out. Hamlin's Hamlin. actually gonna go all in on this. Yeah, the commitment here to the four pull is really... Even Nacho Jin flies over to punish Dion for this. They're gonna get this kill for sure and they do for first kill. They will get that first kill. Definitely a uh, interesting commitment there. The blink. Uh, he did have that off cooldown, so he was able to get away Hamlin, that is, but they get the kill on the Varian. Um, I think that was like, Nitrogen's coming up like, oh, okay, well, I guess we'll kill Hamlin. And he's like, oh, he got away, but let's just get Varian then, <laughs> since we're already here. I think L5 was like, we don't ever make inefficient rotations. If we go across the map, we're going to get something. Otherwise, that would be that would be wrong. Wolf would get mad. He'd complain about it in the cast. <laughs> Gotta at least kill one of the members. So, they get that one. Noblesse just knocks Dion away, and then the boss also knocks him away. He's not having a good time. Double temples here for Raven temporarily. That's actually quite nice for them. They get a little bit of extra structural damage here. But they, the, what they lose is the EXP that Nitrogen was able to get bought. Look at the rotation down for Hamlin. He missed the whole wave! He didn't get a single kill on that minion wave. He missed the whole wave. And Nitrogen's going to stay there now because he sees him. Well, that's what you get having not having any global heroes in your team, which makes it super tough. And even Ragnaros goes into Molten Core just to save some save some health on that fort. Wow, this Raven going all out from from the beginning of the game. Unfortunately, it doesn't stop the last five shots. From yeah, but still, winning. but still, wise wise choice. I mean, it's, it's better to not. Down, yeah, better to not use it and just waste it. And Raven just on. Raven is on the on fire from the beginning of the Hamlin. He's gonna catch SC. SC is stunned, and there goes SC. SC had to be a little bit more be careful having Zeratu on the other side. Nice catch there. And I think H82 on on Ragnaros. We see a lot of Ragnaros make like going over the half line in the lane, and then just dying. Especially having an ETC on the other side. Very He'll risky. have to be careful. He'll have to really, be really like know when, where ETC is at least, or Malfurion. We see Noblesse and Swoy just going, going, rotating up and down together. Having that, having that CC chain is just so strong. Just able to catch one. There is basically an imaginary line that you can draw down the center of the map for all the lanes. Do not cross here. And like, you can call it a lot of different things. I like to call it like the the midpoint or the the you know center of the lane. If you ever go onto the other side, in this case, the blue side is a rag, you will be punished often time. So you be really careful about that. NMX eating so much damage there from SC is healed immediately. That's all Joju's hope, though. Already gone. This is risky here against an ETC to poke like this. They are going to win the Siege Giant fight, which will put some structural damage onto this uh, this wall. But only a little bit. Hamlin 
forced away here. There's no ammo for this cannon turret. Uh oh, Jung Ah. The entire MH82 is camping, but Jung Ah can't he? No, he cannot. And that was a good punish by Hamlin and Joju coming in. NMX coming in from the side end. Also, no one was getting EXP from the top. The lane is just stalled. The young very close to death, but he managed to survive. Not just him flies over a little bit too far. Not entirely sure. And Hamlin is not dead. It's Vala that first, and then Hamlin also goes down at the end. Entirely sure um, <laughs> how uh, that happened, but crazy. Hamlin was like, <laughs> he was very confident that there was going to be enough hope to keep him alive there. That's like, that's a sign of a good Zerato player, someone who knows just how much healing output his support has so that he could stay in. I thought he was on a suicide mission, but um, he did die, yes, of course, at the end, but I mean, what he was able to accomplish there seemed suicidal, but then actually it did a lot of damage that seemed uh, smart at the end. Yeah, they're losing the bottom tempo, but they are pushing the top lane with that can that Ragnar got a minute ago. So they're not they're not picking up too much EXP, but still they're pushing the top port and even using Molten Core again to keep that HP alive and also doing some poking damage and looks like they're gonna have a team fight here. Joju on that front has to be really dangerous, even though Aria does have the Tamus Strike and it looks like oh, Varian will be the first one to blow up. H82 turns around here too. Hamlin survives for now. It looks like he would just barely get out, but H82 is so lucky he wasn't killed. I think if L5 had just turned on him there, they would have gotten it for sure. Either way, they win control of this temple. The top push you talked about is super important, um, and Nachitim will go and clean that. It didn't do a crazy amount of damage. It got the wall, and it wasted a lot of the ammo on this fort, but it is cleared now. Ten is going to go to L5 first. Jung Ah needs to be careful not to get caught again. It's only a slight EXP lead right now for L5. Okay, never mind. It's uh, they got ten because uh, Lee Ming <laughs> got the, port, got the yes. fort. Yep, they got the fort, and also Hamlin. It's Hamlin has been a little bit overextending. It is all Joju that is healing. Oh, just, just, just constant healing him so he does not fall down. He was so close to going down like five times already. And he's Joju's super. like, please do not go too deep. Like, he's almost saying that. Like, I'm saving you because you're my teammate, but still. Super aggressive. <laughs> super, super aggressive. Hyper aggressive, I would even say. So, we're going to see uh, this very aggressive move by Raven around the boss pit. Um, looking for a pick, assuming that L5 was going to be camping. They were not just yet. Meanwhile, L5 gets the top camp, and Nitrogen is going to push that lane. He can come down anytime. This is the, the power of globals and why, um, you know, when you don't first pick uh, Falstad, you end up in, in awkward situations like this where Falstad's on the other side, and he's just doing so much. It's like... You even have Zeratul on your team, and looks like this time he might get the pick. It does Vorpal. There's no tower here. Nitrogen gusts to get away. They need to be doing more of this. Like, Hamlin needs to be punishing these greedy Falstead moves more often. Yeah, that is true. And even Aegis used, and Sank Pop just to catch Deong, and Deong just walks out from that, and even taking some damage in Jonga. That was a little too much coming out from L5 actually. Raven did a very good job and especially Vala take just ceasing, trying to stall them some time. Dion got taken a lot of damages, but Vala was the one that actually saved it because without Vala, not enough puff, that means not enough heal, so. Okay, Temple's active. Hamlin is... This is actually really good for Raven, I think, because Ragnaros is already on top. Falstead, of course, can fly over, but that would be that Falstead would be using the flight to go up there. Yeah. Do you, you ever realize that Raven is kind of just like the new version of Rave, and it's like Rave, then N? I just, yeah. I just had this thought. Pretty, <laughs> sure, pretty sure that was the idea all along, but somehow it only occurred to me now. August uh, was oh, used and Hamlin. Boy, boy Prison to save himself, but also trap three of them. Let's see if that continues. Swoy does get caught, but Twilight Dream turns this around. That was actually a really good um, coordination by Raven, because like you said, that was actually not intentionally used to uh, to kind of turn the fight. It was really an escape mechanism there for Hamlin. They actually coordinatedly like, collapsed there. Unfortunately, they collapsed so hard that Twilight Dream basically hit everybody, and that meant dead Vala, as Nautrogen's on the chase here, and Greg does finish H82 in the top lane that. Nautrogen's on the chase, Aegis, Noble S is here, it's and Dion! going to be enough, but Rag did get all the top 
all of the stuff from the top temple and they just hit 13 now so they have the chance to fight but they have already lost the member looks like the young's variant is not too effective against l5 tonight well uh we're gonna see material just take the last five shots here as they left that open there so yes rag got top but l5 got this first and so uh you know, they just had the second one. Um, this, yeah, this last shot was there, but like, basically the rag getting that was nice and all, but they also had their own full template bot and got pushed and got a kill. So that's why they're up about half a level lead right now in EXP. There's no objectives really on the map other than boss at this moment in time and this bruiser camp. So Raven's gonna take the bruiser camp and it looks like L5 is gonna consider the boss move. Varian does uh, move to this mid lane hidden actually. So L5 might be thinking, you know, might have been thinking, oh, maybe they're bossing, but uh, when they see the ping to the top right that the camp is taken, they know it's not, so they just get a mid um, wave. And they're roaming as four while Nachogen is camping and also getting EXP alone. And here comes H82 as I talked about. Ragnarok staying on top alone is always the danger. And L5 just goes ahead and punish them for it. And while this time, the Having three of them on the camp was actually the same time as just Nacho Jin just soloing the camp there. Yep. The roaming is four. Raven should realize this, and H82 should not be in lane like that. Uh, which is, honestly, we talked about this a lot with Rags, we talked about it with Sans, and uh, also Modern Life. Noblesse waiting behind them. This may be actually super dangerous as Noblesse actually has Mosh. This may actually be one of the effective Mosh if it comes in at the right choice. Gus was just saying, even Pop. Uh, Mosh. They're going into the other direction that's not towards your home, but let's see. Joju is just caught. There's no way of getting out. Just stalling some more time with that Aegis. It's gonna go down. Mosh didn't land there really, but they still got the kill. Good move there. But he's going back to the point on the on the rags. Like we see H82 in the past, his biggest weakness um, in season three, where he made a big name for himself. It was the first time he played in a pro league. Um, was getting caught in the top lane on Thrall, on Illidan. He was caught really, really often, and this can't keep happening. Or like an improvement must be made. Like a tweak needs to be made. The team needs to realize and say, like, look, man. We didn't make a call, they're roaming us for you cannot be in lane like that. Or this is just gonna continue to happen. If he escapes, then uh, L5 looks silly for trying to gank him because they wasted a lot of time with their four-man roam. So I'm going a long winded on that, but it's a, a big issue that H82 has been facing. Deong will get picked here. And that was about time before H82 fell. It was about even on level 14 to 14. And compared to all the other teams that faced L5 so far, Raven looked the best compared like when they're when they were facing against L5 and maybe they're having the worst game today. I mean talking about L5, but still Raven was pretty doing pretty well in key fights, getting some pickoff. But after that they are starting to lose it. They really are waning a little bit here, it feels. They have no VAP uh, presence because they lost uh Varian, so now L5 is going to get both temples. And a Merc Camp, only one level ahead, but that's all it takes when one man is down. And Raven, look at the movement on the map. They post around boss. Uh, Hammond got the clear on the bot lane, so that's actually gonna possibly get oh, them this a port. Is way but. too deep. You can't go in too deep alone like that. Hamlin may survive this, but... Nope. Oh, <laughs> uh, A just used there as well. It's not the longest cooldown, but... It wasn't going to be to save him there. NMX is going to be the next to die. It just feels sloppy what we're watching here. Why were they all poised around the boss? Hamlin got the push bot to get the fort. As you can see, it just went down. But Jojo's going to die here. Um, why were they po posturing on the boss? They didn't have vision. L5 wasn't here. They didn't have uh, Varian. And then L5 rotated down because they were like, are they going to do like a three-man boss? What's happening? Hamlin tries to get the pick, gets the boy prison off, but they lose the fight because he's alone. I and think they were confused in a way because they were not seeing them at the top temple at all. And they were maybe they were confident that L5 is doing a secret boss or they were going to come for a boss. But when you're planning against something like that, you have to be together. You can't be all around the map. I think they just started to lose it a little bit, especially after Dion 
is getting cut off and being the only first frontliner warrior that makes it super hard and Hamlin is trying very hard to get a pickoff but it's just not happening so far but but it, it is worth the try but against an L5 against Nacho Jin's false that he's having a hard time I mean his uh, attempt earlier on Nacho Jin was what caused him to lose this team fight that they didn't need to because he was so aggressive with no vision whatsoever as to where L5 was and as it turns out they were all rotating towards where Raven had already shown themselves on the map especially Hamlin uh, and nearly uh, Hamlin finds another one tr uh, train ticket back to the uh, Hall of Storms here with his attempt to kill Tyrael this time he is just being too aggressive here and Falstad did use flight to go all the way up but instantly he saw the, the potential or Maybe a team fight would have happened, so like he came down right away. There was no ping involved. I look at that level of communication and teamwork. It's like they work at one person. So that's what happens if you keep the same roster for a long time. You take the champions, and let's see what happens here. Jong Ha does. Well, Hamlin gets away here. It feels like L5 is chasing him down with how aggressive he's positioned himself. He always tries to go for something big, gets caught. Ping's over here saying I'm, I'm on the chase room. They eventually let him go here, but every time he makes an aggressive play, L5 turns it against him. That was cute. It was like so risky too. That was very like, flashy, but not really effective at all. Had and they, they predicted did. that, like he would have been dead for sure. And Noblesse getting caught by the perfect saying to protect and a Mosh to just continue on that CC. Noblesse power slides in. Great silence to get all of them into silence Hamlin in danger there there goes their tool and SCSC gets the reset Nacho Jin also gust over everyone they're gonna get a team wipe for sure here Soy because they got 20 had bolt so got away there after his ice block so they're actually leaving HA to do they don't even care they're just, they're just gonna push all the way in well he does have his molten core I believe so I don't I don't think so I think it's either on cooldown or he just used it. I think you're right because he's definitely not using it right now and if he had it this would be nice I think he was trying to but Noblesse actually stuns him there now the keep is down and this is going to be game over as ATA2 does what he can but he can't do much that is going to be at level 20 to 18 here with storm talents available L5 will take a two game lead in this series now on match point as we go into our third map. The first game definitely started off well for Raven, uh, but it seems like L5 has really gotten into their rhythm now and uh, they're just simply playing better. Void Prison here to, to uh, you know, slow this down, but it doesn't matter. L5 takes the win. They've gotten into the rhythm. They, they've warmed up and they are just smashing it right now. Hamlin did not make the Zeratul first pick feel first pick worthy. That is true, but he really tried hard, and Nacho Jin using, like, whatever he feels the danger, he just rolls out or just use that gust to make sure he's in the safe zone, or just flies over to his teammate so his teammate can actually save him just like that, and Nacho Jin really, we saw a lot of other false stats in day one and day two and they actually got caught a lot of the time and actually H82 did get caught in the crucial moment and that's where the entire Raven team started to fall apart but that was I think the only time he got caught standing alone I'm just saying two things for me in this game there's a million things to talk about you just listed almost all of them two things for me H82 stop dying in top lane okay number two don't let Nacho Jin have Falstad when you have first pick and you first pick Zeratul and it looks like that, I'm worried. Zeratul is a strong pick into Falstad, so maybe they're saying, yes, please take Falstad, I'm going to kill you. Didn't kill him one time, not even one time, and died several times trying. And I think going into game three, because they will have first pick again, they need to stop the, the, these two things from happening. Nitrogen's Falstad soak and his global presence and L5's rotations and HA2 don't want to see him dying as Rag in the top lane anymore. And looks like that was a really not too one-sided game, but Raven actually had a very good chance of taking the taking maybe a single game off of L5. But let's see if that is going to happen in game number three or actually 
L5 is going to finish the match. Let's see. We'll take a short break after the commercial. See you guys soon.
Welcome back, everybody. L5 is one win away from going 9-0 and zero in their opening three matches here in our first weekend of HTC Korea. Doesn't seem to be Raven. Uh, it doesn't seem that Raven will be the team uh, to stop their streak. Not today, but so far against an opponent that can actually out-rotate and have some strategies that works against L5 at the beginning of the game. It, they look pretty good, but after a while, while as a game like progresses after level 10, especially after level 13, they're losing it a little bit by little bit and it keeps on happening. Maybe in game three, they can focus a little bit more after getting some fresh air, some, some drinks. Who knows? Let's see. Well, going into our third map, it will be Infernal Shrines. It'll be the map choice of L5 as Raven will continue to uh, take that first pick. So I want to say this is the map that Falstead is not as important on, but they need to take Falstead away from Nitrogen. I really it's still and truly believe that even on this map, it's not, you know, a huge map. It's not uh, it's not Cursed Hollow. It's not Sky Temple. It's not Dragonshire. It's not like the Falstead map, but it's still, I mean, he's just so good on the hero. And I think that's something to look forward to in this draft. They allow uh, L5 to have false that again, and get punished by it again. Uh, the results would just simply speak for themselves as we go into this draft. And as you watch HTC Korea or any other regions, you see the importance of having this wide hero pool. If you can only play six heroes out of the 62 and go into a hero league, that's going to be tough. Let's say if you're like the fifth pick and then you're forced into a situation where you have to pick a support. And only support you can play Uther. And then <laughs> if you pick Uther, the moment you pick Uther, your chat's going to be on fire. So this, you, basically, I want to tell you the importance of having a big hero pool. It also comes out in the draft of the pros. Really, it shows from L5. See, even Raven, they are, after a break, they should have been talking on this during the break. I know they maybe want to use more time, but L5, and especially on this map, there is also Kerrigan and Diablo. There's just so many things to ban, then with lack of lack of information they have against L5, it's going to make it make every single draft super tough when the opponent ha just has a super wide range of hero pool. There's a chance that we see a Falstead ban here. L5 is considering it. They can absolutely just do the standard Zarya ban. Um, either way, I'm pretty sure that Raven will be glad, or L5 will be glad to allow them the Zeratul that they had it in the last set. If Raven picks Zeratul first here again, I think it's a mistake. Hammond will have to play a much better game this game than he did in the previous game if the Zeratul pick is to work. You can see a shot of him there on camera right now, but. This allows L5 to, if they choose to, get Malfurion and uh, Falstead. But or more even importantly, Kerrigan. yeah, more importantly, Kerrigan is available here. I feel like Zest Zeratul is quite strong, but it's just not warranted in this case. And I think that this is going to come back to bite Raven in game three. Well, they made their choice, and Hamlin did try his best, like he literally, literally tried his best to take down even one at the back line, but he failed to do so many times. He died maybe, trying many maybe times. Maybe this game is the game where he would he can come back and maybe start to fight, start to fight like 4v5, and maybe with that void prison they can they can go into Diablo as we saw in match number one. They can have some CC chain. Well, we'll see. I mean, certainly anything is possible, and. Uh, I don't think the Zeratul could have been less effective, so I think we're going up no matter what. Um, but in this next rotation, they have the ability to grab Falstead because L5 did take Kerrigan instead um, for that map choice. And I just, uh, okay, Rag and Falstead too, maybe? Even the Diablo will be fine. Diablo is also fine, but well, they're gonna take Kerrigan instead. You know, the thing is, they don't even necessarily want Falstead, they may want um, L5 to take it because Hamlin is looking for the picks on Nacho Jin here, but uh, we'll see if that ends up coming into play. As now L5 has the ban in their hands, they may just ban a support again. They may ban the Karzim. 
and uh, go down that path. We're not going to be seeing Diablo anymore with both Ragnaros and Varian on the field. Um, I'm just going to ban Vala potentially here for the damage. Fair choice. Because they did have surprising the last two picks with Vala Rio. But Raven, they. L5 is really smart on the drafting because they do pick whatever is needed, but they don't actually show 100% of what they're actually trying to build. And Nobles has a lot of tanks he can't actually play, which forces Raven to ha just. It's going to make it so much harder for them to think um, pick, like, this is this the right ban or is this the right ban? It's always hard. I think a Tyrael ban or a an ETC ban here is, is pretty solid. Um, there's no, the thing is, there's no perfect ban here. And that's because L5 doesn't show anything in the draft, like you just said. But um, I think those are the w two wisest bans. They could also ban... Um, Oh, realistically, I don't think I was gonna say some sort of range damage, but I don't think so. The ban Diablo. That's 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 a reasonable ban too. You know, we're definitely not seeing it on on Raven's side here, but uh, absolutely L5 could have picked up with the Kerrigan. They're gonna take both range damages away here. We're not gonna see Falstad on the side of L5. They don't even, they're not even interested with Zeratul already picked. My L5's draft looks scary, and they can just finish that with Johanna or any other tanks that Nobles wishes to play, and Raven. They can take ETC, still available. <laughs> Tyrael, solo tank Tyrael, not even out of the question here with this. And I I worry Raven. We're gonna finally get to see Jung on a carry hero here, the uh, the melee carry. We'll see, I think Regar is also an okay choice. There are just a lot. They still have Gudan available for the wave clear. Gudan is not a bad choice at all. Um, and I think that's where we're headed here. And the when where Kerrigan just tries to jump in, you can just horrify her and then make her just isolate from the entire team. Maybe that's the way you want to go. We could see Kael'thas here too. I know he's not really in the meta, quote unquote, but he would not be a terrible choice um, given the situation. Karazim and Gudan does make it through this time. So we're going to be seeing him. And the last pick here for L5, likely to either be the Tyrael or the ETC. I would like to see Johanna against the Varian, of course, getting unstoppable. And also, I think I think giving blind to Kerasim actually <laughs> works a lot. And by ETC, let's go in for Noblesse. Okay, ETC, the choice here. A solid comp all around for L5. Raven, they're gonna need to make Hamlin a god. Camon will have to play perfectly. They've got three melees, single, solo, uh, ranged mage damage coming out with Gul'dan. L5, I think, has the better comp, but if Hamlin plays much better here in this third game, maybe they could turn around. Will L5 take this series 3-0 or Raven Mount to come back? We're going to find out right now on this third map, Infernal Shrines. Here we go. In blue, L5, SC on Tychus, Nitrogen on Li Ming, Jung on Kerrigan, Nobles on ETC, and Swoy on Malfurion. And their opponent in red, Raven and Joju in Kerazim, Hamlin on Zeratul, Animax in Gul'dan, Theong on Varian, H82, and Ragnaros. They, Something they kept three of the same heroes. Yep. And which did not work so perfectly last game. Maybe they can make it work this time as L5 actually has lots of squishy heroes to say. Yeah. Zero 2 can turn all. Okay, that was pretty dangerous. L5, they just have their eyes wide open for that Zero 2. Something I want to point out is uh, Soy is almost always on Malfurion because, and uh, it's, it's a funny thing, like it's an interaction I've started to realize because I. Um, L5 ends up being blue for some reason. I always end up calling out his name. As I think about a lot of my, he played any other heroes in Malfurion. The reason why he ends up with Malfurion, 
every time is because L5 wins every game. So they end up with second pick and the Ralph Fury rotation always happens. So like, <laughs> that's true. What's what's really interesting is because they never get first pick except potentially sometimes when they win the coin toss in the opening. He always has to play Malfurion, and that means, uh, which is pretty cool for him, that how good he is on other heroes right now is completely hidden to the other teams. So right now, he just looks like a one-trick Malf, um, but we don't even know how well he's playing Karazim right now, who's risen quite up, um, and, and or how well he's playing Rhaegar, really, because he's just simply always playing the Malfurion, which is, so, is just pretty interesting uh, when you look at it. So, just a little interaction I want to point out. I can actually look up exactly how many times he's played um, the hero, but uh, it's quite a few because <laughs> the the second rotation always goes to the winning team. Look at this Dion coming out from the side. Hamling is waiting for that moment, but as he notices Noblesse coming up, he has to run for his life, and he actually does stall some time here, not getting caught by Jungla at the moment. Soy has played up until before one this Karazim, best of five. One Rhaegar and one Karazim, four Malfurions. But today in this series, uh, this is going to be his third Malfurion. So. so basically, those two are the game they won the coin toss? Seven and two will be his Malfurion right after today. And I think it could be, yeah. Uh, um, I'd have to go back and check the mods. Hamlin also, okay, as Jung Ha already started this massacre on top. Hamlin, Hamlin really is trying his best to get a pick off, so it's it's just not working against L5 because they're usually they're staying together, and even when he goes for Nacho Jin, when he was false, that Nacho Jin was just so good, just gusting him away whenever he actually thinks he has a chance to grab him, and that was quick, just by Kerrigan herself. This is essentially just a uh, almost bloodless uh, exchange here as they just allowed Kerrigan onto the shrine and they didn't contest which was wise um, it looks really annoying uh, right now if you're uh, Raven because you're like oh they just got it for free but I thought there wasn't much Raven could do so they took these impalers instead they pushed this lane they got a very slight EXP lead they blocked the damage of the immortal slightly by using uh, Rag's trait up in the top lane, so the sword is impervious. They lose a wall, and that's okay. Uh, could have been worse. Dion with the dodge. That was nice. Noblesse is going to eat a lot of damage here. Hamlin does a little bit of damage to Nitrogen, unfortunately, though. Uh, not able to get the kill. Targeting Noblesse wouldn't have been good either because he just has too large of a health pool. So, Yeah, like as you said, I don't think Hamlin's Zero Tool does not... It does not worth the first pick. It should be fourth or maybe fifth as the last pick possibly. This is not a reset Zeratul, this is not a rich Zeratul, it's just simply not worth prioritizing this highly. I completely agree. Yep, and L5 just having having that first Punisher, but actually Raven did soak up pretty good EXP, so they're not falling behind at all at the moment. And they've been doing this for the entire series. They were not behind close to level 9 or 10, even be after 10, but after hitting 12 and 13, as I mentioned before, their teamwork starts to fall apart, starting from the macro, and that's where the power of L5 actually comes out. So it like counteracts like, in the opposite way towards L5, and Hamlin is almost dead again. Wow. He's lucky that part of the cannon tower that flew off is actually just a doodad and doesn't do damage. <laughs> Oh, De Jong is going to get the lockdown here, though, onto Nacho Jin. That was a weird interaction. Yeah, because Nacho Jin teleported after, because yeah. it's a target it's yeah. a target skill. He just went all the way there. Maybe he could have teleported right after. I think it still ha could have been a kill. I think it would have been either way. But but stalled like a few more seconds, it doesn't really matter. But And this now is... they can push all the way to the second wall already. Yeah, they're really pushing the boundaries of what they can do with a small advantage. And this would be terribly risky in, in any other case, but in this case that uh, they have vision of the bot lane of what L5 is doing, it's not actually that risky. If uh, Sway had actually just blindly uh, rooted, if he had vision of um, Hamill there, Hamill would have died 100%. He's like really playing greedy, uh, just standing there to soak cloaked. If he had been seen, he would have been dead. The game is close in terms of EXP. Man, Noble S actually may get picked here. Did he actually use power slide? I guess yes, he, he does. And then it's, there he goes. And even seven-sided strike chosen, but not really effective against him. 
gets the pick and Hamlin comes up and now it is Junghai in danger zone, but he's at, he gets one more and just finishes the Punisher. There you go, so two deaths here for L5, but they are gonna have this objective. They already got the bot um, fort, now this mid fort push is gonna be quite strong as, you know, Junghai's gonna respawn in 10 seconds here and come over. H82 again, nullifying this push with the Ragnaros right now. So, as you can see, the Punisher is just going to occupy himself with killing this cannon tower. But now that Jonga has respawned, they need to be careful. Hamlin is rotating down. He has Void Prison. And there is a Taunt available as well. So, this is a fight that Raven can absolutely win. But he gets spotted right away with that round. That's placed. Well, those placements are also very useful. Having those, having those scouting, scouting drones is... Giving vision, just able to scout zero tools just like that. Just cancels everything in. Here it comes, and they noticed L5 is ready for it and gets smashed. But boy, good for three-man boy prison go well. Kerrigan is so far away at the moment. Maybe Raven can take this. Tigers blows up the first. Yep, Chung is coming down. There's the stun onto Hamlin though, and that's a kill. Again, overextending. No reason to try to go for that pick there with all the CC that L5 has. Now this fight can get turned around. Jung gets the reset on the minion, gets two jumps here. Dion with the taunt. They do have Horrify this time, so Jung will go down. Looks like Nachojin will be able to start to get some resets though. No, Joju denies him with resets. It would be a totally different fight. Ends up being an even exchange here yet again. So close call and Raven takes an EXP lead. This actually looks like a game that Raven may be able to take away from L5 finally. If they had Let's Horrify, see. it was eight seconds away when the Void Prison was uh, was going down. If they had Horrify there, Raven would have destroyed that fight. It was a good Void Prison. That's what Hamlin has been doing well, using these Void Prisons. And Nobles does have Mosh available. I think he was looking for that angle. He was being a little bit too passive, and then I thought, what's going on? Now we see it, he, had, he picked Mosh instead of Stage Dive, and this is one of the maps they are forced into Shrine, so ha going into a big Mosh is, like, you have a higher chance of getting into a big Mosh. It's also not, it's it's not a huge map either, which is why Falstad uh, is not prioritized really as much in this draft, so that's something to keep in mind here as well. All right, Shrine already controlled position-wise by L5. Look at Noblesse here. Just gonna use a face melt to slow this down. Everybody rotates in. Raven gets on it first though. Where is Jaw? He's actually clearing this wave. They don't have 13, so they wanted to get one more wave of minions before they actually go in. Hamlin's position here is really good this time. Actually just trying to make sure no one can get to this bot lane to get that EXP. They're gonna fight without 13 regardless though. They're committing. Let's see if Nobles can have a big mosh or if not, Okay, Kerrigan gets cleansed right there, and Noblesse look for the, looking for the angle to come in, but gets horrified, but gets Anachojin getting some resets, putting off that damage, seven sided strike, does take out Noblesse, and now it's, this is Raven's in favor. Yep, Raven wins this fight. They have a positive exchange right now. H82 is very low though, and Odin is still active. H82 just needs to leave. In fact, well, they, they win this fight, though. I'm surprised they're just going to give control away. They still win the fight, uh, but H82 just needed to back off there. Well, down a member, and L L5 is going to take this. And Nachojin did have some mana available. I think that was one of the biggest thing. And you, and having Tigers and Leeming, the burst damage they can put out is actually pretty big. And Hamlin just trying to juke and actually catches his own member in that boy prison. Also, that may actually give him... And Actually, Joji takes him out. H82 with a huge uh, Molten core here to actually get that done. Well-timed, actually. Good coordination here by H82, but there's a root onto Hamlin. We see the combo attempt here by Jong. He gets a lot of CC done, but no picks. They do secure this uh, Punisher, which is quite huge because if one of these members gets stunned by it, it might go down. Joju has nowhere to jump. And he goes down, and now Jung on the, the chase here, gets a reset mid-air, goes through a great Kerrigan play we're seeing right now. Deong is gonna get caught here as well. And what started off great for Raven, L5 just outplayed them for that second team fight once Jung came back. This is gonna be a keep wall, and it may be more. Honestly, thought Raven had their chance right there, but they have lost it already, and this Punisher Maybe this can be a very short game and Jungha going all the way in. Very, still at 50% health. Very good, uh, you know, 
pull here on the Punisher. Now he's going to bug out because the keep isn't dead. He can't actually attack the core because it's invulnerable. So that's a, that's actually quite difficult to do. So props to H82 doing this. He's H82 in this game has basically been on uh, keep and fort defense duty. Like he's using his multi core to defend, <laughs> yeah, that's and then right. in this case he's like, all right, I got this. I'll pull him into the core, and he can't kill it because it's in in invincible. Um, he didn't have his molten core because he used it to get that kill earlier after the void prison. Uh, but they saved the keep, all thanks to his uh, pull there on yeah, now, that Punisher. Now Alpha has the lead for once in this game. They had 16. Raven still needs some time to soak up some EXP for 16. And L5, this is their chance. Now they look super, like, every time we see the minimap, we, see, we can kind of see the flow of every single team, how they move, how they macro, right? And then L5 was kind of like stalling but still keeping their cool which is which shows that the reason why they're champions and after taking this lead just they're just going all over absolutely all right look at Noblesse's position here he has mosh pit he's looking for a good angle if he can get one or two and yeah, they can win the fight off of that alone it's so important that they save the bot okay look at what vision right now Raven has. Okay, they have vision just now, like right now, but, but the second that they were rotating up to this wave, they had no vision. Hammond, uh, not Hammond, H82 is in position where he could have been caught. Gotta be careful about that. They get away with it this time. Okay, level 17 to 16 here, even talent tiers. No keeps down. Raven, absolutely still in a position where they could win this game. They're, they're significantly behind in terms of structures, but in terms of where they are in EXP, they have a window here. And this next uh, shrine is going to be the important one. Let's see Hamlin still looking for a pick from the side, and great power slide goes in. Dion is already half HP. Seven sided strike does go off, but Joju barely survives from that. And ha on to chase to Hamlin. Looks like, oh, he actually managed to pick on Tychus. Nice dodge there as well. He actually make it out. Nope. Good shot by Nitrogen. Gets the reset. So it's going to be a one for one. That Horrify turned the fight around. It was a really good position for L5 before that. Good dodge here on the combo by Dio. And he gets rooted, or excuse me, stunned here, unfortunately, though, by that power slide. And this is a perfectly placed root there to keep Gul'dan out. So he goes down as well, and Jung'a is just popping off. They can just go clear this Shaman camp. Curious what the timer on theirs is. I actually don't know. It should be coming up fairly soon, if I'm not mistaken. But the Shrine is free. I said the Shrine is what the most important. It's going to lead towards that level 20. And it may even get them a keep. And it is also Arcane Punisher. So going into the Punisher, they can... I don't think they can hit 20, maybe close to 20. But not yet. They can stall some time. Soak up EXP for now. And then after that time, they can be a little more, be a little bit more aggressive. H82 and is really aggressively soaking right now. It ends up being safe. Um, but they don't have vision. I'm just watching this on the main map. He's trying to catch them up in ESP because they're just going to give the shrine. They know they can't contest it anymore with Jungla being in a good position there with the respawns they had. But uh, they need to set up a defense. H82 is going to be the guy again. He's going to want to Molten Core here, keep this keep alive as long as possible, try to aggro that Punisher into the invulnerable core. Here it comes. looks like the Echo Corruption is not complete yet. Yeah, that's actually a really important point. Yeah, because whenever your your enemy is coming in, then one of those skill can actually turn another team fight on. It does so much damage if you actually land on so many heroes on the other side. Punisher starts to jump in, doing some damage. Jungha L5 is trying to be safe, just t trying to take out this keep. Noblesse takes significant amount of damage. But look at look at the Punisher's ability on the ground. He has three of them hitting the keep, so unfortunately this is not going to be defendable. The keep goes down. This means it's a huge team fight opportunity. Already Hamlin is dead, and they are pushing towards the core again. These arcane abilities on the ground, these spinning fireballs are doing so much damage. Deong is caught alone here. Will he get out? The answer is no, and that should be game here. It's going to be a 3-0 win for L5. Zatrogen gets the reset. It's a desperate Joju seven-sided. It's not enough. They're going to target down the core. They have level 20 now to help them finish it. And L5 with that level 20, it looks like the core is lethal for sure. They're just going slowly, picking off a few more kills before they actually end the game. 
Even the Mosh Pit to grab the last stack around. So he does go down at the end. But still, that does not matter too much. It looks like the series is going to L5. 9-0 so far in HGC Korea. What a team. What a team. A world champion team two times in a row. The first team in the world to ever do so. And now they haven't dropped a single set. Very impressive play from this team today. Making it look easy. It Raven, looks easy. Raven, good coordination in the early game. I think you hit the nail on the head. They seem to mechanically fall behind and maybe get fatigued as the game goes along. They, they lose something. They lose sight of, of the game, it feels like, almost in a way. They need to improve their drafting, I'd say, especially um, in terms of uh, the Zeratul priority there. Uh, against L5, it's just simply not working, but they continue to try to force it. Um, H82 played a much better game in the game three, though. I like He had some risk. He was definitely doing some risky soak in there at the end. He, didn't, he got away with it, but in terms of his uh, Molten Core usage, he got a kill off of it, and he also protected those forts and keeps for a long time. So good rag player at the end of the day. Um, I think position-wise, he's got to improve. Yeah, that's right. H82 really help them really secure those those buildings and not get the exp exp lead go away but it, at the end l5 took the team fight on and just nacho jin just putting off that constant damage from the side what a great leaming player didn't even have to have the false head there in that last game to win it um, <laughs> that's right false head just went through the draft actually some really good odin usage as well um uh, in there so uh sc showing his tychus playoff once again and it's. It just seems like this team has no weaknesses. Like the times where they lose team fights, I'm like, Ugh, they're playing greedy, or like this was a mistake. But overall, they just seem unbeatable. G Clef. Yep. And De Jong staying in that front line. He made some. He made some mistakes also, and he was the only one who could actually soak up some soak up a lot of the damage. So there goes De Jong, and his his variant did not look as strong as it, it did before. They even. L5 even banned out Varian at the very beginning. It, it looks like it, they don't need to anymore. Absolutely. When you guys hear that music, by the way, um, it's because they're doing a hashtag event, as we do in Europe and NA. If you hashtag HGC, uh, your message might get on the Korean stream. Uh, on, your you, on your Facebook. Yeah, it's so on Facebook, but you might want to do that in Korean uh, if you want to get featured. <laughs> um, but yeah, use and that hashtag. You might actually get prize. Yeah, you could. So yeah. Some skin codes and heroes if you don't have them, too. Absolutely. But that's going to do it for us for this second best of five. We've got one more, and it's going to be the best one of the night tonight. So tell your friends. We'll be right back after a short commercial break. Well, not yet. Because I did it, G Clef. Well, I closed too soon. You did, but it's okay. We, ha we still have one more match. It has already been four hours and 42 minutes since the stream started. But there goes the music, and see you soon.
Dante, Adulerul Cibeta. Crota, Igil Slumnen Jonjeni Tagawaku. Nan Kutugaxka Tuevoriaci. Hajiman, Igisangan Segeesan. System Taro. Yongong Kamaru Kishiyami. 영웅 강화 완료 여왕을 맞이해 새로운 전쟁이 강제되었습니다 새로운 영웅이 도착했습니다 <웃음> 갈날 여왕 이거 재밌겠군 걱정 마라 빠르게 끝내줄 테니 그래 재밌어? 그럼 하? 재미있구만 아직 준비가 안된것 같은데 안 그래 오 미련 내가 너무 많은 걸 기대했나 그입좀 닫아줄래? 좋아 이제야 싸울만 하겠군 은 모험이다. 혹시 시공의 폭풍 가보신 분? 여긴 탐험할 세계가 무궁무진해요. 올거리 또 얼마나 많다고요? 엄마! Oh 물론 위험도 있지만 그게 바로 모험의 재미 아니겠어요? 어, 제가 도와줄게요. 전 스톰 스타우트 가문이에요. 스톰 스타우트에게 인생은 모험이죠. 난 순찰대의 사령관이었다. 숨이 끊어지는 순간까지 실버문과 그 백성을 지키겠노라. 맹세했지. 맹세만으로는 부족했다. 내 고향은 불타고 말았다. 하나 그건 먼 과거일 뿐. 역사는 반복되지 않을 것이니 나는 실바나스 윈드러너 포세이큰의 여왕이다 이번 생에 날 섬기지 않겠다면 다 
다음 생에 섬겨라. 이 전투복이 내 감옥이 된다고 했던가. 잘만 맞는구만. <웃음> 날 이렇게들 부르더군 변절자, 무법자 인정하겠어 인생 재밌게 살아야지 모르잖아 누가 아, 또 뭐가 우리 편이 될지 말이야 시궁의 폭풍이 날 불렀을 때 그래서 내 대답은 하나였지 드디어 올 것이 왔군 주방자, 방랑자로 이 세계에 왔으나 함께 뭉치면 더큰 것이 될수 있지 앞제의 사슬을 끊을 모기 길을 잃고 쫓기는 자를 위한 든든한 요새 와 명예로 맺어진 하나의 가족 하나 적들의 평화를 원치 않는다면 나무가 전쟁군 아, 승리가 없는 죽음을 너희의 대족장으로서 맹세하노니 세상이 끝나는 그날까지 내 모든 걸 바치리라 
나는 일천하고도 한 분의 신을 모시기 위해 평생을 수련했다. 그분들의 뜻에 따라 나는 전쟁과 평화 사이에 가시밭길을 걷는다. 그분들의 축복으로 나 다친 자를 치유하고 공격하길 바라시면 나그 주먹이 된다 난 이브고로도의 수도사 카라지입니다 신들께서 내 입을 빌어 말씀하시길 너희와 할 말이 있다는 것 역사를 통해 깨달아 함께 싸우지 않으면 홀로 죽는다는 것을 하지만 이제 우리에게 패배는 없다 
Welcome back. Here's the Storm fans. We are now going into our third and final best of five of the night. MVP Miracle up against Supreme Mixtape. This is going to be a good one. I'm excited to see how SMT does. They put up a little bit of a fight against L5 on Friday, mm -hmm. uh, but it was L5. So, you know, every, everybody looks weaker in comparison to L5, but how will they do against Miracle, who lost already to Mighty this season? Yep, both of these teams played in day one, and they had some time. They had a day, a little bit more time, plus 24, 24 hours, plus a little bit more to practice and get some strategy, watch some VOD. Also, they had to watch some VODs from HGC Korea to actually see what the opponent kind of has. But it looks like both teams, not super like perfected yet, but if we have to compare, I would put MVP Miracle a little bit more favor. I would say definitely so. Like, Supreme Mixtape is a new team, a new roster. Miracle has a changed roster. And uh, with the additions of, of course, Dami and Honkano, there's a lot that you really have to, like, think about in terms of what they're going to play like uh, and how much time they have had together, which is very limited. Um, so they've had one extra day, like you said. They had some tournament experience with each other. So this team is... Look, it was in the finals, won the wild card qualifier. It was in the finals of Gold Club's World Championship. And they got crushed by L5. Then their next match they played, uh, televised, was actually their match against Mighty, where they lost 3-2. to two. So does it mean Mighty's really strong? It absolutely could. Um, or is this just Miracle still needs some time to adjust to their new roster? I'm not entirely sure, but today we're going to find out as they play up against a somewhat weaker team than L5. Yep, as I want to stress that the Hokono and Dami are the two new players on the rosters. As we said, and Tist went to MVP Black. They had to fill that hole with two spots. Then they, though that duo came from Tempest. And it looks like the teamwork is not 100% like 100% perfect yet, but here comes Dami, the key player. Of course, he was favoring a lot of the melee assassins, but right now the meta is not 100%. It does not fit for him exactly, I guess. Yeah, this is uh, this is not the meta to be a melee assassin. Um, he did play the Zarya and he played Dahaka. These two heroes are still very much meta. Zeratul is coming back in Korea, but you know, with limited success so far. Hamlin Zeratul definitely not looking too strong. The best Zeratul we've seen so far in this tournament, I feel, is Goods that we saw earlier this evening. And uh, Dami is a star player. He always he always was, and he was the flashy gray main. He was the carry. He was the one that had, you know, Kaldor and Dreadnought screaming on the cast and then had me screaming <laughs> on the analyst desk where he had zero deaths um, in that winning game because he was just so well supported. But again, it's not his meta now. Their opponents, of course, Supreme Mixtape. Wiz, uh, the player who wanted to play in NA. No chat, a long, long standing uh, Heroes of the Storm player who never had big success. Dudu, you know, the guy who is a great baller, uh, if given the right supports, really shines. And uh, this is a good time to be a Vala main. Yeah, it is. It is the meta, and then not just Vala, but you also have to have some other heroes in your back. But of course, having Wiz, the brain, so to say, he is the coach for the team. And no chat, heavily favoring Zarya. And did play Zarya against L5, did not turn out to be a win. But still, it was worth the ban, and it does get banned so much. And even they won the entire open division in, in the HGC Korea a few weeks ago and did not drop a bat, but still, they Open Division did not have an L5, MVP Black, or Tempest, or even MVP Miracle. That's right. And no chat, uh, I think he, he strikes me as that insanely good solo queue player. He's always like high up on, on GM, um, but he's now gonna work with the team at a very competitive tournament. I was most impressed with his Medivh, to be honest with you, and we'll see if that comes out again today. Yeah, that's right, and let's take a look at the battleground. Infernal Shrine banned. A little surprising. And Braxis again banned. Are we ever going to see a map of Braxis in this season? Just doesn't feel like it. Um, it is first pick to Miracle, so Supreme Mixtape has chosen Dragon Shire here. We might see that Warhead Junction. Maybe, probably not, but I mean, it's available. 
And uh, if we go all the all five games, I suppose it is possible. And Tomb of the Spider Queen is available here too, which is somewhat unusual. Um, we haven't seen it even a single time in this tournament, I believe, and we're now in our ninth best of five. And of all the eight, we have seen no Tomb of the Spider Queen. So it's not Europe over here. <laughs> yeah, it was banned like one or two times because they, sometimes the teams were facing uh, team team members from TNL before, and they are famous for Spider Queen. Master, so but here we go into the Dragon Shire. The ban, of course, banning out Zarya it also takes out a huge potential for no chat on screen mix tape. Absolutely, this is a fall step map if I've ever seen one. So I imagine that uh, Supreme Mix Tape is considering the fall step ban here. There it is. I don't know, maybe this is our first time seeing fall step today. <laughs> Ballstat is just so powerful at the, in Korea, and yeah, it is. the Tassadar um, availability here is scary. Miracle may just lock it up here, but they won't get the pairing, so they may actually just leave it to Supreme Mixtape, and this is probably what uh, Supreme Mixtape is looking for here. I think the cool pick you can do here for Miracle is actually just take Bala, and then you look at the pairings of, of what's available with Tassadar, and it feels like a little bit weaker uh, with the ball removed. So there it is. And of course, MB Miracle does like to play Vala a lot. And it deserves a first pick. We even saw Vala first pick several times during Super League Season 3, which was the previous HTC Korea last year. And looking at the draft today, I think, and I've saw, I saw some of the draft from EU and NA, it is somewhat different still the meta is not the same but it is i think it's coming together in a way and it is going towards that macro game a little more after the korean season started yeah it definitely is now here's here's a, a query because why take rag very in this early we saw it earlier today and the more and more you see it, the more and more it seems to be the pro gamers think this is correct, right? Ragnaros, Varian, the Sephiric Smash taunt combo is super powerful. Um, just the trade of Ragnaros in general, very, very powerful. But the question is, is it worth it when you give Tassadar Malfurion to Miracle? Malfurion, not even a must pick here, but the Tassadar that you give um, is, is so scary. Now, I talked about it before. Uh, if you take Vala, it's less appealing to take Tassadar. But it's just so unfortunate that now Miracle, I think, I mean, the second those are locked in, they thought about it for maybe five seconds, and they're like, yeah, of course we just tasked our Malfurion here because now we have Vala Tass, and Supreme Mix Tape, at least in this case, doesn't have to worry about Ariel because <laughs> they already uh, they already have Malfurion, so they're probably considering the ETC ban here, I imagine. Yeah, Tist was super, super good, even better than Joker in some ways on that ETC, so that's probably the best man if you have to say. Uh, there are some other options. Yeah, the just Haka. like the Haka, just for that global presence, because they do not have a global yet. And when you ban the Haka, it leans more and more towards Hong Kong and playing that ETC, um, just simply because of the global presence you just described, his early game presence as well. Uh, Dragonshire, not the map where you see a lot of ETC ganks in the solo lane, but Ragnaros again has no escape, so that's something that we'll have to keep in mind as we go forward here as Miracle looks for this ban. Something else to keep in mind too is Dami Zeratul is something that could pop out here because of the ganks I just described. So just throwing all these kind of uh, theory crafting here into this draft as Miracle has 20 seconds to the side. Um, I'd say banning a ranged hero like Tychus here is your best bet. Just because you already have Falstead removed, you have Fallout on your side. And yes, they can take Leeming, but you're not too concerned about that. So there's the Tychus ban. And now, Supreme Mixtape, uh, you know, if they take Leeming, for the reasons we described, I'm worried, uh, it's that burst damage and the burst shield kind of counteracting each other. It doesn't make Leeming a powerful pick here. Yeah, exactly what you talked about. We saw that, uh, we mentioned that a couple of times, just today's, during today's first match and second match. Maybe taking, even taking a cooldown would be a better choice and look for, take that Echo, Echo Corruption and look for that late game burst damage. Maybe that's, that's a possibility what Spring Mixcape can do right now, but they do, they do really favor, especially Scarlet, does favor Regar. 
into play. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Um, it's a it's a tough choice. I think they're trying to decide between Li Ming and Gul'dan in terms of range damage. Uh, and it's going to be Sergeant Hammer that actually comes out instead with Thrall. Long time no see. Long time That's a no, no chat here if I've ever seen one. No chat loves his Thrall. But that Thrall, I cannot believe that we never <laughs> mentioned Thrall well, today. Sure. The thing is, he hasn't really been picked as highly as he is in Hero League in Korea, for example. Um, he requires a lot of coordination and. As you were saying uh, before, this is kind of a meta where we don't see that much melee assassin play. Like if you want to go in and use that Earthquake, of course it is strong and his cooldown is 100 seconds now. So it gives him a little bit more risk when you use one. And then while you're trying to go in, you may actually blow up and maybe get gets rooted or just your entire team cannot, if your team really cannot follow you with you, then you're just done. You just pop the earthquake and you're gone. The thrall is somewhat of a soft man on Zeratul here as well. That's you can see Gidami in the camera shot here is definitely giving some consideration to the Zeratul pick here. And it's gonna be Tyrael ETC. So they decide to go with the Tyrael um, for the extra sanctification he's gonna provide to ETC. We knew ETC was likely going to be the pick because of what's available in terms of tanks and because of the Dahaka ban. So this gives him a little bit of global presence. Um, like we were talking about before. And for Supreme Mixtape here, it's really just a choice between Rhaegar and Karazim. I'd say there's even a potential Morales that could come through with this as well. Uh, I personally would like to see the Rhaegar here with a strong frontliner like Thrall. The burst heal that Ancestral gives is just so powerful. I think the Ancestral can be a, one of the better answers compared to if you're talking about. There's some other supports that's possible still. Like, Morales is even, is even possible, but here. Regar seems I'm like, to be Lili the right is choice. Not, Lili, <laughs> Lili is not is one not, of the choices, Lili but yeah. is not, and Uther uh, is not at the moment. It would be sick to see Uther here, to be honest. It's, if it were the new patch, I'd be Lili like, and Water Dragon, or Uther with Storm. It is Regar as we expected. Because so, he, needs, he needs a lot of healing. It's going to be Ancestral for... I'm, I'm pretty, pretty sure on that. If they bloodlust here, then uh, I'm gonna be unhappy. Rhaegar has a lot more self heal than he did before with his earthquake. Now that it actually does damage and procs his trait, but uh. And Hammer can just burst this tank siege mode out a little faster, but still having that Bala. Let's see if MVP Miracle can take a win, or surprisingly, Spray Mistake can take a win. In game number one. Let's go into game number one in Dragon Shire. All right, MVP Miracle, Hong Kono and Dami, two summer champions. Sniper, 2015 champion, Crazy Moving, 2015 champion, and Darvish on ETC, Tyrael, Tastar, Vala, and Malfurion, respectively, to start things off. Their opponent, Spring Mixtape, Scarlet on Regar, Dudu on Sergeant Hammer, Wiz on Thrall, Judy on Varian, No Chat on This is a team of champions from different eras. You've got 2015, you have uh, Summer, all in one. And this is a team of legends. And we can careful. If they can sort this roster out, if Honkado can tighten up his play, on paper, this team should be one of the best in this league. They deserve to be on the top four, but having that tough loss against Mighty on that first day, I think they, they really learned their lesson. And especially Hong Kong are not staying with the team, just way too aggressive as a solo tank at the front line. Speaking of which, he's going to use this EDC to get some early game pressure here onto Judy. He will escape though. Uh, Judy's the player on this team that everyone in Korea is talking about. Just his ability to peel and uh, just kind of be a backbone for the team. That's everything that uh, the Korean side of thing, uh, the fans and the cast are talking about a lot. And I really do believe that he's shined quite brightly, especially on Friday, as we were talking about in the match against uh, L5. I think he was one of the more consistent tanks, among the, especially among the new players that we have not seen too much. We have to agree with in. that. 
And they are... Just a channel here, but he's gonna get, throw and cancels it. They're focusing on... I actually like this rotation, just focusing, having three of them distributed on the bottom. So make sure they can contest the bottom, actually. And having Ragnaros in the middle, he can just cha cancel that channeling from happening. So they're, they're not giving away this first Dragon Knight that easily. Completely uh, with you and all that. And this is... It's, it's funny to see just how powerful ETC is as a hero in the early game. And you could even bully a Sergeant Hammer out of the lane um, and into, you know, the, to go back and get that heal because Sergeant Hammer is usually the hero you send to this bot tri lane to be a pushing hero. He's very powerful on this map, control the lane, but not in this case. Really struggling is Dudu right now. So you get that. Uh, Rhaegar is a very strong support with a lot of heal, but with his chain heal, but still, if you're talking about long-term fighting, sustain, just, we, we, we just saw basically the C moving just not having his HP down entirely. Well, he wasn't getting too much shot also, but Malfurion's just able to sustain is just above the above the charts right now. That's why that's also why Malfurion is just way too popular. Notice also the positioning of Rag in the mid lane. Because they went up to gank him, they were unsuccessful. This actually allowed the channel to happen down here for SMT. So that rotation actually went poorly for MVP Miracle. You can see the difference here and what we're seeing from Rag in this game versus what we were seeing from H82 in previous games. Just not dying is so significant. Um, you make those rotations fail, and uh, you know MVP loses is out as a result. They're gonna win this lane now that they're sticking in it though, and they're gonna get this channel. Tyrael is getting ganked at the top, by the way. Ragnaros is rotating up during all of this. He will get away. Um, Judy looks like he may go down. Nope, that was close. By the so wall. Q actually, if that Q actually hit, Judy at the time made ha they might have got him, but it hit the wall and barely saved by the wall. And if they keep on just having this without a big rotation, I think there's a good chance that we're gonna see uh, Dragon Knight <laughs> in after like seven or eight minutes, possibly. Thrall obviously always wins the top lane, which is why uh, it's really difficult for Miracle to have a channel here with a solo lane Tyrael. Tyrael's a tough laning opponent, obviously because he bullies the lane with his shields um, and has a decent amount of wave clear. But uh, that's the reason why these channels have not really been happening for Miracle, though he does actually control it temporarily and pushes the lane, as you can see on the minimap there. We're kind of just watching this poking lane. This is a very passive game so far. Keep an eye on the minimap. This time he just used Aldruins, and up comes Rag on the minimap, you can see. And it uh, looks like he's going to retreat as we see this attempted invade here. For some reason, our observer today does not want to show the top lane like at all. There's so much happening <laughs> there, but... Because there's more, there, there is more action on the bottom, but they're actually going to lose this camp. Miracle and Ragnaros comes out, comes around from the side, which is pretty dangerous for no Chad. He has to be careful. We saw no Chad going down so many times just being alone by himself. That we do. This channel here, um, if Aldruins might allow him to squat, they can channel. Looks like he's going to Aldruins in a little bit late. Meanwhile, we see this pick here in the top lane once more, though. Aldruins does allow him to take it, but we see Scarlet um, takes the bot during all this time. So just the amount of time it took to kill no Chat was enough for them to channel that. We'll see if they can retake it. It looks like they will. Now, let's see if in the top lane, uh, if they actually squat and commit to this. Tasser's going mid. Yeah, Dami's just going to squat. This is why I like to call squatting. You just sit on it, and you get the channel. He's pretty low, to be honest. Like, Wiz might actually kill him. Nope. Gets away. Gets a Dragon Knight. There you go. And Nota just delayed the timing by just a little bit. And if going into Molten, Molten Core already, I thought that was a little bit too early, but I guess they want to just put that damage onto the first Dragon Knight. The first Dragon Knight at 540. That's that's very slow because this rotation has been just keep on being about it just being safe the entire time. You know, he really only got the wall there. This is not too significant. Um, but because Wiz didn't get the kill top, obviously this is huge, and uh, they're gonna get 10 off of this. And uh, this is just at this point in time, two walls down. Which is why they have that at ESP lead because they're winning this bot lane handedly the entire time. Cypher's gonna come down. He's gonna cue this and maybe hit it one time before he loses uh, his dragon form. Three seconds. Gets two hits, three. And they're going to get the four. He gets four hits before that expires. 
And uh, they can't contest right now, even though they're overextending a little bit because they're 10, they're 11 now. Notice no chat as soon as he sees the rotation away, leaves and goes top, expecting uh, mm -hmm. this uh, this Merc camp to be, you know, clapped some by his teammates, which is in fact what happens. Now during this, um, because t uh, we just saw the check by Tastar in mid, they know that this is safe to take uh, to take this Bruiser camp. So now they can get two Bruisers for the price of one. Dami just uses that sink just to be able to just keep it alive. But all this time, the Dami being safe, the, all, all of the other members just can't just can go around and keep camping. And Dream Mixtape, they are going to lose this macro fight in another minute or so. They're going to have find themselves in trouble. Where did things start to get like go wrong? The Dragon Knight, you know, and Dami essentially just blocking Wiz from denying that camp with the Aldruins. That's something that I, I used to talk about a lot uh, back when I was in New Year's of Storm Commentator, so that was so significant. It's not as important uh, as I, I remember commentating with Moonlight about since 2015, talking about how like, this map in particular it's important. It's the fact that some heroes, some tanks, solo tanks can go over the wall and some can't. Um, and in this case, Thrall the Solo Leader can't go over the wall, so Aldruins allowed him to channel that and squat it. Um, and that meant that they could get the Dragonite. Little moves like that, just differences in the solo laning hero, can actually really change the game. And that's what Dami did. I mean, all he had to do is Q over the wall to get on that for just a second to get that Dragonite. And um, Darvish, excuse me, not Darvish, a Sniper, just goes up and channels it. So good coordination here. And then the Dragonite was able to get two walls. That's fine. Getting the fort was a little bit crazy. I'm surprised that happened. But Supreme Mixtape. Their comp relies on that combo I was talking about with Taunt and Sulfuric. Finally, they have 10, they have this ability to fight and contest, and they have Earthquake, which is super powerful as well. So there's a way where you could Taunt, then just Smash, and then slowly retreating heroes down with Earthquake and get a lot of kills. It's a great team on comp. What? How did this happen? And they got the challenge again. Screaming tape, they were a little... Not, I, I can't say slow. I think they're like pressured in a way because they lost the first one, and then now they're already saying, "What are we doing? What's what? Like exactly what I said. What went wrong? And where did it start to go wrong? And what do we do now? Because all the camps started to push from the bottom, from the mid. Now no, no chest gonna use pop, finish that molten core to do some damage, but sniper just charges out. That's Hammer. They might actually go for the second key, and they have the potential to do so. Brawl comes around, ETC is still on top. Maybe this is their chance. Let's see if Zank is already popped. All right, Judy is running in here. Dami with perfect positioning here. They do finally get the hook onto Sniper, though. And Sulfuric Smash used to blow him up. He had already used his escape. During all of this, ETC was soaking top. Had Sniper survived, then they could have gone in for a kind of backward stage dive to trap Supreme Mixtape. But that was really good coordinated uh, focus there on Supreme Mixtape. And just abusing the fact that Sniper was out of position, this works out very well for them. So they're still behind, but one pick, definitely strong. And part of the reason why Miracle is this significantly ahead of EXP still is because that uh, Honkono soak in the top lane was just pouring into them. Yeah, he was about to come down and he decided to just get one more wave and basically soak so much EXP on top, even if the losing one and then Hong Kong looks like Hong Kong did, did his homework. Yeah, he's definitely playing a little bit more defensively. He's changed, man. Look at him. He's not going to pass He's the taunting them. <laughs> wow. He had, maybe he had that info because all of his teammates did see them going up a little bit, but still, that's a great play. Like You, you have to have that patience to be pro. Absolutely. Well done. We're going to see a four-man rotation up. No chat was the target. We see the root actually hits Dudu here. Well, they're not able to follow with anything up. They want to make something happen because they want to get that fort. That's going to get them so close to 16. It's at like 1% health. So if they could actually just hit that fort with almost anything, and they get still, 16. And they're still losing EXP, a lot of them at the top. And ETC can just stage dive anytime he wants to. Miracle can just soak up EXP from bot, mid, and just solo, solo top all day as an ETC. And Thrall decides to go, but still, that was way too late. Supreme Mixtape took Faust out away. 
Miracle had first pick. They took that global away. They banned out Dahaka, but they allowed ETC. And ETC is doing so much as a global hero in this game post-10. We're going to see this fight. Here's the stage dive, speaking of which, a huge root as well. The Ancestral goes off somehow, some way there, despite the silence. But it's not going to matter. Dudu goes down first. Judy's in trouble. 16 is reached. As you see, Miracle clicks it in for all their heroes very quickly. No chat is blocked here. Sank goes off, and Wiz is going to be the last to fall here, it seems, as Dami jumps in. He did not actually get his holy ground in time. He did not actually uh, talent that, so he will now. But if he had it there, it would have been even easier to get the pick on Wiz. He gets it regardless. Oh, my goodness. Miracle just absolutely just annihilating entire team except for Regar. But because they had a talent advantage, of course, and just Having a 4v4 situation where ETC can just jump on the enemy team. Supreme Mixtape had to be, be careful a little bit more. Thrall took some more time to join. And by the time he joined the team fight, basically the fighting was not um, not almost over, but basically they're <laughs> they were getting punched. Like they're not even attacking, they're just going they're running defending. away from yeah, the fight. They're retreating. They were hiding in the corner, hands up to block. Um <laughs> Essentially, they were really not enough, hit. though. Not enough. It's it's actually amazing as well that Sniper could consistently be the one in this Dragonite. He's absolutely the best hero to have in it. Um, because as soon as it expires, he can escape. And also, he doesn't do a lot of damage. They don't lose anything except shields, which he can already pre shield his team, anyways, because he has Kalas. So uh, it's consistently him in the Dragon Knight, which means that they're just winning on all counts. He's always rotating in. It's perfect coordination. I mean, to summarize what you just said, Tassadar is so good right now in this meta. Yes. Yes. <laughs> he won't be as good, I don't personally feel, after the patch goes live yeah, I think so and HGC next week. But you know, this might be one of the last times you guys see Tassadar in a pro match for a while here in Korea. We'll see how he gets used after the rework. Um, but currently, not. Uh, he may, he's, he's, I feel like he's gonna still come out as uh, at, as some teams favor Tassadar a lot, especially MVP teams, but not as much. Well, with his slow, I mean, he has, has a lot of utility, but part of his strength, which was also part of the reason I loved playing him so much, is in his uh, Calls and Blaze, his really strong leeching plasma. Calls is so important because you basically have your entire team has more health than they're supposed to. Like, they have um, Storm Shield nonstop. They got Lucio Sound Barrier nonstop, so. That being removed essentially, you know, changed a little bit, is going to make him less good. But the slow is nice, it's cool. Let's not make this a task or discussion yet. We'll talk more about that next week. Yeah, I, I'm sure that's in the red, red thread somewhere sure. next week when it comes along. And it does get rooted. Doo doo out of position for now. The Holy Ground does this position, the Supreme Mix table. A little bit ETC looking for a chance to come in from the side. He can be, he can actually be soaking EFP all this time and he decides to go right now. All right, this uh, is a really scary moment for Miracle with this lane push like this. This is uh, the time that Supreme Mix is at their strongest because they have the same talent here. If this goes on for a little bit longer, then, oh, he's probably gonna actually have to use his heroic to get out of Say if this goes on any longer, Honkono is going to get them 20. They're already 19 now. And this heroic will be on cooldown for 65 more seconds. But Supreme Mix didn't send anybody down to clear that camp, so they're going to need to rotate down there now. Miracle is probably going to just go over here and take this camp. They're going to get vision because of the lane pushes right now of exactly what SMT is doing. 50 seconds left for Honkono. And they decide not to go to the camp. Actually, just going to take the safe route to the left side. They're angling towards it. But they need to, you know, wait for Hong Kono's heroic to come back online. Now, ideally, they like to get Hong Kono over here at 20. So he's going to try to soak for 20. Then they're going to push for this objective. Well, they have that talent tier advantage, and he has his uh, global available. Yeah, exactly. And Brawl within that time took that camp. A smart decision, and just protecting Dudu is the right choice. And he's not. Too pressured because they know the stage dive is not available at the moment. Yeah, but it is in 10 seconds, and I think SMT is pushing this really hard considering that Hong Kong was about to flank them. And then they're still at the same talent. They're not 20 yet. It's going to take some more time, at least the 34, 40 seconds, not even 30, 40 seconds. S ETC is soaking up so much EXP right now when Trimix State needs to realize this that they're about to hit 20, and they do. They do. They get out of here. This is so scary. Hong Kono, if he wasn't really focusing on the 20, could have actually come down here to win a fight, which would have gotten them 20 anyways. 
but he's not going to risk it, which is actually very un Hong Kono like. And I'm actually liking the Hong Kono we're seeing today much better than what we saw on Friday. He's playing it passively. And guess what? Sniper again. Going to be the Dragon Knight Channeler. And yeah, Supreme Mixtape just ran away there. They gave total control of the map to Miracle, uh, which means that, of course, this is going to be a Dragon Knight. But I have to respect this choice. We're only 1640s. This is not a game ending Dragon Knight unless they lose people. But they knew that they couldn't contest this against 20. Yeah, and they made the safer choice, and they didn't risk too much if they if they actually went in and just even just stayed there for a few more seconds. That could have been dangerous because Hong Kong was ready to dive in. I'm pretty sure, even before hitting level 20. Oh, and he gets interrupted here with this stage dive. Actually, he's caught six seconds before he can use it again. And if he gets stunned once more, he's not going to be able to get out. Uh, meanwhile, Molten Core actually buying a lot of time and bot. This is great for Supreme Mixtape. Hong Kong has to bolt. He even used that bolt, but he can join the team on the other side, going just hearth back home and then just stage dive right into the fight. So ETC is not the worst one to actually get damage from. But th all this during this time, no is caught and very low, close to being dead against Ancestral. But now it is MVP Miracle in danger a little bit, but still in favor of Stream Mixtape. They have to run now, Judy, very low due to his first one to go down. Wiz on the other side, trying to stall some time with Earthquake. Oh my goodness. Dami has hardened shield as well here, so he's basically invulnerable. And it's Hong Kono time. He comes in, power slides, gets the two stuns. They're fighting underneath the core, which is causing them a lot of grief here, but it looks like it's just going to be enough as now Wiz is the target. If he goes down, this will certainly be game. They're going to commit to the core anyways. ETC did take bolt, so he doesn't have Storm Shield to help this push. And this is a good opportunity for SMT. They need to get a pick here on the Sniper. Oh, Wiz misses it, though. If they get a pick on the Sniper, maybe they can stop this. Doesn't look likely anymore. I think MVP Miracle will take game number one here with a strong push. There it is, GG. And SMT fought hard in that game. They had some good decisions. But overall, Miracle just outclassed them in the lanes, which got them the Dragon Knights, which led to the, the, enough structural lead, and they took the game. MVP Miracle, especially Hong Kono. What a guy. What a guy. He's changed. He's not the Hong Kono we used to know anymore. How did he change in one day? Well, we know the coach of MVP, and he is one of the best coaches of Heroes of the Storm. He watched the English bots, and he was like, those English casters saying you're being a little bit too aggressive, you should probably stop it. <laughs> you can thank me later, Coach Kim. Um, I got it. Uh, <laughs> Maybe he's gonna watch this again <laughs> and make sure make sure he listens to what he says. I just imagine him at home right now, like, oh god, this guy. Ancona <laughs> <laughs> was actually super defensive, passive, just coming in at the right time. I don't think he was basically on Friday. It looked like he was the one that was deciding, but this time it was the team and someone else deciding him, like controlling like a puppet, what to do at the moment. Yeah, stage dive use it's very conservative and got a lot of soak. Um, big things, I think No Chat played incredibly well on RAG, some of the best RAG we've seen in this tournament um, from our lesser known teams. Um, he played better than Modern Life. He definitely played a lot better than H82. Um, and he looked good on the hero. Uh, his usage of the of the pressure that RAG can give in a lane was really strong. Um, what, I, what I realized, which is really interesting, I was thinking about it, and I think, okay, no chat is the player I had in my mind as a Thrall player, but of course Wiz is the melee assassin. And normally you don't have a Rag and a Thrall in this team comp. Like, that's pretty yeah. rare. And I think that, like, they're on to something here. Like, I think that this could potentially work with the combo they had. They had Varian as well. It was like a very melee-heavy team. Um, and I liked what they were trying to do. Due to on Sergeant Hammer, if he stayed alive, he does a lot of damage. Um, they built him into his auto attack. He had the napalm strike, etc. Um, it feels like a we, we we saw some new ground was broken in this draft actually from SMT. Yeah, I actually did like that draft because it is all because they there was no false dead on the other team. If there's a false dead, he can just gust you away, and then you're just so far from the, p the potential damage you can actually burst in. It's impossible, but not having that false dead, but just Vala, still there was just so much heal, shield, sanctification to save that Vala, and crazy moving the entire game. I don't think he died once in that game. He was also, and uh, who is also a very aggressive player. What a what a well done play on that Vala tonight. Yeah, very well done. Um, 
I, I do feel like this is a, a series where SMT has the opportunity to take a game, though. They mm -hmm. looked they looked good uh, in that first game. Like, I don't have as much um, to criticize on them uh, in this in this first game that we've seen already. Uh, because this is now going to be Miracle's map choice, um, very likely, the we had bans on Infernal Shrines. We might go to Sky Temple as our next map. I'd say there's a high chance of that. The leading teams are usually going into that as the second map. That's my guess. We're going to find out. No! Two of Spider Queens that TNL power. Crazy moving sniper, man. They're going into it. Yep. It is their favorite, favorite map since TNL. So, finally, we're going to have a map of Spider, Twins, Sp Spider Queen, finally. And the band pick, maybe this is the first time we might actually see Zul I was gonna play. You and I are on the same page. Our minds connected. I was like, I We're would sick. like to see Zul. I really would like to see Zul. Especially, look, think about Zul plus Varian. Especially because we don't have the Black Heart Spay into the map pool. This is possibly the only map that Zul can be a really good pick. I don't think he's going to go highly in the draft, and I actually still think it's unlikely we see him, but with how much the Koreans are actually putting emphasis on Varian, imagine a taunt into a root uh, from Zul. It just seems like a dream come true. If Cleanse is on cooldown, it's like a free kill, and Cleanse is on a much longer cooldown than Taunt is, so something I've been thinking about. The lane pressure that he provides, obviously, is really strong on this map, and Zeratul is also quite strong on this map. So let's see how this plays out. There's also a potential for Kerrigan. And Nazebo. And Nazebo. Nazebo did, com did come out on BOE yesterday, once. Yeah. And uh, Europe, they have used him here as well. So uh, something that, just some non-meta heroes that come to mind. Personally excited to see a map that was not used before in HGC Korea. Let's see, what are some... So as we talked about the possibilities of some other heroes that might come out, it also gives a pressure to the players what they exactly have to ban, what they exactly have to choose. But they're actually going to go ahead and pick that variant. All right. Not pick that variant. Ban. ban. Yes. Ban. But you do have to click on it to ban. So yeah. I, was banning. I mean, you're right. Yeah. Actually, yeah. technically correct. The best kind of correct. So <laughs> um, let's see what, what happens next here as this is Falstad's anti-map. Like, Falstad does not do well on this map. And one of the strongest maps we ETC also because he has that range, just rotating power on this map. The, the range between the lanes is just so short that it's ETC can just go around everywhere and start ganking from minute one, before, mi before minute one. It's the fastest map from lane to lane that exists in the pool. Tassadar does get banned here. So for SMT now, I'm trying to think of what I would do if I were them. I think I take Bala here. Super powerful. Dudu loves the hero. You, uh, you could pair it with Aria later. Um, you don't have the Tassadar, but I think it's still really strong. I'm gonna take Zarya. Okay, Zarya is open and does have strong wave of clear and also pokes that can can cancel the channeling. So that seems to be the right choice, and no chat does favor Zarya very hard. And Miracle, since they get, they have two choices. They can just do Valkyrian and Ragnaros, or fall. False that maybe, but not really. Or even ETC if they want to. False that is not out of the question here, uh, by any means. He's just not as strong here. So I personally like. Ragnaros, Malfurion, because you have Malfurion, top tier support. You have Ragnaros, who's got strong wave clear, and also his trait is super powerful here. Can be used to deny turn ends, can be used to get kills. Um, you don't have Varian with him, but I just simply don't think that matters in this case. So uh, that's what I think most teams would do in this case, and that's what I would do as well. But they're going to go Vala and Gul'dan, so they're going to work on that damage. Vala again, and Gul'dan, They're scared of, of Zarya Vala, you know? Yep, and Gul'dan, of course, having that strong wave clear does clear that wave pretty fast. Super fast, and Miracle does like to play Vala a lot, and we saw Crazy moving on that Vala. He looks pretty comfortable on that Vala, as he did play so many times before. Well, this will allow uh, Supreme Mixtape to take the Malfurion. Will they take it with Ragnaros with already Zarya on the table? It seems unlikely. I leaning towards Wiz playing a melee carry here again. 
Um, especially because Vala is taken away from them. They only have that a hero to pair with Zarya. So they're not going to pick up the melee here right now, but I just don't think we're going to see Ragnaros with the Zarya. I think we're going to see Malfurion and some sort of other range damage, perhaps Tychus. Oh, Sergeant Hammer again, and Morales with her. They're hiding something. They're hiding something for yes. sure. Like, instantly I've noticed they're hiding something. Maybe? Maybe this is like a cheese comp where they push really hard using Zarya, Hammer, Morales, uh, Medivac, like my insanity style. Could be what we're looking at here. Let's see. Let's wait and see. They do have the last two at the later rotations after the bands. And that may be a miracle. Here goes. What are they trying to do with that Morales right there? Well, I think if you're a Supreme Mixtape, you definitely want to ban Zeratul in the next rotation. Mm -hmm. And Miracle, if they think it's cheese, if they think it's one of these Artanis Morales type things, they might actually just ban Artanis here. Absolutely possible. It's weird. This is a tough ban for Miracle, so they're, they're probably just like, their whole face is replaced with question marks right now. The band Tyrael, which is also part of that um, composition oftentimes. Uh, so, there it goes. And I it think would, would Zeratul be, is a good band here. Yeah, Zeratul should be one of the best bands, or... ETC is also a solid band. ETC still hasn't come out, and it's about time ETC comes out. ETC, obviously, is the best early game hero here. They're going to go with the Zeratul band, so... I like that. I don't actually... I'm thinking super hard right now, so there goes Ragnaros and ETC. MVP Miracles draft looks already too scary on this map. Ragnaros is going to be great against the early pushing power of Hammer and Zarya. Here we're going to find out the last pieces of the puzzle here for Supreme Mixtape. Just having Rag and, and uh, ETC against them alone leads me to believe if they were planning on doing some heavy cheese, they're not going to be able to do it now. It's going to be Diablo. So what's the last thing? It is Thrall, actually. Okay, so it's going to be this double melee again with the Diablo Thrall. And Zarya is going to be one of the kind of sub tanker here. They're going on this solo ranged hammer so much. And Malfurion almost, we almost had a draft without Malfurion, but no, he had to come in. <laughs> He's like, there's no way. Like, Darvis is like, can I play Battle of Fury? And I was like, no. He's like, oh, okay. Can I play Lili, <laughs> maybe? No. Uh, well, having the Morales was, of course, a little bit surprising, but still, this is only game number two. And let's see if Supreme Mixtape can actually bring, turn this around because Mi MVP Miracle is waiting to see because they're going into their favorite map, Spy Tomb of the Spider Queen. Welcome, everybody, to Tomb of the Spider Queen. We have Hong Kono on ETC, Dami on Rag, Sniper on Gul'dan, Crazy Moving on Vala, and Darvish on Malfurion. And Spring Mixtape in red, Scarlet on Kenna Morales, Dudu on Sergeant Hammer, Wiz on Thrall, Judy on Diablo, and No Chat as expected on Zarya. You know, a lot of people would criticize Wiz for playing a lot of melee assassins in the meta that's not good for it, and also his proclivity to play Thrall, but I think it's actually a strength for him right now because he's playing a hero that most people aren't really expecting, and it makes it difficult to counter draft. So, No Chat is going to draw aggro here. I'm surprised he wasn't a little bit more aggressive because they have scouting drones here, and also Judy is blocking. Definitely could have done a little bit more, I think, with that, uh, and damage that second cannon tower, but either way, this four man is super powerful, and this is the strongest map in the pool for this type of play because the rotation between the lanes is so short that like you can actually do this in virtually another lane and push it as well. Like having four in a lane isn't actually tragic because you can just go and get the exp a, a few seconds later. They're actually going to gank Dami here successfully. Oopsie Daisy, that Ragnaros overstep. Ouch. Yep, it has already started for Dami. Let's see how protective he can get later on to the game. 
see they were losing Diablo went all the way up, but not all the way, it's, it's so close together. All the way up and to, went into a gang and then came back and lost nothing. He can pick that, all that EXP up. You know, uh, Zagara was once regarded by everywhere in the world except Korea as one of the strongest solo laners and a strong pusher and soaker. Um, Someone like Ragnaros, but Koreans wouldn't use her. As I said, she has no escape, too risky, die all the time if you do it. And those same Koreans now are playing Rag and getting ganked. Maybe we'll see <laughs> maybe we'll some drop off. I think Ragnaros in general as a utility hero is just much stronger than Zagara Zagar was in that time period. So they're using her regardless, but um, I feel like this is going to stop. We're not going to see as many Rags get picked off in lane by the end of this tournament just because everyone's going to start getting better. It's still a new hero, and everyone's going to improve at uh, you know, stopping this sort of ganking from happening, just playing a little bit safer. Yeah, I think a lot of them are ready though, of course, and what it is kind of forcing them to pick because that bolt of core is just so powerful it just delays that push a little bit too and that's his that's the trade and almost like it almost feels like a heroic to me so that's p part of the reason why his skill shots skill sets <laughs> it's just so op right now well, no chat is doing a ton of damage with uh, his energy he's built up here but He's, there's so much of a collapse here from Miracle on top of him that he's not able to do sit and do the free damage that he just did a little bit of there. So he's mostly doing grenade damage, but he has charges with that full energy and building it up. He's also eating a lot of the turret shots. Wiz is left in the bot lane. So the solo lane here, this is actually really cool what Supreme Mix Tape is doing because basically they're putting Wiz in a solo lane where they're not. They're three, four manning, pushing really hard on these waves. That's why they have such a huge lead in the XP. This is going to change. Um, going forward, but in the early game, there's no way Miracle can contest this. They're kind of having this three-man, four-man robe squad and leaving Wiz in the solo lane where they're not. And if a rotation comes up and they leave this, then Wiz will slowly eventually rotate up the top, and that'll become the new solo lane. So in terms of how they're playing this composition uh, with Morales, I really, really like it. Yep, they're exactly doing whatever whatever they were planning to do. And Crazy Moving actually taking some bit of damage from Dochet as Full energy, man. I mean, he, Zarya energy. does a Did lot you see of that damage. damage, damage look, at that, output. Look, at, look at this. Dudu and Nochat are going to make quick work of this. And Thrall in the mid, in the bot lane is just getting free soak. Even with ETC coming down, ETC is like, oh, I can't do anything here. They're going to try to get the gank on Diablo in mid right now. We'll see if that happens off screen. I'm watching on the mini map. They don't have too much CCs, and Diablo is a very tanky hero. Wiz so knows what's up. He's checking. Judy, a little bit too far, but not too far. And also, they need to push now before Miracle has all their heroics. That's when they really get that power. With Bala with the safety rain, ETC on that. Maybe ETC will actually go Mosh here, because I don't see too many CCs coming out from Supreme State. Yeah, I mean, grenade, but let's see. Grenade and maybe Apocalypse. Sure. Apocalypse. Humor, but actually, that also trades the heroic's not like it's like trading with a skill, so it's not as bad. Yeah, it's definitely still something that they could go with. Though um, this is the worst map for Ma or sorry, for uh, stage dive because it's the smallest distance between lanes, so you don't get as much value from it. We still see it all, all a lot. And in fact, at BlizzCon we saw it in this map more than uh, Mosh as well, even though uh, the map was small. We're seeing a lot more Mosh in Korea suddenly. I'm still not completely sold on it yet, but I, I do think that. Um, there's a time and place for it. Is this that time? From what we've been seeing so far, I think you're probably right. Might be. Well, these lanes are continuing to push. They're trying to get this last cannon tower down here for more EXP. They want to get 10 first because, like you said, that's a huge spike for Miracle. That's when this game is going to start to turn around if it does. And look at both all this lane pressure. Look at the control of gems. They have, like, there's literally, they just literally have 20 more gems. Um, 21 more gems than Miracle does, and they have more turned in. And they're going to try to get this first turn in to try to get 10. Wiz is in trouble, though. Morales trying to save him. He gets like pushed away a face smelt away from the heels, but he still survives, gets the kill. So many gems on the ground there that they cannot recover. Kono dropped about 20 or a little bit less than 20, and is the first summon is going to go towards Stream Mixtape, is which they needed. They needed that first summon of Web Weavers. They needed that push for that level 10. And Miracle really didn't have to fight there. They could have been, I think they were a little bit pressured getting out macro from the beginning of the game. 
Yeah. But they could have just waited a little bit more. Onkano went in a little too deep. It looks like the Onkano that we used to know is uh, it's coming back. But we'll see. We'll see a little more. All right, that's a big stun, actually, as uh, we do see a little bit of denial here by Dami on this damage, but it's not too significant. In fact, the Spider Queen wasn't even really there um, when he was doing that. So he's going to get this fort. They just have so much strong pushing power. Here's the four man. They can just send the four man to a different lane now, or they can take out the keep wall. Wiz is waiting for the rotation up of Sniper. Not going to get it, though, but they are going to try to dive onto him here. Looks like they're not going to dive the turrets, though. Sniper does get away. He's got the spider on his bag. He's doing a map, uh, map themed skin. I love that. <laughs> I don't know what that uh, skin is actually called, but it looks nice to have the spider on your back on two of the spider field. And Miracle is going to contest all the way back, try to get some turn ins on top and even push this top lane, but they're going to lose a fort if they just keep on. And then, and that's when Supreme Mixtape also decides to come up and tries to stall this, but Judy does not get in. And Miracle does the. Yeah, they don't have that much it. poke in terms of skills. Like, Wiz already used his uh, Rolling Thunder, so that's not enough. Um, but after they uh, you know, after they use that, uh, maybe he will get this. They have 10 now as well. They have 4 or 5, which is huge. Keep an eye on ETC. We'll see what he decides to use. Um, most important thing to note here is that we actually have Stim Drone. So uh, this is going to be obviously either for Morales, or excuse me, not Morales. Um, for Morales. <laughs> for Hammer. We got yes. too many StarCraft sergeants up in here and yeah, lieutenants. We do. Um, it's going to be either for Hammer or Thrall. Uh, most likely for Thrall, but uh, Sergeant Hammer can get a lot of value. If she's in siege mode as well, she can do so much damage destruction while Stim Drone is active. And Judy does come around the side and grab on to Crazy Moving Forward a second, but Explosion Jump, perfect. But Crazy Moving does a lot of damage before going down. Actually, so they have to turn around Diablo taking some of the damage, gets silenced. That's right, Judy uh, just gonna rot walk away from that one. They're gonna clear this. Not even gonna get the fort is this web weaver, the bottom one. Not gonna get it either if they rotate down quickly enough. It's actually very low in health already. Um, the earthquake APOC combo was very powerful there. Uh, and you can see if you just are in position where the earthquake can slow everyone and you have the APOC circles are kind of uh, overlapping making, each other. Yeah, like making that like Olympic logo kind of. Yeah, yeah. If, if that happens, it's just so hard to retreat under Earthquake. And that's what happened there. 83 gems available for Supreme Mix Safe, so any win in the fight might get them a, a, a turn in. And also, no chats, uh, Explosive Jung actually pushed out the Bala towards them. Like, the maximum amount of distance you can actually push out, so that was really well placed from no chat there. Definitely. 86 gems. No, it doesn't matter how much in. you're holding, but Crazy Moving is alone here, and there goes so much gems. They want to get that mid fort, but if they actually commit to this, they're going to get punished. I think this should just be a turn in. Oh, they're going to race, actually, and I think Miracle might win this race. They started first. Yep. Oh, no, no, sorry. Actually, not. It's red. Oh. That's okay, you lost the race. I'm like, I'm fired. <laughs> no, no, no. That was oh. close. That was very close though, but Miracle, they didn't, was, they, had to get, they had to get 55, but they only had like 25, 52 or something. They had 57, so they had to but like... pick up a few more at the end. I, I think that's still just enough few times that Supreme Mixtape could turn in at the yeah. end. Close call there, but Supreme Mixtape wins the race, so this is great for them. And uh, they needed to get rid of those gems because, as you were saying, it doesn't matter how much you're holding, it's a matter of how much you turn in. If you lose them all when you lose a team fight, then you wish you weren't holding so many. And Dami goes into molten core form to do the maximum amount of damage. Judy just standing on side, trying to look for a grab to, from the side, but they notice Honkano staying pretty safe in that front line. Looks like they would have pushed this a little bit more, and Weaver is definitely pushing the top. That kind of does go to the top to take care of that Weaver on top. Curious to see um, what uh, Stim Drone target happens. Like, this is, uh, could have been a Stim Drone target for just the damage to the structures alone. Um, if No Chat has full energy, even he could be a decent Stim Drone target. Like, yeah, that's right. Think about how much damage. Like, the attack speed of Zarya is already crazy. If you put that up to a next level, um, you just will erase the, the health bars of these structures. It's an unlikely scenario, but it's something to keep in mind. Uh, as we just haven't seen his turn turn yet, I'm waiting and wondering. One day, one day, G-Fun. I think as you mentioned, 
Wiz. Thrall is actually changing a lot of the team fights here, and I don't think Miracle is used to. Well, it hasn't been too long that Thrall didn't come out in the in this meta. But having Wiz on that earthquake, he's been placing himself in a safe zone. He doesn't blow out the beginning of the fight. Of course, we'll have to see a little bit more into the game, but so far he's been positioning himself where he can do damage but does not go down. And we'll find Sniper at the bottom, who gets horrified, and it is Judy on trouble and Explosive Jones just to zone out. Makona comes in. Judy just has so much healing from Scarlet here that, like, he was basically every ult in the game like was on him, but it didn't matter. We see the earthquake here now, and he's not even going to have to use Apocalypse, although perhaps he should have to get the kill on Hong Kong there. Didn't end up getting it. Dudu got the Stim Drone, did quite a bit of damage, but uh, only one kill here. But again, we were talking about the gems. Yeah, Giving them for another turn in. And Miracle is holding 58 gems. They, they just cannot turn this in at the moment. Spring mixtape looks like they have enough, just enough to get this turn in. This could be a keep because they're going to hit 16 as they continue to push this and they have such a a strong comp in terms of damage to structures. No chat gets his energy. Dudu's Sergeant Hammer. So, I mean, uh, buildings die at safe distance. Yep, man. That was not the best expulsion zone, so, so to say. He could have used it on, on the choke point and making Hokano be isolated, but that would also put Judy isolated on the other side. So that was a big decision to be, to be made and he didn't make that choice. But whenever Judy goes in, there's a big shield, so he stays alive for a long time. Dami pops in that Molten Core. He gets the shield and no chat gets the energy. So that energy that he gets as he's talented into this is like super duper powerful and gives him a lot more poke damage and also damage to structures. We do see a Horrify isolating Judy here and Hong Kono is gonna get the kill and he survives too, just barely with a sliver of health. And that is quite significant. Supreme Mixtape gets 16 first, but they're not going to get the keep anymore. They're going to have to back off. Um, and both the other Web Weavers are still pretty healthy. So I suppose they won't have to back off necessarily as Dudu actually gets Stim Drone. <laughs> not in range of the keep, unfortunately. Now going to get in there. Fast auto attacks here on the Sniper. Look at how much damage he takes. And Dudu just standing there, getting all that heal from Scarlet. I know Twitch chat is going focus Morales, but there is just, it is so hard for Miracle unless this crazy movement comes from the side and rain stun and just one combos Scarlet somehow. But it looks super hard for Miracle to go back to the back line. Especially when they're pushed like this. There's Earthquake too. They have uh, the um, bot keep wall down now. SMT is making this composition work and I'm liking what I'm seeing. I'm liking this triple melee with the Zarya, you know, hybrid melee basically with a Thrall and the Bruiser type CC warrior. This, In this case, uh, it's going to be the Diablo and last time it was Ragnaros. I like this idea of like Wiz plays Thrall no matter yeah. what the composition is and it's working really well in the second game. They almost take down Crazy Boomy. They do take down Bala from the beginning with the fight. Dami is also in trouble. Big Bosh comes out from Moncano but gets cancelled. Big Horrify also goes up. Sniper is in the danger zone now. Noche doing some damage on Sniper almost takes down and he does at the end. Judy on the chase here too. Darvish wants to get out. I think he still has Ice Block. Uh, he wow. probably doesn't want to use it though, because it would be a waste. He does go down, and Supreme Mixtape will core with this. They have Stim Drone, and they're going to go right for the core. Wouldn't call this composition quite a cheese comp, but it's so powerful in terms of pushing. We saw some really good Zarya out of no chat here, and that's going to be it. Dami trying to slow this down with his stuns here with the Molten Core. It's not going to be enough. No chat just too strong, and Supreme Mixtape is going to tie us up 1 1 here as we hit midnight in Korea. And this is going to be an exciting series and Supreme Mixtape showing their potential here. I'm excited about this team. This series just went back to the original spot. 1-1, one, one. incredible uh, how incredible. I actually originally thought, to be honest, Wiz playing role was not, it does not fit the meta right now. And it feels like they're young kids like after puberty, like not listening to their moms, just doing whatever they want to and it's working. Yeah, I mean, I just, uh, I really feel like when I look at this, especially when I looked at the last game, I thought, wait, is No Chat playing Thrall? Who is there? Like, who's going to play Thrall? How is the rag and a Thrall in the game? And I look at this and I go, this, there's something here. I don't know what it is, 
Well, there's something here. <laughs> now, in the second game, with Diablo paired with the Thrall, I had a lot more success with that first APOC combo. They had so much pushing power. There was no way to stop Morales because they had such a strong front line with Zarya. How are you going to get back there? You're not getting back there. And if you commit to getting back there, Earthquake comes down, you're going to lose everybody. So basically, it was just like, you know the moving screen in a, a Super Nintendo Mario Brothers Super Mario World where like you can get squished by the moving screen? I felt like this is like the moving screen comp by Supreme Mix Tape. They're just moving the moving screen, and eventually Miracle got crushed there. They weren't able to turn in. They had very few gems in general because they were constantly just running around trying to catch the, the push. They're like, oh, we, now we're the top lane of the four man. Like, Wiz is still getting ESP. What do we do? Um, it was cool. And it feels like they intentionally didn't ban Spider Queen so that maybe they would bait Miracle into playing this because this is this very specific style and a specific strategy. Supreme Mix Tape did their research. That was good. I'm impressed. Yeah, and then that was the that happened to be the map that Falstead didn't get picked because it is one of the worst maps for Falstead. But looks like we're gonna go into a short commercial break, break before we see game number three. It is one one between MVP Miracle and Supreme Mixtape. We will see you guys after this break.
The score is 1-1 between MVP Miracle and Supreme Mixtape. Started off strong, but Supreme Mixtape came back with a really unique strategy there on Tomb of the Spider Queen. Started, started to feel a little bit worried for Miracle. They started off strong against uh, Mighty as well. The Mighty came back to take this series with a 3-2 score. Well, they did, and Miracle really is looking forward to win today, but against that strategy that Supreme Mixtape had on that specific map, really worked like we were all during the break we were also talking to the korean casters and then they were super impressed and they thought that game was super exciting to see steam drone on that sergeant hammer and basically it was very entertaining at the same time it was a little fresh like goes back to a long time ago when earthquake plus apocalypse was a uh, meta in the hero league kind of yeah definitely so um look i mean I've, i'm excited for what wiz is showing us here uh with this team like He's clearly got some good decisions. He's playing a solid throw. Mm -hmm. um, and it's time to consider the, the throw ban if you're Miracle here, I, I feel. and Yeah, what happens if Miracle just bans out Zarya and throw? I think, I feel like that is like, could let's, be an answer let's, against them. Let's let's take our minds back to summer season where Thrall was meta, the only top tier player, melee assassin in the world, couldn't play him. Dami, so they can't really take Thrall away mm -hmm. because Dami, look, he can say in interviews all he wants that like he just doesn't think it's strong, but everybody knows his his Thrall is just not very good um, compared to the other players at the time. Rich, uh, for example, was his rival, right, in terms of melee assassin back in summer season. And Wiz is a great Thrall. He's making this work with these interesting comps with uh, No Chat on the Rag and then into the Zarya um, with a Diablo. We're going to go into Towers of Doom here, as it will be the map pick here for uh, MVP Miracle. I mean, sorry, uh, Supreme Mixtape, as Mir Miracle will get first ban. Yeah, because MVP Miracle, well, they chose their map, and then they lost it. Like, that was their favorite. Their, like, they have the highest win, win score since TNL on that map. And going into Towers of Doom, I'm kind of actually worried that Momentum has shifted, and the entire time of game two, they have not won a single team fight, and they were just pushed, pushed, and then pushed, and then the g it was game over. It was like that uh, that that song about the guy at the skateboard. He's like push, 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 coast. <laughs> they coasted through that game. It was easy. They were, you know, kick push. I don't know. I don't know the song, man. I, uh, I'm sorry. I lived in Korea too long. Right? <laughs> Kick push. They kicked him with Diablo. They coasted. I don't know. And now we're into Towers of Doom. <laughs> Just totally ignore Wolf, guys. <laughs> and Zarya is banned as it should be. I, I honestly think they might actually ban Thrall again. They should know this by now. And I think surprising. They were also a little surprised by with that Morales third pick. And they were hiding Diablo Thrall at the end. This strategy doesn't really work on Towers of Doom because the lanes are further apart and um, you don't get that permanent damage. The Bell Towers can just simply be restored. They're going to ban Falstad, which is a pretty obvious one. What I'm looking for here is the possibility of that no chat Medivh. We've seen a lot of Medivh on this map. Rich started it. We've seen it in Europe as well. And uh, a few times in America, actually. I mean, it's, it's kind of a worldwide phenomenon. We were seeing it first here in Korea when Medivh was released. Something to, to look yep. for potentially in this draft is something we might see. Yeah, it's not like tier one hero on this map, but some somewhere in there. It, it comes out often also in the top tier in hero, hero, hero league ladder in Korea also. I just feel like um, in terms of like where Medivh hit the mark in Heroes of the Storm, is he just like the perfect niche hero that you don't have to see? He's not staring. You can never really predict when he's going to pop out. Ass. I'm going to grab that up. And this means that uh, Supreme Mixtape is definitely going to have to consider the Vala. They've been using Sergeant Hammer so far as their source of uh, single attack damage, but there's no way they can remove now uh, Miracle from getting Vala without taking it themselves. They could just go Vala Mouth here. I uh, wouldn't blame them. Yeah, seems like the safe choice to be there, but is Miracle going to use Vala again? It seems likely. But I also think they have something else in plan. And they have to, like, just in case they lose that Vala to Spring Mixtape. Well, just first we test our 
the reason why it is so strong during draft is because you can hide everything. You can make so yeah. There we go, as you predicted. They pick Supreme Mixtape pick Malfurion and Vala, but here comes Miracle. It is their time to show what they're actually thinking right now, because I'm I'm not the only one that thinks, and you're not the only one that thinks, and everyone in the world thinks that they should know, and Miracle should know that Supreme Mixtape has a ch high chance of taking away that Vala. They got, they got put into a tight corner by this Falstad ban. Right now, Miracle has not a single thing, like, you know, the, when you look at the top tier heroes right now, in terms of first ban, first pick, and first rotation heroes, you got the Tastar, but you lost the Volet and the Malfurion. The only thing that's left is Rag, which doesn't actually really synergize with Tastar in any way. It, Miracle with this first pick Tastar, with no Vala or um, Malfurion ban here, kind of painted themselves into a corner. And now, suddenly, there's no strong pick, and Supreme Mixtape is winning this draft. It was kind of obvious that they had to have a plan B, but look, after looking at... Oh! Yeah, here comes Illidan! All right, I was going to say, if this is Tommy's time to play Thrall, you know, this this could be it with Tassadar. They're going to bring Illidan in, and this is going to be an interesting game because now we're finally going to get to see Tommy's carry potential here on a melee assassin. And I was going to say, did you see that look on Crazy Movie? It looked like he was out of it already, and we see that often within a series, and if he's out of it, usually he loses his potential and he just like overextends way too much or like just positions himself into the side and like puts himself into a danger. Let's, oh, we didn't start the game yet, so let's see what happens. But it looked like he had no idea what to do after losing that Bala for a second. I think Supreme Mixtape could still absolutely control this from here. This is not an easy ban, but I think the best ban is Leeming. If you take Leeming away, you know, we talked about how Leeming isn't that good against the Vala compositions when you have Tastar to shield. In this case, they don't have that Tastar. Leeming is good for the burst. She's going to have so much free damage with Illidan in the front lines. I'd go Leeming here. They ban the Rhaegar. They don't want the burst heal. Yeah, they don't want Illidan to be ancestral. So basically, that is banned and ETC. Actually banned from Miracle's side. Yeah, they already have um, a solid stunner here and they're not going to be able to fit any more tanks into this lineup and spring mixtape as uh, towers towers of doom they can still do the haka there are some options here more than very strong frontliners and haka also has global which miracle does not yet so i see it seems like the haka would be the likely choice all right Tahaka is a great choice. Can completely remove Illidan from the fight. Um, I'm trying to think of alternatives here in terms of what to grab. It can also just take Thrall. We could have the ultimate, uh, the ultimate top lane solo uh, battle between Wiz and Dami, and that's they, what I would love to see. They can also have Tyrael to make sure that Sank saves Vala and maybe Tyrael and someone else. So they're just gonna go ahead and pick up a lot more damage. And against uh, Nilliden, they're picking up more auto attacks. I think you're on the money with Ethereal. I think that's going to be their last pick, very likely, especially now that they've chosen Rog into the, and, and Tychus into this. Um, Miracle can't grab a tank. If they do, they won't have any range damage whatsoever. So they're painted themselves again into this corner where like the next picks become somewhat obvious. Now, uh, the choice they have here is of course in supports um in terms of damage they have left i think leaming is the obvious one that's why i was talking about that ban earlier but Rhaegar was taken um karzim and morales are the two being just uh, you know kind of like being thought about here it would not actually be out of the realm of possibility to see a lily pick here uh as well but i don't think that we're gonna see that here sorry not lily bright wing um and i was gonna say i don't lily. think we're gonna see the the bright wing but uh, <laughs> we do see it so um, this is like as standard as it gets in terms of double support, uh, global, and the uh, Li Ming. It's a, a really good composition, but it's a dated composition. Yeah, it feels like it. MVP Miracle does look like they have the potential to burst out. And the problem is, the Supreme Mixtape have enough CC and skill damage to take down that Dami. Is that going to be possible? It even if 
And also the trouble will be the taunt from Varian. They ha really have to get that out. And there's only one. They can either go. Play. Yeah, they could either go Tyrael here or so Johanna. And the Johanna Vegas. counter is what they go with. The cool thing about Tyrael is you can't auto attack uh, as Ilden to, you know, cooldown reduction in the fight when there's sanctification off. But Johanna can blind him. So he can't auto attack, at, you know, more regularly. And also the variant you just talked about, having that uh, block against the taunt. Yeah, it seems like both teams actually are on point of what they want to do. But let's see, it is 1-1 right now. But let's see if Towers of Doom will actually lead towards the winner. MVP Miracle versus Supreme Mixtape. Let's get into game number three. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for this flashy game three. Honkono on Varian, Dami on Illidan, Sniper on Tassar, Crazy Moving on Lee Ming, and Darvish on Brightwing. I wanted that mana. He go, he go home for a second. <laughs> <laughs> so and their opponent, Supreme Mixtape, Scarlet on the Valkyrie, and Dudu on Kvala, Wiz on Ragnaros, Judy on Johanna, No Chat on Tychus. Here we go. Match number three, winner takes match point. Yeah, I think Wiz being on Ragnaros would actually be actually fit a lot in the sense because he's very used to melee and also he's oh Scarlet getting caught from the beginning and is Polymorph and dead. Yeah, gotta be careful. Good pick from this the is, beginning. This is an Abathur Illidan, but it's still a very strong um, single target blow up that you can get with uh, if you catch someone with that stun. Um, you know, the poly, I should say. And we're going to see a little bit of attempt to gank by Brightwing here because uh, she's just so good in the early game for that teleport to gank when Adami rotates um, as we move on. So basically, uh, Wiz versus Dami up in the top lane right now is going to be a tough matchup for Wiz. Um, but if, for any reason, you know, like, we see kind of a rotation back uh, by Odin or if he leaves, that's when Wiz is going to have to make that call to his teammates, whoever, especially whoever's in the mid lane alone, because that's when the gank is going to come in. Yep, and Wiz is definitely going to have a hard time laning against on Illidan. This is our first Korean Illidan to Illidan and HCC. And here comes Brightwing. Holly right away. Is that going to be enough damage? Wiz is actually juking pretty well. Body blocking by Dami, is that going to be, that is enough, just enough damage with that addition of Hong Kono at the end. So, this is the other side of the coin, uh, where Wiz actually just extends into lane, um, because he has better wave clear than Illidan, and then gets killed because of the teleport. So they really need to be on point, as the Brightwing, uh, they need to like know the Brightwing timer. It's going to be an arcane. Build from Bitewing, by the way, is going to build out her Q, so she has more range, more damage, etc. in the center. So that's something that's going to allow her to help delay the altar channels, and also will uh, give a little bit more range damage to this double support composition. And Judy actually took some damage before she pressed that D button, and also Ragnaros Wiz actually went into the Molten Core. Yep, they're trying to delay the spot. Uh, channel here. Sniper can delay almost indefinitely as such a short cooldown on this Psy Storm. Here comes the rotation and Judy very aggressive here. Wiz is here as well. Looks like Miracle's just going to soak and give this up. Although as I say that Brightwing does teleport in. But Leeming is almost here, not yet and they do take this. The lanes were not so perfect for MVP Miracle so they had to stall. They had to delay. They got delayed and they had to take some more time soaking that EXP making sure their lanes were set. All right, small win here for Supreme Mixtape. Big win for Miracle in terms of EXP. Two kills to zero and the extra bright wing soak. Got that extra wave in the top lane. And we'll see her eventually head up to the top. Or, uh, sorry, not her, but uh, Dami to the top as Wiz gets that one extra wave. So here, she's gonna have her um, phase shift again very soon. 
And this is what Wiz needs to be careful about in that lane. If he goes too far, he will be ganked. And they're actually just going to four man this bot lane a little bit. At least they were temporarily. They're not sure the, the idea there. Here's the teleport I was talking about. Wiz survives this time, but it's a positive trade here. And this means for the next objective, they might just leave uh, Darvish up there. Oh, he's going to rotate down. I was going to say, he could just stay up there if Illidan wants to do a little bit more roaming. That's a cool part about having this uh, strong soul laner. You can get a good trade, and then you can leave the global to finish everything else off. Yeah, but because Miracle stayed up, they did lose one more shot on the altar. But because they stayed in that lane on top and top and mid, they do lead in experience a little bit by soaking in lane. These are some of the small things in game that it's not like too flashy. It's not like making the super plays, but it is important in later on because you get that level lead and it turns to be a, you have you, pick, you get to pick the talent before heroic before you fight. Basically, you are just stronger. That's right. So. Um, we're going to have 7 and 7 here, though. And you can see Dami wanted to get the top mercs before this happened, but he was a bit slow on it, so he had to cancel that and leave. And everyone is here. Brightwing is here as well, not going to be teleporting, and she didn't go for a teleport build anyway. She has cleanse. Uh, in this case, Dami is going in deep. Does avoid that damage from the Molten Core. And Miracle just going around, make sure they don't take too much damage, and Ragnaros also joins the fight, looks like. Illidan is actually going to channel on the bottom. Joanna is going to cancel that. Darvish also channeling this time. It looks like Honkano's... And they do channel the top one, and they just have to. It is even on the core health. And Illidan has been hiding on that bottom push, it looks like. All right, here comes Judy up at the front. Going to try to find something with this. As we're even now as this altar fight continues. The the altar fighting comp definitely is in favor of Miracle here. As you can see, they have so much poke, and Illidan's such a great frontliner, but they lose control here temporarily. Judy looking for this big condemn again. Let's get the, the AoE there from Wiz as well. They're going to start channeling, but look at all the poke they have, especially with Sniper and Crazy moving to stop this altar from channeling. So Supreme Mixtape is going to need to get a better trade or a pick before they can actually get this. They're going to try again, but obviously they will be denied, so... That's the, the story of these altars right now, and Miracle is just so significantly ahead in EXP as well. The longer this goes on, it might feel um, it might feel hopeless for his SMT. They might just simply let this one go for the time being to try to get it faster. So SM SMT, they just have to stall some more time because top and Brightwing did go top because top wave was getting way too big. He was pushing towards MVP Miracle's side. And even in mid, this is four we fight. I know Brightwing can join in any moment, but still, that would seem like to be the right choice. Just both teams just clearing waves, just delaying whatever they can. They hit both sides of some, somewhat of a poke, a lot of poke actually, and sustain more of a miracle. So Dami decides to jump in right just like that, but actually doesn't do so much damage because the blind. Okay, so Hong Kono is going to be the next to go down here. The blind was huge, as you mentioned. And when you reach that impasse, you've got to send Brightwing top because why else would you pick a global hero if you're not going to use it? So when you reach that impasse, she goes up top. She comes in here, though, but the blind denies so much damage. And when you teleport in like that, you broadcast your dive. Dami came in a little bit too soon. And we, Brightwing didn't teleport or talent into um, her teleport shield. shield. So she chose the cleanse instead. And this means that she doesn't give any extra shields as a solo so for secondary support. She just does slow tick healing. So Dami doesn't have a burst heal. He doesn't have a burst shield either. And uh, that's part of why they lost that fight. Because it was just so telegraphed what he was going to do. The blind comes out and then that's it. Um, with this hungry arrow build as well, if Dami is super far away from everybody else, he's going to take the max amount of damage from